Rights and Permissions. This work was originally published in 1705 under the name Triferte Sagani, or Immortal Dissolvent, and was articulated in a blend of Old English and Latin and was in the public domain. The translation to modern English and this edition is under copyright. No part of this book may be reproduced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any form or by any means, electronic, mechanical, photocopying, recording, or otherwise, without prior written permission from the copyright holder, except for the inclusion of brief quotations in a review. Disclaimer, this translation is provided as is. While every effort has been made to translate the original work accurately, the translator and publisher are not responsible for any inaccuracies or interpretations that may arise from the translated text. This translation aims to preserve the essence and nuances of the original text while making it accessible to modern readers. All rights reserved. For other fine works by Christopher Templesage, please scan the QR code below. Zerferte Sagant, or Immortal Dissolvent, being a brief but candid discourse on the matter and manner of preparing the liquor alcahes of Helmont the great Halica Paracelsus, the Sal Circulitum minus of Ludovicus de Cominibus, or our fiery spirit of the four elements, together with its use in preparing magisteries, arcanas, and adepts from the animal, vegetable, or mineral kingdoms, by Clydophorus Mystagogus. References 1. Maccabees, chapter 1, verses 19 to 23. The fire of the altar turned into thick water. Cataract, Chapter 14, verse 39. And behold, he reached me a full cup, which was as full as it were with water, but the color was like fire. London, printed by William Pearson, for Thomas Ballard at the Rising Sun in Little Britain. 1705, an epistle to the reader. Dear reader, there have been various opinions concerning the basis and foundation of this general dissolvent, commonly known by the name of the liquor alcahest. Some imagine it to be prepared mercury. Others believe it is found in urine, blood, and the like. This has led to many difficult and futile experiments, as the liquor remains as great a secret in the world as ever. It is likely to continue to be a mystery, as long as chemical authors describe the subject in such tropes and metaphors. This creates a horrible and inextricable labyrinth in which young students' tyros are so entangled that it would take more than ordinary effort for them to be disentangled and set free. A two. Because of this, it can be rightfully said that these chemical writers might as well have remained silent. In fact, it would have been better if they had. This is because so many people would not have embarked on a search with so little likelihood of success, whereby a great deal of precious time and money could have been saved. Additionally, the perplexity of mind that follows vain chemical processes might have been prevented. For this reason, it is only fair that authors in all their discourses which aim to instruct others, should direct attention to the subject which is the true object of that discourse. And although I must acknowledge that it is not suitable to reveal or disclose it so plainly that just anyone might come to understand it easily, like a hog to a honeypot, I believe that it could be expressed in such a decent manner, to keep it sufficiently abstract, yet allow for a certain and harmonious understanding to be discerned. For example, the subject of this discourse is the alkahest. Both man and all creatures possess it. For there is no being in nature that is truly and genuinely dissolved except by this liquor. This is especially evident in humans in all processes of digestion. In this way, a man absorbs the quintessence of all things thus dissolved for his own nutrition, and, being transformed into human species, the waste products are expelled. The common excretions are far more coarse and unrefined than the substances themselves were in their initial reception. Consequently, they are not fit subjects to ground the discourse of such a pure and immortal dissolvent on. Nor, indeed, is man himself, even though we acknowledge that it, the dissolvent, is plentifully present in him. It's a salt or life in him which concentrates all other salts in his own essence, like a universal fountain from which all streams are supplied. Thus, there is no way to extract it from him without violently breaking the vessel and transplanting the fountain back to the inexhaustible ocean from where it first received its being. Therefore, man cannot be the subject of any discourse aiming to demonstrate the subject of this dissolvent. The pure element in him, as already said, cannot be obtained without death, which is abominable even to contemplate. But even if it were obtained, it would not serve the purpose. 
what is sufficient to dissolve in the vegetable kingdom is too weak for the animal kingdom, and what is strong enough for the animal kingdom is too weak for minerals. Therefore, seek it in that which is the fountain that supplies all creatures and beings with it. For were it not for source, nature would soon cease, as she exhausts by the acts of motion and agitation of parts, immediately supplied, not only in the great world, but also in every individual part where life exists, receiving the same through the air, as a true vehicle. Consequently, this Catholic fountain is the correct subject to base this discourse upon, as the true subject of the said dissolving liquor. This is a standing truth. It was true at the beginning, and will remain so until the end of time. The reason and philosophy of it can be made clear through mechanical demonstration to a person worthy of such inspection. Therefore, casting aside all clouds, dark veils, and metaphors, I genuinely declare that the matter of this dissolvent is one and the same in essence with that matter from which all the wise ancients obtained the universal medicine, one being the work of art, the other of nature, one gentle, the other violent. So, by the difference of operation, they are brought to different effects. Now, therefore, the subject of this discourse being the liquor alkahest, the object must be the universal spirit, for it is from this grand fountain of nature that our chaos does proceed. Therefore, thrice happy is he who knows those magnets that attract and make a species of this general genus. Be assured that there is something more than elements in all created beings, even an ethereal and quintessential spirit which is the very life of the elements themselves. When extracted, it appears in mass, vapor, or waters, even that from which the ancients say all things were generated. However, the correct knowledge of this matter is sufficiently obscure, and the operation thereon even more so. I, along with many others, know by experience that the matter may be known and many do know it, yet are completely at a loss in the matter and method of operating upon it. And whatever some overly confident individuals may think, that is, if they had the knowledge of the true matter, all difficulty would be over, this can be a significant mistake. I have been intimately acquainted with some who have had a true knowledge of the matter and have worked upon it, yet until the day of their death, they have been at a loss for the magistracy. These difficulties have been the sharp stones that have hindered my lawful progression in 20 years of travels towards the Mount Helican of Art. So, my labor of body has been excessive and that of the mind much more. I have endured through the drought and scorching heat of the day, and also, a, through night and a multitude of wants and difficulties, I have often risked life itself. However easy some might think it, I have had no other way but hard labor and great expense. Coals and glasses have been my interpreters, and they shall be so for every true son of art until the end of time. Therefore, for the sake of conscience, I will write the truth, well aware that there are already too many sophistical and false processes in the world, which do not withstand the touchstone of experience and vanish like reprobate metal upon the test. But passing by all this, and much more that could be said of the same nature, I shall now address myself to those who desire wisdom, and let them know that I have, as in a glass, shown them the true matter, as well as the true manner, from which and by which this dissolvent is to be obtained. I shall now speak concerning its use and utility when obtained, which will abundantly reward the possessor for all their costs and pains bestowed upon it, as it has been delivered. The subject of this menstruum is universal, so are the acts of it the same when prepared, which plainly demonstrates from what fountain it must flow. This liquor, as a universal fire, dissolves and opens the textures of all beings in the vegetable, animal, and mineral kingdoms into their nearest and rawest matter, which is saline sulfurous, aqueous, and potable, dissolvable in any liquid, and thus comes immediately to nature's relief. By its specific virtue manifested from potential into action, diseases, however deplorable, may be overcome and cut down, as grass or weeds with a scythe in the hand of a mower, especially those from the mineral kingdom, which may justly be esteemed the physician's crown and the philosopher's diadem. This is the liquor's virtue in general. In particular, as it acts universally without limitation on all subjects in the world, in this action there is something remarkable to be observed in every subject. For it fixes volatile spirits and volatilizes fixed ones, it makes salt sulfurous, 
and sulfur saline. Nay, it macerates the gummosities of resins and gummy things, which the ferment of our stomachs could never do. For when distilled from amber and turpentine, it leaves them in a salt of excellent virtue. From the latter, I have observed it almost as sweet as honey, and a powerful specific in the treatment of stones. Therefore, by the help of this liquor or fire, a few medicines being prepared medicines will answer in deplorable cases all that the patient can hope for, and all that the true physician expects to perform. For instance, turpentine, thus dissolved, or the stone lutus, infallibly cures kidney stones, amber and hellebore treat apoplectic fits, hypochondriac melancholy, and madness, cinnamon, unicorn's horn, and the liver of an eel are used for the speedy delivery of women in childbirth. The sulfur of Venus is a universal nepenthes, a kind of soothing medicine without opium, in all diseases, the lily of antimony for dropsy in all eggs, the magistry of gold for malignant fevers, pestilential diseases, palsies, and plagues, as also the glorified sulfur of the metal masculus, called by Paracelsus venum vitae and membrum essentia, which also cures consumption. Fix mercury, or the arcanum corallanum and horizontal gold, in leprosy, gout, palsy, epilepsy, cancers, lupus, scurvy, king's evil, all sorts of venereal disease without salivation or detaining the patient from business. It would be too long to enumerate all those. Medicines prepared by this fire or liquor, therefore let these suffice, and the reward that may accrue from it. Because by this way of practice, the physician may justly and conscientiously gain honor and riches, and the patients be freed from all those cruel barbarities, which are the typical parts of common practice. As if the pain and terror of death were not enough, there must be an additional cruelty, namely a blistering, which to some may exceed the former. Thus, having given you a brief scheme of the origin, preparation, and use of this liquor, I shall conclude this preface with consideration of a person rightly qualified for the possession thereof. The first and most necessary qualification is to be rightly informed in religious matters, so as to know God for themselves savingly, by passing through the holy river of regeneration. This involves walking in the newness of the Spirit, which divine gift of the Holy Ghost enables every true Christian to walk with such circumspection as to be acceptable in the sight of God. To such individuals, it is a sure guide and safe conductor in this world towards the desired haven of rest. It is also to them a source of wisdom, and that by which their tongues are bridled and the whole person sealed to the day of their redemption, giving an earnest of the eternal inheritance and afterward a full possession, when our mortal shall put on immortality. This being the fountain, all others that are true, flow as rivulets from it, and so provide a right qualification for the knowledge of nature and natural things, as well as a constancy of mind to work upon the one thing alone, an industrious hand to effect the same, where a blessing and success may be hoped for, and those incredible rewards to all such as wander in the circumference and have never been admitted to the center of things, but to the vigilant, hidden things, even those hidden from the foundation of the world, shall be revealed and that this may be the portion of every true laborer in art is the sincere desire of him who wishes the general prosperity of mankind in every way. Clydophorus Mystagogus. Note. The name Clydophorus Mystagogus can be broken down into two parts for translation from Greek. Clydophorus. This is derived from Greek. Clydo. Comes from kleis or Clyde, meaning key, and phoros from phoros, meaning bearing or carrying. So, Clydophorus will translate to key bearer, or one who carries the key, mystagogus. This also comes from Greek, where mystes means initiate, referring to someone initiated into mysteries, and agogos means leading or guiding. Thus, mystagogus translates to guide of the mysteries or one who leads the initiates. Putting it together, Clydophorus mystagogus could be interpreted as the bearer of the key who guides others through the mysteries. This name seems fitting for an author or figure associated with esoteric or alchemical texts, as it implies someone who holds the key to hidden knowledge and guides others in understanding these secretive or mystical teachings. The Contents Epistle to the Reader, page 007, part I, chapter 1, page 017, concerning the mistake of those who have sought this liquor in wrong subjects and by wrong ways, chapter 2 of the true subject matter of this dissolvent, page 023. Chapter 3, The True Way and Manner of Preparing the Liquor Alkahest, page 027. 
Chapter 4. The Difference Between This Liquor and the Mercury of the Philosophers. Page 035. Chapter 5th, page 045. The Use of the Liquor Alkahest, Circulate a Minus, or Great Hylic of Halmont and Paracelsus. A Philosophical Epistle Discovering the Unrevealed Mystery of the Three Fires of the Sophie. Page 051. A General Epistle, page 069. To the Reader more especially to those who are the true inquirers after hermetic philosophy. Part 2, page 073, Mercury's Caduceus Rod, or the great and wonderful office of the universal Mercury, or God's Vaishurant displayed, etc. Chapter 1, page 073, containing a theophysical investigation of the philosophical chaos, from whence Mercury hath its birth. Chapter 2, page 077, in which is shown some practical conclusions concerning the separation of the chaos. Chapter 3rd, page 081, containing some theophysical investigations concerning the formation of the first philosophical body. Chapter 4, page 085, a theophysical investigation concerning the blood or mineral spirit, which is in the philosophical principles of soul, luna, and mercury. Chapter 5th, page 089, containing some practical rules to be observed in the body's formation and exaltation. Chapter 6, page 095, a theosophical investigation concerning the elixir, that being the house and habitation of Mercury, etc. Chapter 7. A theophysical investigation concerning the nature and production of Laton. Page 099. Chapter the 8th. A theophysical investigation concerning the rise and production of Azoth. Page 103. Chapter 9th, page 109, containing a theosophical investigation concerning the probability of what the philosophers have asserted concerning the art's excellency. The Scribed Oath. Page 117 found amongst the papers of a known adept after his death, which is administered upon the adopting of a brother into the Kabbalistic Society. Chapter I. Concerning the mistake of those who have sought this liquor, in wrong subjects and by wrong ways. It is a saying worthy of observation that the industrious hand makes rich. This is true in all manner of trades and occupations in the world, and so it is in the art. But this industry must be based on a correct foundation. And in the alchemical art, it must stem from a foreknowledge of adequate causes. To attain this, it is impossible unless we are enlightened by that wisdom which comes from above, as a ray from the holy heavens and throne of the divine glory. For it is she who must guide us in all our labors to make them acceptable to the great God. Well, therefore, might the wise man esteem wisdom above riches and prize understanding above the merchandise of silver, gold, and precious stones, because she is the true conductor to the ways of peace and pleasantness, nay, even to that tree of life, where substance is to be inherited. For it is wisdom that opens the door of entrance to all mysteries, divine and natural, and consequently, b. Without her wisdom, men grope as if in the dark, even as a blind man does at noonday. For nature, God's handmaid, was created by him. And it is said that God, by his Spirit, has adorned the heavens, his hand has formed the crooked serpent. And though there is a spirit in man, it is the inspiration of the Almighty that gives understanding. From this, we may readily conceive that human reason is too limited to comprehend the dignity of any true mystery without the aid of God's spirit. This great defect is too evidently apparent from the deplorable case of the chemical searchers concerning the subject matter of this discourse. They do not know where to ground or fix their intentions in the choice of a proper subject, but each frames to himself a different basis, thus making an innumerable number of errors concerning the same. This imaginary matter, which fantasy only has given birth to, they defend with all the eagerness imaginable, concluding it to be the genuine offspring of truth, when, alas, it is but a bastard brat of their own wandering imaginations and ungrounded thoughts, as in the conclusion proves too evident. This is an absurdity so great, so common, that amongst the many pretenders, I have never met more than three that have escaped it. How then can it possibly be expected that such should ever arrive at the wished-for haven of rest, when ignorant both of the way and the means by which they must come thither? For the door of entrance must not only be known, but also the key which opens the same, without which they may never expect admittance into nature's treasury. Therefore, they must still remain in the horrible mist of errors. The most principal errors that have come across me I shall here lay down and reckon up for convincing the giddy-headed and rash searcher.
but more principally for the edifying and building up of a son of art. I shall begin first with an error that is almost universally accepted, namely, that common mercury is the foundation or basis of this liquor. This is an error that the authors of some expositions are guilty of, which the ignorant searcher has not been aware of. They have confidently worked on mercury to obtain the liquor alkahest, just as others have done for making the mercury of the philosophers through several and various preparations. These preparations include trying to break its body with saliva, may do, vinegar, and such like foolish procedures, also by sublimation with salts and distillation and other such operations. Endeavoring to make it crisp, delicate, to obtain an airy and universal nature and radical dissolution, even what they call the magnetic salt or foliated earth and mercurial chalybs. But all in vain, for that mercury, so prepared, is still the same as common mercury. And so likewise is that, prepared by regulus of antimony, silver, etc., because common mercury is unripe fruit fallen too soon from the tree. Therefore, it must return to its first fountain, or Catholic mercury, to be dissolved itself. Consequently, it is not the subject of this liquor. For the philosophers introduce fire, not water, into mercury to make it medicinal, both in the particular and also in the general, by which it's brought to be forever irreducible to mercury. Another error is in those who seek this dissolvent in dew and rainwater, not considering that this was designed only as nourishment for the vegetables. It has only such a portion of the universal fire in it as might serve to dissolve the saltpeter of the earth and then the vegetable seed, in order to a new production. This fire or dissolver being far too mild compared to that of animals, and that of animals being mild compared to minerals, cannot be the philosopher's subject of this dissolvent, for life would be too short to extract it. B2. Another error is that many believe the matter to be universal, but is drawn by certain magical magnets at selected times of the year. This is a significant error, for the matter can be found plentifully at all seasons of the year, especially in places most enriched by mineral fumes. The manner of its attraction is more for the necessity of human life than any point in arts, so the artist must not be too curious in trying to perform what nature has already accomplished. Another error is in those who seek this dissolvent by attracting the air with alkalized salts, like tartar, etc., not considering that all alkalized salts only attract a saline aqueousness, which by repeated distillations may be turned wholly into an elementary water. Whereas the true philosopher, as already said, attracts a fire, nay, a fiery spirit stronger than any fire in the world. It's true that alkalized salts are noble subjects and deservedly claim preeminence, being the opposite of all acids, and therefore make it a dissolvent next to the great liquors. But these can never be volatilized without the universal medium, or philosopher's diploma, along with essential oils and vinous spirits. When volatilized, they become noble spirits, yet still spend their virtue in dissolving bodies and coagulate upon them into a salt, retaining their volatility. Consequently, these are excluded from being the subject of this immortal dissolvent. Another error is in seeking the matter of this liquor in the animal kingdom, namely in man and indeed a greater error in those who claim to teach others that it is there. Having already detected such writers in the preface and clearly shown that for man, the subject matter of this liquor can never be attained, although I know that this assertion of mine greatly contradicts the generally received opinion. Some claim that urine is the basis, and that Van Helmont, Philolithus, Starkey, etc., have asserted the same in their writings, so that I do contradict the testimony of these worthies. For instance, Helmont, when speaking of the dissolution of the stone ludus, seems to assert that it is performed by a substance drawn from urine, and Philolethes, in his extant treatise, has grounded the basis of the immortal dissolvent on urine and blood. George Starkey, in his treatise on this liquor, seems to base it on urine. Nay, an intimate acquaintance of his affirmed the very process to me, namely, the urine of healthy men, unfermented, which, as soon as it was made, was evaporated to a consistency, in order to unite the two salts, volatile and fixed, and then by distillation and cohobation until the whole was brought over. Then, being digested and dislagged, the alkahestus prepared. Dr. Bacon was, as I have been told, much of this opinion. But all these are short of understanding the truth of the subject or of the authors before mentioned. It is easy to be collected from Helmont, Philolithas, etc., 
that they never depended upon human urine as a subject of this immortal dissolvent. For then they would not have directed you to the chaos of the ancients as the true subject, describing it figuratively, and analogizing it with man because man subsists by and from the universal spirit, which is the true subject of this dissolvent. They, for some secret reasons, would not be so candid to deliver this. The same is true for Alapili in his book entitled Centrum Natre Concentratum, which very title shows that it is not man there met, but the universal spirit that being the very life and center of all centers. Therefore, whoever shall assert that man is the basis from which this liquor is obtained, let him be suspected of envy or ignorance, because there is no subject to be drawn from man that will act on minerals for 500 or therefore. I disregard such fools or others who are fixated on highly refined spirit of urine mixed with the true spirit of wine, until both coagulate into a salt, which is distilled and sublimed by the addition of fresh spirit of wine until they come over in the form of a fiery liquor. There are others also who are fixated on the strong spirit of urine united with the spirit of vinegar and distilled into a neutral spirit. But experience, the mistress of all true art, shows that these are all greatly mistaken, along with many others, too numerous here to enumerate. Therefore, I shall pass them by and only insist on some few others that remain. Those are also mistaken who depend on acidic spirits as the subject of this liquor, such as nitre, vitriol, common salt, salt gem, or the mother liquors of any of these, or any other salts growing in or extracted from the earth. For all of them, none accepted, will by distillation yield an acidic spirit, and our liquor being not acidic, but contradicting thereunto. These, of course, are all to be rejected and also to be in the use of the liquor when prepared. Others, who think themselves more prudent, dote much on the spirit of verdigris, and more especially if it is first often, dissolved in spirit of vinegar, made transparently pure, and then joined in spirit of wine and so distilled. They then put as great a price or value on it, as in reason can be set upon the immortal dissolvent itself. But this menstruum being published by Zwelfer, and long before by Basil Valentine, whom I take to be the right and true author of it, and being easy to be prepared. It follows that the liquor alkahes would not be an uncommon or unknown secret, but that remaining still is the greatest of secrets plainly demonstrates that these are not the subject from which it is obtained. They are also misled who depend on mineral sulfurs. Also erroneous are those who rely on the vitriols of metals, or that described by Paul Manus, because none of these are anything but sluggish in themselves, and inactive beings. They cannot be radically opened and separated from their mercuries without the help of the liquor, and then they become passive medicines, not an active menstruum. So, of course, they are to be excluded from being the subject matter of this liquor. Another great mistake and grand error are in those who depend upon essential oils, such as wormwood, mint, thyme, or the oils of gums like amber, benjamin, turpentine. These when broken down and devoured by corrosives like oil of vitriol or aquafortis, and then revived, become, as they say, the regenerated spirit of wine of the philosophers. This spirit, distilled from tartar, salmoniac, and mercury, each distinctly, till their bodies are brought over, is then claimed to be the magi's three universal menstruums, minimum, minus, and magis. But this mistake has proved evidently false to the great expense and disappointment of many worthy persons in this kingdom. Indeed, nothing better can be expected from such heterogeneous and unnatural mixtures, as being farther alienated from the universal spirit than some others already named, and consequently more remote from being the subject of this liquor. To be brief, I exclude on experimental grounds animals, vegetables, and minerals in all and every particular class and part thereof from being the subject of this liquor. Therefore, I shall omit any further discourse of this kind, and come nearer to the matter at hand, which is to detect the errors of those who confuse this liquor with the mercury of philosophers, saying they are the same in subject matter, identity, and operation. It's true, the mercury of the philosophers is a natural, dissolvent, but it dissolves the sun or gold in the way of generation, whereas this circulated salt or alkahest dissolves it by way of separation and destruction so that they differ in operation as much as love and wrath. The one in love preserves, the other in wrath destroys life and motion. There are also other ignorant boasters who confuse them together, yet know neither the one nor the other. 
They say they are both the same in composition and digestion, but near the birth of the royal babe, the matter divides itself into two distinct parts, the one a permanent body, the other, a menstruous liquor or blood. When distilled, this is the alkahest. This shows their great ignorance, for the same that is a body is a spirit. And the blood is homogeneous with both the mercury of the philosophers and the liquor alkahest. The mercury can never be prepared without its aid, as it is one of the three springs. Neither can the spirit of the body subsist without the blood, as every true philosopher, along with me, knows. At this state, there is no division to be admitted without a death to the whole compound. For the whole matter, when diversely worked on, produces different effects. One is a homogeneous mercury, the other a ponderous saline liquor. In the production of both, there are superfluous oils separated, which, though medicinal, are not in the least homogeneous to either. This clearly evinces their ignorance in the process of nature, which is to make bodies into spirits and spirits into bodies again. This menstruous liquor or blood is the life that is sown in its own womb of mercury for the exaltation of both. Here, the heterogeneous feces are cast off, and so it is qualified and united with the spirit in order to redeem the body. Thus, it is a principal ingredient of the stone, whereas the alkahest is not. It would be too long to enumerate the vain and false conceptions of men concerning this immortal liquor, and seeing these distinctions do better become that generation, whereas this circulated salt or alkahest dissolves it by way of separation and destruction, so that they differ in operation as much as love and wrath. The one in love preserves, the other in wrath destroys life and motion. There are also other ignorant boasters who confuse them together, yet know neither the one nor the other. They say they are both the same in composition and digestion, but near the birth of the royal babe, the matter divides itself into two distinct parts, the one a permanent body, the other a menstruous liquor or blood. When distilled, this is the alkahest. This shows their great ignorance, for the same that is a body is a spirit, and the blood is homogeneous with both the mercury of the philosophers and the liquor alkahest. The mercury can never be prepared without its aid as it is one of the three springs. Neither can the spirit of the body subsist without the blood, as every true philosopher, along with me, knows. At this state, there is no division to be admitted without a death to the whole compound. For the whole matter, when diversely worked on, produces different effects. One is a homogeneous mercury, the other a ponderous saline liquor. In the production of both, there are superfluous oils separated, which, though medicinal, are not in the least homogeneous to either. This clearly evinces their ignorance in the process of nature, which is to make bodies into spirits and spirits into bodies again. This menstruous liquor or blood is the life that is sown in its own womb of mercury for the exaltation of both. Here, the heterogeneous feces are cast off, and so it is qualified and united with the spirit in order to redeem the body. Thus, it is a principal ingredient of the stone, whereas the alkahest is not. It would be too long to enumerate the vain and false conceptions of men concerning this immortal liquor, and seeing these distinctions do better become that. Chapter 2 of the True Subject Matter of This Dissolvent In the previous chapter, I have laid down the mistakes concerning the matter of this immortal dissolvent, which Helmont describes with the word latex, which properly implies a hidden source or fountain. So hidden indeed, that he himself says, when this was found, religion stood amazed, and well may the religious man be so indeed, when their descriptions are so occult. For from the word latex, which in common understanding signifies liquids, and may be properly conceived to be aqueous and spiritual, he immediately comes to tell you that the masterpiece to which art is leveled is to find out a body that may play with us in such a symphony or consenting harmony by reason of its exquisite purity, that no corruptive principle can find in it any heterogeneities by which to work its dissipation of parts. Here he immediately calls it a body. Hence, we must certainly conclude that this source or fountain, though liquid, does contain a body in it, or else it would have been vain in him to have directed us to such a body for the object, so circumspectly and diligently, as to find it by hard labor and industry, saying you must be careful or sedulously industrious about finding out such a body which by examination and proof is very difficult to be found, because the words imply that there is no such body in all nature. 
see in beings, there's no answer to what this great philosopher describes of his. Therefore, we must conclude that these words also imply arts, for industry is also recommended. This is as much as if he had said, you must seek the hidden source or fountain of nature and the universal spirit, which art must form into a body. But this son of wisdom was doubtless afraid to speak in such a plain, blunt manner, as a novice does, for fear of exposing the secret too plainly. But it is clear that this was the meaning because nothing is so hidden in nature as the source of this universal fountain. And nothing in nature has the power to reduce bodies by symphony or consenting harmony, but what arises from it. For in these latter words, he also describes the nature and quality of the matter to have two faces. For without there being a composition, the word harmony would not need to be used. So in these words, an abundance of matter is couched in little room, every word being a full sentence, however lightly or slightly the reader may pass over them. It's true, Starkey does very learnedly strike the mark in his exposition upon them. Yet his commentary is so wisely regulated as to be kept as obscure as the text itself. By this means and method, I find that the secret of this liquor was designed by this philosopher to remain a secret to the end of time. Therefore, for the benefit of the true desirers of art, I shall deliver the subject matter of this immortal liquor with much clarity and candor, yet hope that my style and words will be such as to clothe it by such a medium that it may give light to the chosen sons of wisdom, yet at the same time cast a mist before the eyes of the unworthy. This method being agreeable to divine wisdom itself. For we find that what was a light to the hosts of the children of Israel was a cloud of darkness to that of the Egyptians. These things being stated, I shall now come to the consideration and illustration of that subject matter they point forth. The matter they point forth, namely, the hidden fountain, must be of a double nature, or what if I should say it must be a body of salt appearing under two faces, which, being united, makes a symphony of consenting harmony. The reason for which is shown. For then it is a liquor of such excellent purity as to admit of no division of parts. Therefore, as I said before, there is much of the whole business, both of art and labor, couched in Helmont's words. The business of nature in affording such a universal fountain to the artist, that is the basis of the said immortal liquor, and the business of art is to know how to make it corporeal. And when so corporified to contain two faces, which Philolethus figures forth by urine and blood, the first face is a body yet nevertheless may be distilled into a spirit, nay so homogeneous as not to leave one grain of fixedness or salt behind it, which he describes to distill over in veins like the spirit of wine, and speaking very highly of its active qualities in dissolving bodies. The query is put whether it is not the alkahest. The answer is in the negative, saying, it could not subsist without blood, and then comes to the affirmative concerning the subject matters of the alkahest, saying it is contained in blood and urine. These things may confound and amuse the thoughts of the unwary concerning the reality and possibility of these assertions. Yet, nevertheless, they are as clear and perspicuous to the eye of the wise as the sun in its luster at noon. For the universal spirit, when concreted, becomes a mist, vapor, or chaos, or rather an unctuous and viscous water, which is the true matter of all the ancient philosophers, concerning which chaos I have written largely in Mercury's Caduceus, and have there shown that in its womb is contained the first essence of all forms, yet unspecified, and consequently. It contains these two of urine and blood, which indeed are the urine and blood of the great world, and not of man, but more noble, which my eyes have seen and my hands have handled, made corporeal. C2. Your time is in vain if spent gazing at husks or the outer shell of things, but press towards the kernel, or that excellent sweetness which is placed in the center of beings, which can't be extracted except by profound meditation and hard labors, which must be your interpreters. It is not requisite that matter should be discovered more plainly. It is but just and fitting that God should be the sole dispenser of it until the fullness of time, when, according to the promise, hidden things shall be made manifest, even such as have lain hidden from the foundation of the world. Therefore, O son of art, you must pray to God, but also use the means and put your hand to the plow, not looking back. Then these instructions will be as fundamental rules to begin your labors by to obtain this noble secret, which is not so much a product of nature, but of art. For I have in these sheets endeavored to clear up the matter, so as to qualify you with theory, then to judge of sophistical authors, and the better to enable you to withdraw your mind from their entanglement, that you might build upon that sure rock which will remain in the storm of trials. 
This I have done in the bowels of love, while knowing the great grief and torture of mind undergone in my unwearied search after the secret, even when the true subject matter was known, which said matter is also the basis of the grand secrets of the ancients, but diversified into different natures by different operations, and so far distinct the one from the other that an artist may be master of the one and not of the other. Therefore, he who is a complete master of both is properly styled Adeptus Duplicitus. To the truth of this, my affirmation, I have not only experienced, but also the concurring testimony of that renowned philosopher Ludovicus de Comitibus, who says that the matter of the liquor alkahest and the philosopher's mercury do both proceed from the same chaos. But by different operations, they are brought to different effects. Therefore, before you proceed to the preparation of this liquor, you must learn to understand this general matter, mass, or rude chaos, which is the source or fountain of so many mysteries. For this liquor does not only proceed from it, but it is also the wellspring of the mineral life. And while this world has a being, it will be an inexhaustible fountain to all those mysteries so hiddenly delivered by the ancients. For once again, I say that not only the stone, the great elixir, but also this hidden fire proceeds therefrom. But here, you must understand the first chaos before the philosophical mercury is produced therefrom. Therefore, a body and not bodies must be sought for, which, being found, is the center of the universal influence is concentrated in the blood of the said body to be one in essence with the body, though it appears to sight in a twofold diversity, yet distinct in quality or complexion, but agrees fundamentally, which, being united by the hand of an artist, will make the symphony or consenting harmony previously spoken of. For in this case, it may be said of it, as in another place is spoken of the mercury of philosophers, that which is above is as that which is beneath, and so vice versa, for that the essence and life of the blood can't be obtained without the fermentative spirit of the earth, or Saturn's urine. Neither can this spirit of the earth be homogeneous and immortal without it extracts the life of the blood. George Starkey, a disciple of nature, does in his treatise of the said liquor in a parabolical way deliver himself concerning these two faces. Thus, that most acute, subtle, and penetrating spirit of man's urine, by the help of another medium, not of diverse ferment to itself, but centrally one with it, must be united with an acid, not corrosive, but natural and fine. This acid must be equally volatile with the salt of urine before it can be married or united intimately with it. Then, by often circulations, it attains that height of purity to be entitled ensalium, summum salium, and philosissimum. Now, that which is centrally one with this philosophical urine is blood. For the blood is the universal form, as the body is the universal matter. But these being united by force is called a violent way, for it is a different thing to sow gold in its own matrix of universal mercury, and so ferment it and bring it into spirit. For then it becomes unfit for the work of multiplication, the seminal virtue being then totally destroyed and annihilated, which is the very matter and case of the difference of the mercury of philosophers and alkahest. I have shown you not only the matter, but also the manner and apparition of the matter in the hand of the artist. I shall now come to show you the nature and internal property of the same when the knowledge thereof is obtained. I say it is wholly of a saline nature which is a middle property held up in the arms of contradiction to either acid or alkali, so that neither of those, as already shown in the former, have any right to be the matter or foundation of this dissolvent. But the saline quality is the central one. Consequently, this pure spirit has some garment or a shell, by which it is covered and in which it is hatched and brought to maturation. And to speak plainly, candidly, and honestly, it is a combust sulfur, so wholly combust that the spirit being drawn from the earth, the feces will burn without the least smoke, which shows that there is neither any mercurial nor saline part remaining. This is a reduction of the pure from the impure, or a clean from an unclean, by the serpent devouring himself, and then renovating into that over which death has no power. Observe, he first begins by biting his own tail, and so by degrees devours himself, and last of all his head, which shows that the earth or tail is first to be dissolved which then dissolves the head or blood. And that these are the two principles spoken of by Philolethes is very plain. For on page 25 of his Secrets Revealed, he calls it the first ends of salts, saying the true philosopher has rejected all salts, one salt only excepted, 
which is the first ends of all salts. This dissolves all metals, and by the same work coagulates mercury. But this is not done except by a violent way, and therefore that kind of agent is again separated both entirely in its weight and virtue from the thing it is put to. And in his exposition upon Ripley's epistle, speaking of the separation of the sulfur from the mercury of bodies, he says it is performed by the help of a liquor drawn from the first ends of salts. Helmut Starkey says much, calling it Lysalium, summum salium felicissimum, which is the very same that I assert here. What shall I say? Must I in every word transgress the silence of Pythagoras? No. Be thankful for this, for it had never come to your hand had I not made a solemn resolution during the time of my hard labors, sweats, and agony of body and spirit, that if ever the Almighty Being should bless me with the knowledge of this liquor, I would then deliver it so candidly that my writing should be a sure landmark to the undaunted coaster and his intended voyage to the haven of rest. This promise I have fully accomplished here by showing the universal source or fountain from which this liquor and the great elixir do arise is one, so that more needs not to be said on this point. Therefore, I shall conclude this chapter. Chapter 3. The True Way and Manner of Preparing the Liquor Alkahest Having shown the mistakes, and also the true matter, I shall now come to show the true manner of the preparation of this great dissolvent, which is very difficult. For as Philalethes says in his exposition on Ripley's Gates, page 279, the liquor alkahest is 100 times more difficult to prepare than the great elixir. This worthy author has delivered this on good ground, for the elixir is a work of nature, and the mercurial power does purge off the dregs naturally. It is called elixir as long as it is water. For as Count Trevisan says, it is drawn out of the elixir as oil out of waters. Therefore, as the elixir is natural, the liquor alkahest is artificial, and as Ludacus de Comitibus says, very difficult to search into. It may be variously thought of, being artificial. For the subject, as it tends to generation and corruption in order to a more excellent birth, is then vile and mutable. Proteus-like, it puts on all shapes, and what we search for must be pure and clear, and above all things immutable. So here is chemical faith required to believe beforehand, and after sight will astonish reason to contemplate it, crying out with holy admiration, O Lord, how wonderful art thou in all thy works. Reader, if you would consider the work of creation, it was the very same. For out of the rude mass or chaos, not only was the most despicable object we behold produced, but also the most glorious creature that ever was created, not only paradise, but also the transcendent, glorious angels. So from this, the difficulties do arise, how to proceed by art in the separation of this chaos, as also, in the due way and manner of joining the appropriate agents and patients by the separating of things adjoined, it is not sufficient to understand the aqua vitae of the wise, but you must also know how to preserve it from its counterpart or water. For being separated from the strict tie it had in the elements, it would rather pass over than come again to coagulation. Again, it is easy to be destroyed if you take it unripe by the violent fire of separation. These difficulties so confused and puzzled me as to keep me back from the possession of the said liquor for many years, which knowledge I then valued much more than the possession of great treasures. But, however, blessed be God, I have great reason to say that one secret seldom discloses itself alone, for the knowledge of one is a large step of entrance into the other. For in this subject, both of them lie invisibly hidden, as it were, under the strong folds of a mineral ends, which the industrious hand must labor to make manifest, which being affected, his time will be little enough to contemplate and admire the sight of the operation and its wonderful effects. Observe, in the manifestation, it is reduced to the smallest atoms imaginable, through which it rises to the eminent dignity spoken of, for as Helmont and Starkey put it, ad minimos redactus atomos in natura possibilis, etc. Dignius se corpus non repurians qui nubere. This latex, which is vile and contemptible, is advanced to the transcendent height of purity and perfection. These words, says the latter, are soon said, but not, so soon understood and hardest of all to be done, which is the reason for the many difficulties mentioned in this chapter concerning its preparation. It is true, this operation is in few words taught by Paracelsus, where he says in his treatise, De vi coagultur in formam transmutatum, on the power of being coagulated into a transformed form. 
Like the process of the liver into hepate, the process of the alkahest is as it coagulates from its own resolution and then coagulates into a form transmuted. Which short process is the greatest light that acute philosopher Paracelsus gives concerning this mystery? No wonder, then, if the doctrine of its preparation remains so obscure in the world. For Starkey admits that Helmont's doctrine is equally as obscure as that of Paracelsus, and I say that Starkey's is as obscure as either of them, and indeed that of Ludovicus de Comitibus is not much clearer. For the process they have given, which involves solution and intervening coagulation, is the greatest light that any of the philosophers have shed on the preparation of this liquor. There is a reason for such obscurity. The process given by them is general and common, alike to most or all chemical magisteries, but more especially to the two grand arcana, namely, the liquor alkahest and the philosopher's elixir. However, the manner of solution and coagulation is quite different. The one is natural, as already said, the other artificial, and therefore very difficult because it is not easily searched out and may be variously conceived of. But what has been hitherto known and demonstrated by all true artists is solution and coagulation. We shall consider a little the difference and manner of this solution in both these magistries. The dissolution requisite in order to obtain the alkahest is a dissolving of the body into a spirit that will never coagulate into a body again. But the dissolution, in order to obtain the mercury of philosophers, is a dissolution wherein the essence of the body is so congealed as to become a ferment of the mercury, to coagulate upon the body again. For, as the worthy Trevisan says concerning the preparation of the mercury of philosophers, the same matter must abide that the same form may follow, and that nothing is to be added to it, nor taken from it, but a superfluous phlegm and red earth. For when bodies are to be renovated, it must be done by things in kind. Therefore, Trevisan makes it a great error to alter mercury from which short process is the greatest light that acute philosopher, Paracelsus, gives concerning this mystery. No wonder, then, if the doctrine of its preparation remains so obscure in the world. For Starkey admits that Helmont's doctrine is equally as obscure as that of Paracelsus, and I say that Starkey's is as obscure as either of them, and indeed that of Ludovicus de Comitibus is not much clearer. For the process they have given, which involves solution and intervening coagulation, is the greatest light that any of the philosophers have shed on the preparation of this liquor. There is a reason for such obscurity. The process given by them is general and common, alike to most or all chemical magisteries, but more especially to the two grand arcana, namely, the liquor alkahest and the philosopher's elixir. However, the manner of solution and coagulation is quite different. The one is natural, as already said, the other artificial, and therefore very difficult because it is not easily searched out and may be variously conceived of. But what has been hitherto known and demonstrated by all true artists is solution and coagulation. We shall consider a little the difference and manner of this solution in both these magistries. The dissolution requisite in order to obtain the alkahest is a dissolving of the body into a spirit that will never coagulate into a body again. But the dissolution, in order to obtain the mercury of philosophers, is a dissolution wherein the essence of the body is so congealed as to become a ferment to the mercury, to coagulate upon the body again. For, as the worthy Trevisan says concerning the preparation of the mercury of philosophers, the same matter must abide that the same form may follow, and that nothing is to be added to it, nor taken from it, but a superfluous phlegm and red earth. For when bodies are to be renovated, it must be done by things in kind. Therefore, Trevisan makes it a great error to alter mercury from this. We may understand that the great work is performed by a dissolution of the body and congelation of the spirit. However, the work of the circulated salt is a solution into secondary principles, but not into elements, for nothing of profit can be expected from there. Yet, this solution ought not to be into every distinct principle, but into one saline liquor, homogeneous and immortal. Here, this body of two faces, or that of old Saturn's urine and the blood of the great world, are reduced to one. And that you may know it when so reduced, it is a fire, yet in the form of waters, it's an air, yet condensed, it's not corrosive, yet the most sharp and perpetual corrosive, it's not medicinal. Yet the crown of all true medicine, being a cleanser and purifier in nature, a destroyer and conqueror of bodies, it's called the fire of hell because the spirit that comes from the center is united to the blood without the intermediation of the heavenly rays of mercury. Yet acts with such purity that it finds no body more noble than itself to join with. 
therefore is not commissable with any ferment, and so not capable of transmutation. These things being considered, I shall now come to give you a short scheme of what Helmont says concerning this liquor. The first is what the artist desires, and is comprehended in these words. Art is solicitous in finding out a body, which may play with us in such a symphony or consenting harmony by reason of its exquisite purity, that no corruptive principle can find in it any heterogeneities by which to work in it a dissipation of parts. This is the sum of what the artist would attain, and is the chief of all which can be sought for by art. The second is what art by industry does find, comprehended in these words. Religion then stood amazed, the latex being found, which, being reduced to the smallest atoms possible in nature, despises the wedlock of every ferment. Its transmutation is sought for, not finding a body more worthy than itself to which it may be joined. The third reveals the anomaly of this production in these words, but the art or labor of philosophy has brought forth an anomalous product in nature, which took its being without mixture of any ferment, diverse or heterogeneous to itself. And the fourth contains a brief adumbration of the process. The serpent bit himself, revived from the poison into a pure essence, over which death has no power, all of which I have already explained with much candor to a son of wisdom. But for new learners, I shall now provide a further illustration by way of mechanical demonstration. If art is to obtain a body from the latex, it must begin with coagulation and with such a magnetical earth as attracts the celestial rays and universal spirit and concentrates them in the center. For it is in the center that the pure parts of the starry fire are digested, and in the center all the influences meet, and from the center does the living force proceed. For it is the central arceus that sublimes the mineral vapor or those pure spirits that are of a dissolving nature. This is the body which art is industrious about and desirous to know, even the body of the universal salt and sulfur of the great world. For in the mechanical demonstration, from there proceeds such a spirit which in all nature has not its compeer. But before it's brought to that harmony, as to admit of no dissipation of parts, it must have time to mature and to form for itself some pure garments or a complete coagulation, which is done by successive animations, so as to bring the spirit of the earth to permanency before it is taken out of its nest. This is done by successive retrogradations, or repeated coagulations to bring this transverse work of the earth nearer to its purity, for only then is it that it admits no dissipation of parts. Its transmutation is sought for, not finding a body more worthy than itself to which it may be joined. The third reveals the anomaly of this production in these words, but the art or labor of philosophy has brought forth an anomalous product in nature, which took its being without mixture of any ferment, diverse or heterogeneous to itself. And the fourth contains a brief adumbration of the process. The serpent bit himself, revived from the poison into a pure essence over which death has no power, all of which I have already explained with much candor to a son of wisdom. But for new learners, I shall now provide a further illustration by way of mechanical demonstration. If art is to obtain a body from the latex, it must begin with coagulation, and with such a magnetical earth as attracts the celestial rays and universal spirit, and concentrates them in the center. For it is in the center that the pure parts of the starry fire are digested, and in the center all the influences meet, and from the center does the living force proceed. For it is the central arceus that sublimes the mineral vapor or those pure spirits that are of a dissolving nature. This is the body which art is industrious about and desirous to know, even the body of the universal salt and sulfur of the great world. For in the mechanical demonstration, from there proceeds such a spirit which in all nature has not its compeer. But before it's brought to that harmony, as to admit of no dissipation of parts, it must have time to mature and to form for itself some pure garments or a complete coagulation, which is done by successive animations, so as to bring the spirit of the earth to permanency before it is taken out of its nest. This is done by successive retrogradations, or repeated coagulations to bring this transverse work of the earth nearer to its purity, for only then is it that it admits no dissipation of parts. The body, having been found and thus purified, and its spirit produced from the small, invisible, putrefied atoms of the same, causes a religious astonishment. That from so dry a body as the earth should proceed, the central latex, or the most hidden rivulet of the great ocean itself, is a marvel, with nothing in the world being as pure. It despises to contract wedlock with every specified form whatsoever, 
making its transmutation impossible. Indeed, the oftener this universal spirit passes through the entrails of the elements, the greater is purity and the fitter for action. For, on the other hand, matter could not subsist without the continual additional rays of its universality. Therefore, reader, retain your amusement for a time, and you shall hear the philosophical trumpet calling you to behold a wonderful rarity, even the Indian Brahmin's famous waterworks, contradicting all others, as is a well-compacted body of fire burning in water, and in full luster and not extinguished. For in the decoction, the blood and urine are centrally one, but in the coagulation, they appear under two faces. Philothes says as much, speaking of the next matter of the alkahest, saying it is a salt and the fire surrounds the salt, and the water swallows up the fire, and yet does not overcome it, thus making the philosopher's fire, of which they speak. The vulgar burn with fire, and we with water, it being so transcendently pure, then scorns to be joined with any compere, so admits of no wedlock. Herein consists the excellency of this liquor that art and labor conspire together to produce this ends or being without any mixture of any ferment diverse or heterogeneous to itself. Its composition is wholly from universal principles or virgin elements, and invisible ones too. For the earth and the water of this fountain are as invisible to the eye of the vulgar as the fire and air. But being made manifest to the artist, they conspire together to bring forth one anomalous birth. We shall now come to speak of the preparation, which concludes this chapter. As to the time of preparing this liquor, it is long and tedious, a fact Helmont also complains about. But Starkey explains this to be more on account of the stink in the first preparation than tediousness or length of time, for he limits it to a few certain days, which I know is impossible to be effected, unless he begins to calculate from the time the body is ripe and fit to be broken by violence and to be distilled over into a spirit then to unite the blood or other face may be accomplished in his time. But for my part, I comprehend from Helmont what experience shows, namely, that the time is long and tedious, and attended with many difficulties, which Helmont also knew. Or else he would not have complained so much for loss of his bottle, crying out, Oh, that I had removed my receiver, from whence we may readily conceive that he suffered loss. Ludovicus de Comitibus puts the question beyond doubt concerning the tediousness of the time where he speaks of the reduction in retrogradation, saying it can't be performed by common labor, but requires both art and time, which he says is long. Therefore, whoever thinks to obtain it by violence and in a short time will find himself much deceived, for he can never bring it to any final compliment and consequently will never be able to know what virtue it is empowered with, even that fiery and vital one. For it is destroyed by force by its compeer, which Helmont and Starkey do allow, but do not tell what that compeer is. But that excellent son of art, Ludovicus aforementioned, says it's water. Therefore, I attribute to him the praise, his writing is giving me the first light of discovery, what this compeer was. O reader, you must necessarily allow that it is a time of tediousness as well as difficulty to concentrate the benign spirit of the world. To make such a strong, sulfurous, and saline liquor from it, as will dissolve the hardest metals, even those that oppose common fire, are by this liquor radically opened. It can be considered the very essence of the heavenly and earthly elements, and what typifies the fire of the last judgment, which is permanent over the elements in a quintessential nature. Therefore, the degrees of its purity are not to be wondered at. The artist has great cause to bless and praise the Lord his God who has made him an instrument to produce a clean thing out of an unclean, which that good man Job so much questioned, saying, Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Surely, none but God alone. So, we see the best of men speak, but according to that knowledge which the Almighty thinks fit to reveal unto them. For he disposes of knowledge as of rivers, communicating it for the use of all. Therefore, Paul's advice was sound and candid. Judge not ignorantly of things thou understandest not. For indeed, if we look upon the thing aright, it is properly the work of God. As Trevisan says concerning the exaltation of the work in the great elixir, it is done Christi gratia, implying that man can't alter the ordained course of nature, but as an instrument in the hand of God stands still to see a mighty deliverance. But we are speaking of that where art must lend her help because nature is altered from her usual course, and a clean thing is also required. But this is a talent not committed to everyone's trust. Now. 
this clean thing can never be produced but by a radical union of the aforementioned principles, not only by a bare association or apposition of parts. So the same may be said of this, as is of that union of sulfur and mercury in the great work, viz. They can never more be separated, neither in love nor woe. This radical union is as principally required in this liquor as it is in Azoth, which is a volatile, tender spirit for whitening Laton. Now, this being separated from having no eminent smell and being devoid of any heterogeneities, it is a ponderous, subtle liquor, which will not distill over except at a considerable degree of heat and sand, namely, the third degree, it admits of its phlegm to be distilled off first, as other ponderous spirits do. Philolathus, speaking of the substance and preparation of this liquor, expresses himself thus, it is a noble circulated salt prepared with wonderful art, till it answers the desires of an ingenious artist. Yet, it is not any corporeal salt made liquid by a mere solution, but is a saline spirit. Heat cannot coagulate it by evaporation of the moisture, but it is a spiritual, uniform substance, volatile, which in gentle heat will distill over, leaving nothing behind. That is to be understood in a requisite heat of sand. Thus, thus, there is an exaltation made far above what nature was ever able to perform. Thus, I have delivered the difficulties and also touched on the fire and given you the right way of its preparation from point to point. I have declared the truth without defect or ambiguity of words. And as formerly mentioned, I have shown you that no strange ferments are used, the principles being centrally contained in the original chaos, which being separated and brought again to an indissoluble union, is the serpent devouring his own tail, and thus renovating into that, upon which death can have no power. But this cannot be performed but by the help of fires of diverse sorts, convenient vessels, suitable furnaces, and glasses, and a considerable time to boot. Without all of these, it will be impossible for the artist to obtain his desired end, being, as I have delivered, much easier to know the matter than to find out the true manner of its preparation. This is chiefly and principally to be sought at the hand of the Almighty. These are secrets that belong to the divine treasury, and therefore the aid or free leave of the triune power must be implored to open them. Yet I have not failed in these sheets to communicate my experience, and candidly to show the preparation of this immortal liquor as far as it was lawful for me without exposing it to the hands of debauched persons and impostors. And he who can gather it from what is here delivered will scarcely obtain it from the voluminous circumlocutions of other writers, who have so intermixed the preparation and entangled it with the philosophical mercury that the artist stands in need of Ariadne's clue to lead him out of that labyrinth. In this maze, that the ingenious may no longer be bewildered, I shall in the following chapter distinctly and clearly uncover the difference between the liquor alkahest and the mercury of the philosophers. Chapter 4. The difference between this liquor and the mercury of the philosophers. The labor of the candid and honest-hearted is to untie those difficult knots which the envious have always been endeavoring to tie, and to bring the industrious out of that labyrinth where they have been entangled and bewildered, so as to lose the right path. For this end, I am willing to lend my hand to conduct the searcher through this wood where many an honest-hearted and laborious man, I am well satisfied, have lost their way, as they were not able to distinguish the different paths of the liquor alkahest and the mercury of philosophers. Designing this chapter as a plain and knowing guide in this case, I hope that nothing but ignorance itself will question the verity of what I have here delivered concerning the foundation of the alkahest and mercury of philosophers to be one seeing I have on my side not only experience, but also the testimony of worthy sons of art, that they both proceed from the first chaos before art has undertaken to work upon it. But here the difference comes. One is prepared in a way agreeable to nature, the other artificially, and consequently really divested from the generative power, being drawn beyond the predestination of its natural seed. The exact example of which may be seen in a grain of wheat when it is sown in its proper matrix in order to multiplication by generation, or when it is artificially prepared and fermented, and so drawn into spirit, in which work the seminal and generative virtue is wholly destroyed. For here, there is made an artificial solution of the seed not into elements, E2. In the act of dissolution, it is wholly divested of its metallic seed, and consequently made unfit for the act of generation, as was just now shown in the example of the grain of wheat. So by consequence, there must be a considerable difference at their respective ends. Nevertheless, both these, 
as they arise from one universal fountain, may have some likeness in them. And for this reason, the description does in some sense resemble both the one and the other. The similarities caused few to be able to distinguish the true difference, further complicated by the shifting speeches of writers who confuse one with the other so that the artist may be easily entangled. They have not even differentiated them in name, nature, or operation. For Van Helmont says that the liquor alkahest dissolves every visible and tangible matter into the first ends, preserving its power, which words preserving its power are also attributed to the mercury of philosophers. Other philosophers say it is a fiery water, and lights them, and turba philosophorum and seniors say, our water is a fire, and stronger than any fire, for it reduces the body of gold into a mere spirit, which the common fire could never do. The same thing is attributed by Artefius and others to the Alkahest. Helmont says that as there is but one fire in the world, so there is but one liquor in the world, no other partaking in quality with it. And Geber says, The Most High hath given us the knowledge of this water, which lights the candle, gives light to houses, and yields abundance of riches. It would be too tedious to enumerate the parallels of this kind concerning the Alkahest and the Mercury of philosophers. So, it is very difficult for the unskilled and unwary to distinguish their true difference, which is mostly to be comprehended from those words where it is said, the one is a special work of nature, the other of art. Thus, they are different in appearance, as a late author says to prevent a common error, namely, the confusion of our natural dissolvent with our circulated salt or alkahest, some ignorant boasters, who neither know the one nor the other, have taught that they are both the same. I shall show the difference to such an extent that no novice but may effectively distinguish them in his theory. Know, therefore, and note well this short distinction. There is no affinity between them either in matter or operation. They differ in matter as much as one species does from another, the one being meddling, the other saline. They differ in their operations as much as love and wrath, the one in love preserving, the other in wrath destroying life and motion. This author, by his good leave, speaks correctly about the operation, but strains the string too far concerning the matter, as too many reformers do, and so cause errors on the other hand, equal to those they would reform. This leads many to grope for the door of entrance or the middle way, which leads directly to the path of truth. Be sure, as they proceed from one matter, both universal, there is something of assimilation in them, for as much as they are both performed by way of solution and coagulation, both tedious and difficult in searching out. And the subject matter is so far exalted from its former state that it becomes a work of wonders. Certainly, they must have something of likeness, or else those artists were very ignorant who gave them one denomination, calling them by the like name, such as fiery water and watery fire. Immortal and homogeneous essences, alkahest, which is all ghost or spirit, the first ends of salts, and have attributed supernatural virtue to both. From these and such like universal terms and names, it is very easy for the searcher to be deceived. Wherefore, I shall now come to give you a clear and general account of where they agree and where they disagree, and then show you the reason to prevent a common error, namely, the confusion of our natural dissolvent with our circulated salt or alkahest, some ignorant boasters, who neither know the one nor the other, have taught that they are both the same. I shall show the difference to such an extent that no novice but may effectively distinguish them in his theory. Know, therefore, and note well this short distinction. There is no affinity between them either in matter or operation. They differ in matter as much as one species does from another, the one being meddling, the other saline. They differ in their operations as much as love and wrath, the one in love preserving, the other in wrath destroying life and motion. This author, by his good leave, speaks correctly in the operation but strains the string too far concerning the matter, as too many reformers do, and so cause errors on the other hand equal to those they would reform. This leads many to grope for the door of entrance or the middle way, which leads directly to the path of truth. Be sure, as they proceed from one matter, both universal, there is something of assimilation in them, for as much as they are both performed by way of solution and coagulation, both tedious and difficult in searching out, and the subject matter is so far exalted from its former state that it becomes a work of wonders. Certainly, they must have something of likeness, or else those artists were very ignorant, who gave them one denomination, calling them by the like name, such as fiery water and watery fire, immortal and homogeneous essences, alkahest, 
which is all ghost or spirit, the first ends of salt, and have attributed supernatural virtue to both. From these and such like universal terms and names, it is very easy for the searcher to be deceived. Wherefore, I shall now come to give you a clear and general account of where they agree and where they disagree, and then show you the reason. To prevent a common misunderstanding, I will first clarify why they are described in such a way, then provide the true and proper significance of the word alkahest, and explain why Helmont gave the liquor this name. I have taken some pains after inquiring into it, so I am able to give a satisfactory reason. First of all, I shall mention some particulars where they agree. First, the mercury of the philosophers and this circulated salt agree in that they are both universal, one for the graduation and exaltation of metals, the other for dissolving all bodies. Secondly, they agree in that as one preserves the seed in order to multiplication by generation, the other preserves the crasis and medicinal virtue of species in order to healing, or in dissolution, it allows nothing to fly away and fume. Thirdly, they agree in that one is the emblem of man's regeneration and eternal salvation, the other of man's dissolution and destruction, for in the preparation they are both to be seen. Fourthly, they both agree in the penetration of bodies, the one enters to the very central life of them in order to multiplication, the other pierces to their very center in order to their separation and division, for it separates between their central mercury and sulfur. Fifthly, they agree in the matter and manner of preparation. As to the matter, they both proceed from the first ends of salts, and as to the manner, it is by solution and intervening coagulation, until brought to an exalted perfection. Sixthly and lastly, they agree in that they are both made from the universal chaos, as well as in the manner of their composition, for the mercury of the philosophers is compounded of sulfur and mercury, but the liquor alkahest of salt, fire, and blood and both brought to such an indissoluble bond of love and unity, as never to be separated either in love or woe, both homogeneous and immortal, and both universal dissolvents. Having shown wherein they agree, I shall now come to speak of that wherein they disagree. First they differ in this where, as the philosopher's mercury is purely natural, so the process of the immortal dissolvent is merely artificial. For as in this work the sulfur or gold is exalted to the highest pitch and degree of perfection, so in the preparation of the great hylac of Paracelsus, it is reduced from a natural to a contra-natural state. Secondly, they disagree in that where the mercury of the philosophers is a homogeneous metallic ends, coessential in all its parts, true mercury, of a middle substance clear like pure silver, being bright, celestial, and shining, and not so essential to anything as gold, it being its universal mother, does radically congeal upon it. Therefore, as Trevisan says, no menstruum is profitable in the philosophic work, but that which dissolves the body in a generative way, and then recongeals upon the body dissolved. So, the philosopher's solution of the body is a congelation of the spirits. On this account, they have rejected all those solutions as sophistical, where the dissolvent and dissolved remain not permanent together, whereas the alkahest or sal circulatum is a saline liquor and therefore by Paracelsus sometimes called the liquor of salts, and does dissolve bodies but remains not with them, being as easily separable from them as the spirit of sulfur is from oil. Thirdly, there is a disagreement between the mercury of the philosophers and liquor alkahest in the manner of their separation and action on bodies. For the mercury dissolves gold and all precious stones and pearls by way of generation and exaltation, for the life and virtue are multiplied and they may be reduced to their first form in greater virtue and beauty, and of more value to the metallurgist and jeweler. But the liquor alkahest dissolves not only gold but also all the other metals, by way of destruction, so that the generative virtue is defaced and wholly obliterated. And in this reduction into their first matter, it gives a certain testimony of their diversity as evident, as metals are transformed into sulfur and mercury, stones into a saline liquor, and pearls into a milky juice. Fourthly. They differ in that the mercury of philosophers, at the end of its preparation, will become fixed and permanent, abiding all the fiery trials in the form of a calyx, yet as fusible as wax, penetrating mercury and other volatile bodies before their flight and fixing them. Whereas the liquor alkahest at its respective end of preparation is a ponderous saline liquor in the form of water, which will moisten the hand and everything else. As it is wholly saline and volatile, it will not endure the fire but will remain in its form 
distilling over in a saline liquor, being altogether incapable of coagulation, and by that means dissolves all fixed bodies whatsoever, not into elements, but into more simple parts. Fifthly, their difference consists in this. Whereas the mercury of philosophers is made by a remiss fire of generation, even the aerial life and lunar fire being the medium in perfecting it by gentle decoction from point to point, which regimen of the fire has been carefully hidden by all artists, in that it is called the vessel of nature, or mercurial vessel, posis naturae, whereas the liquor alcahest is made by the most violent fire of separation, for the spirit is by violence not only distilled from the earth in fiery form, but that is united to the blood which produces that hellish fire that brings all imperfect metals to a greater imperfection. Though notwithstanding, it makes them the more powerful and efficacious for the expelling and rooting out of diseases and infirmities. For being brought to their first ends, they dissolve and circulate with our juices, as being then thin and spirituous, and so perform that in curing diseases, which in their hard and gross natures could never be expected from them. Sixthly and lastly, the philosopher's mercury and liquor alcohol differ in this, the one may be brought to a universal medicine, the other has no medicinal virtues in it. For, as Philoletha says, mercury thus renovated or newborn may by the philosopher be diversely handled, for he may take it from the fire and circulate and cohobate this mercury by a peculiar operation, which is partly mechanical, until he has a most admirable, pure, subtle spirit in which he may dissolve pearls and all gems, and multiply them or his redstone before it be united with a metal in projection for the making of orum potable. And in this mercury, thus circulated, is doubtless the mystery of the never-fading light, which I have actually seen, but yet not practically made. In a word, everyone who has this exuberant mercury has indeed at command the subject of wonders, which he may employ himself in many ways, both admirably and pleasantly. And certainly, he that has this needs no information from another, himself now standing in the center, he may easily view the circumference and then operation will be next to the Spirit of God, the best guide. So that the mercury of philosophers, being brought to fixity, may be made a universal medicine for curing all diseases and renovating and restoring to youthful strength and vigor, whereas the liquor, alcahest, be it never so highly multiplied or exalted, cannot properly be said to be a medicine, but a menstruum, which is a proper help or medium to prepare medicines by, and in itself still remains unchangeable, being, as Starkey says, endowed with these qualities. Viz, it is a ponderous liquor, being indeed all salt, without any watery phlegm, it is all volatile, being wholly a spirit, without any corporeity left in it, of no eminent odor. For all things which send out an odor considerable are, for the most part, of a very volatile nature, or consist of many heterogeneities. It is not, therefore, volatile after the manner of the spirit of wine, urine, or the like, which fly with the smallest degree of heat, but like unto a ponderous spirit this liquor, which yields its phlegm in the first place, when it has dissolved any vegetable concrete and made it volatile, will allow the same by a gentle heat of balneum marie, a water bath, to be all separated from itself, etc. From what has been said here concerning the agreement and disagreement of these two substances. I hope the diligent inquirer after art will receive good satisfaction and for the future be freed from those doubts and errors which might previously occasion much trouble and perplexity of mind. This was the end I proposed to myself throughout the whole of my discourse. This, therefore, may suffice as to this point. I shall now proceed to speak of the proper names of this dissolvent. But by the way, reader, observe that the invention of this liquor in these parts of the world is owing to Paracelsus. Thus Philolethes, and also adds, that among the Moors and Arabians, it has been, and is at this day, commonly known to the acuter sort of chemists. Consequently, we must accept that Paracelsus did give the most significant and proper names to it, and it is plain from Helmont's own writings that he diligently studied and traced his works in that length, through labor, came to understand them, and, amongst other things, obtained the knowledge of such a dissolving menstruum as Paracelsus often writes of, and seeing this liquor to contain a homogeneous nature, spiritually acting, and after almost innumerable actions, still remaining the same, spirits being immortal, and this liquor proving so. He therefore not improperly called it alcahest. Although, as I shall show by and by, 
this name does more properly belong to the Mercury of Philosophers, and that this was the design of Paracelsus in it. However, by the way, I shall examine the derivation or root of this word, which is from the term alkahest originates from the Belgic or rather High Dutch language. In Holland or Flanders, where Van Helmont lived, geest is equivalent to spirit in English, and in the German tongue, it is more pronounced and guttural, being expressed as alkahest, which signifies all spirits or all spiritual. This word alkahest is mentioned by Paracelsus in the 10th book of his Archidoxus, chapter 6. In this chapter, while discussing the virtue of the members, he states that the liquor alkahest has a great power of conserving and comforting the liver, and consequently, of preserving it from dropsy and all such ailments that arise from the defect of the liver. And if the liver is dissolved or broken, it stands in the place of a new liver. The process thereof is this. It must be resolved from its coagulated state and coagulated again into a transmuted form, as the process of coagulation and dissolution teaches. This passage is the only place wherein Paracelsus has made use of this name, it being not found elsewhere in all his writings. So, it is plain to us that Helmont borrowed this name from him. Therefore, we must, according to reason and experience, consider whether Paracelsus meant this liquor or not, because the process set down, namely, solution and coagulation, is alike in common, as has been already touched at, not only to the preparation of both these arcanums, but likewise to most chemical magisteries. Now, the liver is the fountain of the blood and is the seat of life next to the heart, the blood being there prepared for further elaboration and purification in order to give the body its nourishment for the production of seed and consequently for maintaining life, etc. And it is plain by experience that this liquor will, by a greater length of time, dissolve all mixed beings by its active, thin, spirituous, penetrative, dissolving, and homogeneous nature in a natural. F2. There arises a difficulty in understanding how this liquor alkahest could work differently in healing and restoring the liver, rather than dissolving it, as it does other mixed beings. This doubt is beyond my current ability to answer, and I suppose it will remain so forever, as I do not even intend to conduct an experiment to test its virtues in this case. Besides what is already offered, I have two substantial reasons against it. The first is that this liquor, being difficult to prepare, would be too costly to be administered as medicine. A reasonable practice would soon diminish a considerable quantity, so this great treasure would, in little time, be exhausted and come to nothing if given as medicine whereas it is perpetual as a menstruum. The second is that the philosophers give no direct instructions for the internal use of the white stone, except in epilepsies, palsies, and other diseases of the brain, which is under the dominion of the moon, much less its white oil for externals, such as leproses, scabs, virulent ulcers, fistulas, cancers, noli mitangere, and the like. How then they should dare to exhibit a spirit so active and fiery, yet much more subtle than these, I do not know. Neither indeed can I be made to believe that ever Helmont or any other of the adepts did ever so much as make use of it as a medicine, and consequently, it could not be this liquor which Paracelsus meant when he speaks of the cure of the liver, but rather the grand elixir. But it is abundantly more probable that they serve themselves with it in the preparations of drugs and all kinds of species, in order to bring them to magistries, arcanas, essences, and quintessences, which have a superlative virtue especially from the metalline and mineral kingdom, because what is resolved by it retains their healing faculty. So, from these considerations, I can't conceive that Paracelsus, where he speaks of the restoring of the liver, meant the circulatum minus, or this liquor. Therefore, it's altogether inconceivable that this single dissolving menstruum should be a safe and good medicine, and consequently, should cure dropsy as is easy to be gathered from the foregoing words of Paracelsus, that his Alkest really was medicinal, for he expressly says, if the liver were broken or destroyed, it would be in place of a new liver. Now, from the foregoing considerations, this liquor can't be said to be a safe and good medicine. It is therefore abundantly more probable that Paracelsus by the word alkahest meant the great elixir, that being all spirits, a quintessence, divested of all the elements. And consequently, of all earthly and corporal qualities, for if the grand elixir were not spiritual, it would never transmute, or by this spiritual act. It works three effects. First, penetration and dilatation. 
secondly by fermentation and contraction, thirdly by the acts of the two former. The combustible sulfurs are separated. The pure ones manifested with additional tincture and permanency. So Helmont finding his dissolving menstruum spiritual might easily mistake the words of Paracelsus and call it alkahest. And indeed, the name is no ways improper, although not used for this liquor by Paracelsus, unless Paracelsus was guilty of speaking one thing and meaning another, as Helmont himself sometimes is, as I can prove from the following words. The liquor alkahest, says he, reduces all sensible and tangible bodies into their first matter, preserving the power of their seed, which as you have all along heard, it does not, but their medicinal virtue. The property of preserving the seed belongs to Azoth or philosophical mercury, so that if he were not guilty here, he was for certain beside the matter, but I am apt to believe he was, seeing he was not in all his writings given account of the medicinal virtue of his alkahest, as Paracelsus does of his. From this, it can be clearly understood what I've stated in my previous teachings. Many philosophers were guilty of intertwining these secrets together and naming them with one term. It's evident that Helmont called this dissolving menstruum the liquor alkahest, yet claimed it preserves the seminal virtue, whereas Paracelsus, in this passage, referred to the grand elixir. This is further evident as he has given other names to this dissolving menstruum, primarily used by him are the great hyalic and sal circulatum. These can be generally traced through his writings, and it's easy to discern that he makes a significant distinction between this dissolving liquor and the mercury of philosophers. For the liquor, he calls it circulatum minus, and for the mercury of philosophers, circulatum magus, as can be plainly proven from the process given, where he says, you must extract the first ends of mercury by the spirit of wine, and it will come over in a liquid substance which, he says, is called by the philosophers a most sharp metalline acetum, and by us in our archidoxes, circulatum magus, archidox, book 10, chapter 8. This distinction and process cannot be rightly understood by anyone but an adeptus duplicatus. For the acquisition of this spirit of wine, the work is singular and performed with the help of an assistant. Otherwise, it will be impossible to obtain. Once acquired, the difference lies in the forceful way of dissolving the body and the natural by the spirit of wine, to extract the first sands of mercury. In this, the blood is united and cleansed, then brought to the gentle or benign fire of nature which is one with central salt nitre and also the magical salt. It unites to the center with a wonderful fermentative power. Now, the spirit of mercury or mercurial fire and an oil is aptly called by Artefius the vinegar of mountains, and by Paracelsus the most sharp metal in acetum. It accomplishes what common fire could never do, namely, it dissolves the body while preserving the form and brings it to a spirit, to be exalted in the air where celestial purity and the strengthening, multiplicative virtue is. That spirit will again return to and unite with the body. And this circulation continues until the universal mercury has extracted the universal sulfur. Then, it is truly and properly called the circulatum magus or alkahest, as you prefer. The name is fitting for the elixir itself, as can be plainly discerned from the preceding passage of the same author, where he states that when it has overcome its like, it becomes a medicine for the liver, surpassing all other medicines. And towards the end, he adds, Verily should the liver itself be broken or dissolved. Yet this stands in the place of the whole liver, no differently than if it had never been broken or dissolved, as hinted before. So, the medicine, from the author's own words, by which the liver is cured is none other than mercury prepared, sublimed, vivified into new life, and having passed the gates of death, comes to be united into a twofold life, terrestrial and celestial, and thus becomes that medicinal tincture which is a true emblem of man's spiritual restoration, and is in a far higher degree of perfection than this circulated salt can be conceived to be. Seeing it can be so highly exalted, it can be brought to an elixir of spirits, which in a minute penetrates the center of bodies, being a perfect concatenation of an incombustible fire and light, which allows for endless multiplication, each time advancing in virtue, power, and spirituality. Thus, it becomes a medicine not only for man, but also for metals, making them both perfect and permanent, which the wrathful liquor cannot achieve. This great mastery contains the exalted virtue and universality of light, a quintessence or medicine of the highest purity in the three kingdoms of nature, animal, vegetable, or mineral. Therefore, it may rightly be said to be a medicine for the liver, a member or part crucial to human life. 
This will manifest itself here as a medicine above all medicines in order to restore firm sanity. And for it to be even more clearly understood that Paracelsus spoke concerning the philosopher's tincture, I will quote the words of the famous Arabian prince Geber in his fourth book, chapter 11. There is a medicine, he says, of a twofold nature of the third order, yet but one in essence and manner of working. Cunningly adding, there is, notwithstanding, an addition of a citrine colored sulfur, which is perfected by a most clean substance of fixed sulfur. Behold how its like is overcome after the first preparation. This clearly shows that the like, which is to be overcome, is the very same that Paracelsus spoke of, as I have experimental reason to believe. This, from the testimony of Dornius and Ludovicus de Comet, is also confirmed to be that of the great elixir. In page 247, between the Holy Trinity and the Philosopher's Stone, Basil Valentine compares his Mercury to God the Father, as being a spiritual body, and the Philosopher's Sulfur or Gold to God the Son. Who is both God and man. This sulfur must die and rise again for the sake of its brothers and sisters, becoming then a glorious body, redeeming and tinting them to eternal life. And when these two come together, he says, they are called mercury duplicate. From this union arises our third substance, which is our glorified and fixed sun, the philosopher's stone, or the spiritual essence of the philosophers, called the triune stone. Proceeding from two, water and spirit, animal and vegetable in the mercury, and the mineral living sulfur of sun, which are three, two, and yet but one. Observe, this author's mercury duplicate is the same like as that of Geber and Paracelsus, which the mercury will overcome, and then it becomes the medicine or alcohest spoken of in the stone. Thus, having given you some account and reason for the names imposed by authors on this liquor, I shall now provide some reasoning for our additional name, Trefertes Sagani which is as appropriate a name for this liquor as any given by the adepts. It signifies spirits born in and predominant over the fire, even inhabiting the fire that has the power to dissolve the four elements and reduce them to its own nature of universality. Now this liquor, thus prepared, is a complete key to the medicinal art, opening the treasury of medicines in the three kingdoms of nature in a way second only to the great elixir. However, seeing the use of this liquor is manifold and various, and will require a whole chapter, I shall refrain from discussing it here and refer you to the next chapter where its virtues are fully shown, and come a little to consider. G. The first exercise for a laborious searcher is to come to the knowledge of a true subject matter, which is very difficult. The philosopher's words concerning it are so obscure and hidden, and the matter is involved in such tropes and metaphors, that it requires more than ordinary help to come to a right understanding to distinguish rightly and truly and genuinely what the matter is, which is candidly done in these sheets. The second difficulty the laborer encounters is distinguishing between true books and those that are false and sophistically written, which is a labyrinth equally difficult as the former concerning the matter. A false author is like a wrong guide on a journey, for if at the beginning of the journey he takes but a few steps in a wrong path and then continues, he may in the end be led completely contrary to his intended goal. This is of greater consequence in search, because there are few or none to be met with in all our course who can direct to the right way. In scripture, a curse is pronounced on all those who mislead the blind, which will apply to all those sophistical writers, as there is no blindness greater than spiritual blindness, whether in things natural or divine. Therefore, it's a significant difficulty to distinguish them asunder. Once done, the false should be shunned as much as the devil himself who is the author of all imposture. A third difficulty is, after distinguishing authors, to come to some knowledge and understanding of the true, concerning the scope and intention of their writing, both in theory and practice. This indeed is a difficulty surpassing the former. For these reasons, the first challenge is their circumlocutions and extensive descriptions of things, which could be explained more concisely. The second challenge is the repetition of the same concepts, only with some variation in words intended to confuse the reader. The third challenge arises from their voluminous writings, which give them more room and liberty to confuse their operations, often discussing one thing where they should be addressing another. This misleading manner of writing inevitably leads searchers astray. This issue is not only about the operations, but also about the duration of the operations, causing a lot of confusion and leading operators to make assumptions about time frames that are neither probable in nature nor possible for art to achieve. For most writings, 
it is inferred that the matter cannot undergo the first dissolution in less than five months. The more mature and advanced the matters are, the shorter and quicker the operation will be. Eventually, it may be reduced to a month's work, then a week's, and finally, a day's. But misplacing these operations can lead to errors. There is a significant difference between operations with ripe ferment and those without, as it's challenging to make bread rise without yeast. The last and most significant challenge is the lack of personal financial resources to continue the search and labor. Even with ample knowledge and overcoming other challenges, without money to build furnaces, buy glasses and suitable vessels, and afford coals, one cannot proceed with the operations. This financial constraint was likely the situation of the Clan Boer and the worthy and famous Count Bernard, Earl of Trevisan, which might have delayed him three years from achieving the mastery. The situation of many worthy artists, and often my own, is the most challenging and regrettable scenario. It involves having a large family to support while you are engrossed in your search. This quest demands your full attention and time, diverting you from all other business activities. If you seek assistance from a friend, it comes with great difficulty. Firstly, you must reveal your subject matter. Secondly, your methods. And thirdly, the time involved. Even if your friend is relatively uninformed, they become the judge of your work. If they disapprove, you risk losing both your friend and your art. It's challenging to determine who is genuinely interested or capable of understanding and valuing your work and what they might do with it once acquired. Regarding time, if your friend agrees to your proposals, they expect precise execution and adherence to timelines. Failure to meet these expectations often leads to criticism or even loss of friendship. They, comfortably distanced from the process, are likely unaware of the hardships, fatigue, labor, losses, and disappointments faced by the artist. Moreover, the artist often hesitates to share these challenges for fear of turning friends into enemies. Considering these factors, many deserving individuals might be discouraged from pursuing their artistic endeavors to the significant loss and detriment of the art world. I conclude this chapter with my best wishes to every sincere seeker of art, hoping none of these or similar difficulties become your portion. Chapter V, the use of the liquor alkahest. Circulate a minus or great highlight of Helmont and Paracelsus. In this chapter, I will demonstrate the use of the circulatum minus, liquor alkahest, or south circulatum of Helmont and Paracelsus in universally dissolving all sublunary concretes into their primary matter, without exception. Nothing can oppose it except its equal, water, and the central heart of mercury. The former destroys it, and the latter remains untouched by its activity. All other beings are so essentially dissolved that they can be distilled in their true essences, and by cohobation, they can even be reduced to an elementary water. It is my sincere wish that the excellence and utility of this menstruum were better known, considering the noble accolades given to it by Helmont, Paracelsus, and Starkey. As Helmont says, there is only one fire in nature, our consuming Vulcan, which shares no virtue or quality with any other. This fact is undeniably proven by all true adepts. And indeed, it is far more powerful than any common fire. What remains unconquerable in common fire is radically and fundamentally destroyed and altered by this liquor. The mechanical practice with it is as follows. Let this liquor or fire be distilled from any soft and imperfect metal. At the first or second attempt, it leaves them in a fusible substance resembling wax, from which in this process, the sulfur or tincture is soluble in the best spirit of wine. And from the residue kept for three days in evaporating heat, quick and flowing mercury can be separated. This can also be done with harder metals, even perfect metals, over a longer period, through repeated cohobations. However, once this fire is distilled from common mercury, it leaves it coagulated and fixed, so that it can endure the test of Saturn. It becomes sponge-like, resembling pumice stone but heavy like turbith mineral. Being brittle, it is easily pulverizable. Then, when cohobated with water distilled from egg whites, it causes that distilled water to stink, but it becomes the color of the best coral. Hence, it is named Arcanum Coralinum. When this fire is distilled from any finely pulverized gem or stone, it turns into a mere salt of equal weight to the gem or stone. It resolves pearls into a milky substance, which is their primary essence. This also applies to crab's eyes, actually stones found in the head of a crab, and all vegetable stones, like peach stones, 
date stones, etc. in a nutshell. This fire or liquor resolves all vegetables, animals, and minerals into their primary essences. In such concretes that contain heterogeneities, it discovers and separates them, making them separable. But note, this dissolution is not performed in the same way as with the mercury of philosophers. The latter dissolves bodies by way of generation, but this does so by way of destruction, separating between the central mercury and sulfur of bodies. Although they are very effective as medicines, yet they are bereft and devoid of any generative power, so it is futile to expect generation from them. Seeing the liquor itself is prepared by way of wrath and thus dissolves bodies, which is why it's called ignis gehenne, the fire of hell. However, the medicines prepared by it surpass others, so I shall provide some specific examples of it, first of those of inferior rank in terms of preparation, and then of those more difficult and noble. For smaller experiments and more convenient use of the alcahest, it's good to equip yourself with suitable vessels, as small as egg glasses, thick and strong, with short necks, wide mouths, and ground stoppers that fit precisely. Also, small retorts with ground stoppers, which can serve both for digestion and distillation. But for larger experiments in greater quantities, I recommend using my hard metal jugs made sizable with very long necks. Well tested by putting them into a pail or tub of water up to two inches below the mouth, then blowing your breath into them. If any air holes are present, the water will bubble, indicating they are not fit for use. These serve for digestion, dissolution, and also distillation, because you can work with them either standing upright or lying down, as your needs dictate. Having thus equipped yourself with vessels, you can begin your solutions first on vegetables, which it resolves into their first liquid matter, distinguishing in them all the heterogeneities by several colors in distinct places, one above the other. In this resolution, there always settles itself in a distinct place a small liquor, eminently distinguishable from the rest in color, in which the essence of the whole herb, tree, or seed resides. In this retrogradation of the concrete, by this method of dissolution, there is not a loss of virtue, but an exalting of the same by many degrees. However, whatever virulency is in the crude concrete by this operation, any inherent toxicity is completely eliminated. While preserving all the specific virtues inherent to the concrete in its simplest form, it's important to note that you can dissolve all herbs into their liquid principles without any sediment. Part of this will be oily, especially in trees, gums, seeds, and many roots and part will be aqueous, where the volatile salt of the concrete will be noticeable to the taste. The liquor, along with its own oil, can be circulated into an essential salt, which indeed is the first essence of the concrete. However, if you want to expedite the process, perform your dissolutions in stronger heat, and distill over your liquor with the dissolved body in the appropriate fire. This will completely transform the oiliness into a saline spirit, which in distillation by a bath will come over in various colors. The essence separates itself from the phlegm, distinguishable by color, taste, and smell, as well as by its time of coming over the helm, leaving your liquor at the bottom as potent in quantity and effect as before. For example, this process works exceptionally well with balm, or any other vegetable, better dry than green, which, when macerated for a few hours in gentle warmth, dissolves in such a remarkable manner that its effect is astonishing. Once the alka has to separate it from it, or brought over according to the previous direction, from balm you can obtain a noble cordial for the heart. Similarly, from hellebore you can drive a noble specific against gout, hypochondriac melancholy, fevers, and deliriums. From colocynth, an excellent febrifuge can be obtained, and from cedar, an essence for longevity. For this, take cedar wood, and an equal proportion of the solvent and digest for 24 hours, and it will be completely dissolved in preserving even the very same odor once the liquor is separated. It can freely dissolve in the spirit of wine, or if you first dissolve them in the spirit of wine, the liquor will dissolve with it. Digest and draw off the spirit of wine, and then you may distill off the alcohest with the essence of the concrete and separate them as you have been directed. Note that the dissolution for longevity must be in a gentle heat like that of the sun in the spring, and after that, it should be digested in a similar heat until the oil and water unite into an essential salt. I would advise all vegetables to be prepared in the same nature if you desire to have their eminent virtues without losing those peculiar excellencies.
which depend on the ultimate life of the concrete. Otherwise, a speedier preparation makes the medicine no less effective for curing diseases, though less powerful for longevity. From myrrh, aloes, and saffron, an excellent antipyretic medicine can be made, as well as for fainting spells, debilitation, convulsions, and paralysis. Thus much for vegetables. I will now give you a short overview of stones, pearls, and coral, and lastly, of minerals. However, I must admit, by the way, that if your liquor radically dissolves charcoal, it is as certain a sign that it is true as if it dissolved gold itself. According to Helmont, the work succeeds well upon charcoal. It's admirable to see how the operations will be changed and varied according to the degree of fire and the duration of digestion. Take lutus stone in fine powder and an equal amount of the solvent. Digest for 24 hours, then distill, and it will be wholly converted into a salt. When calcined, this salt in a cold, moist air will easily liquefy, which will certainly cure the stone and all its attendants. H. Take the desired quantity of pearls and an equal proportion of the liquor. When immersed in the liquor, the pearls will dissolve into a mucilage after gently macerating for a few hours, which can be resolved in spirits of wine. The same process can be applied to crab's eyes, but it will occur more rapidly. This creates an excellent medicine for comforting the heart, strengthening the marrow and bones. Coral dissolved in this way is a medicine that restores senses to those who have lost them, comforts the brain, memory, and heart, dispels sadness and melancholy, and promotes a cheerful and healthy constitution. When using this liquor, do not use any acidic spirit, salt, or corrosive substance of any kind. If such things are used as mediums, whether for mercury or any other purpose, they must be thoroughly washed off and sweetened before the alkahest is applied. Therefore, find flowers of. Sulfur are the best choice. Take whatever quantity you desire, mix with an equal proportion of liquor, and digest for two days. Afterward, cohobate two or three times. The result will be a very red oil, separable from the liquor by a separating glass, excellent for consumption, coughs, and similar ailments. It is not only a preservative for the human body, but also for beer, wines, and other liquors. If you abstract this liquor from the cacks of lead, with a digestion period of 24 hours beforehand, the lead will be so separated, unlocked, or opened, that in the spirit of wine, it will easily release its sanguineous and sweet tincture. This is the magistery of lead and an excellent remedy for all types of burns and inflammations. Take one ounce of the flowers of antimony, sublimed with sal ammoniac and sweetened, or use the alcohol of antimony, which is better. Mix it with three ounces of the alcohest liquor. Place them in a retort and digest for a maximum of six hours. Then distill off the solvent, and you will have a true medicine that infallibly cures dropsy. Take one ounce of well-sweetened precipitate, made in any desired manner and mix it with two ounces of the solvent. After digesting for 24 hours, distill it, and you will obtain a fixed precipitate that acts through stool, sweat, and urine. This is a certain remedy for leprosy, scurvy, king's evil, gout, and pox. Take one ounce of the cacks of gold and two ounces of the liquor. Digest it in a flask with a long neck, or one of the egg-shaped glasses previously described, which is better, for three days, or until it no longer yields any tincture. Then pour off everything that has dissolved into a retort, and gently distill off the liquor. You will find the gold dissolved at the bottom of the retort. You may either dissolve this in spirit of wine, or let it delicate in the air, and you will have true drinkable gold. The same process should be followed with silver. Another method. Take one ounce of gold calcined to fine atoms, or laminated into thin leaves, and mix it with three ounces of the alcohest liquor. Put them into a retort with a ground stopper and leave them in the heat of a gentle bath for a few days, or until the gold is dissolved without sediment. Once the liquor is distilled from it, it leaves behind a fusible salt form. Cohobating it often with the liquor makes it volatile, and it will distill over in two liquors, white and red. The red is the hematine tincture, and the white may be H2 reduced into a white mercurial body after the dissolving liquor is separated from it. Thus, gold, the king of metals, naturally most resistant to corrosives, enduring all kinds of couple and extreme tests without the slightest loss, even the most exquisite trials of Vulcan, is by this liquor. 
of fire is completely mastered and conquered by this liquor or fire. It is transformed into its mineral essence, which is the highest preparation of gold that can be achieved using this liquor, representing its fifth essence. This form has the power to cure the most deplorable diseases to which human nature is subject. The mastery of gold, which is the highest preparation of it using this liquor, is an outstanding medicine against all malignant fevers, pestilence, paralysis, plagues, etc. Similarly, you prepare the fifth essence of silver. However, the following medicine is equal to, if not superior to, either of these. The sweet oil of Venus. Take the best Danzig or Roman vitriol and calcine it until it is thoroughly wasted in the fire. Then, cleanse the Kolkathar with distilled rainwater and dry it very well. To the prepared vitriol, add an equal part of the fire or liquor. It will dissolve easily and amicably. Distill off your liquor and pour it back again, then cohobate it at least 12 or 15 times. Doing so will bring over the entire body of the Kolkothar in the form of a green liquor. Digest this in the gentle heat of a bath for about a month and then distill it in a slow fire. This will bring over the entire metallic substance of Venus, leaving the liquor below in the retort with its entire weight and virtue. To this liquor or spirit, add an equal quantity of sal ammoniac. Dissolve in as much water as needed for dissolution. This will separate the green liquor from a white sediment. This white sediment will yield a white substance, white metal, as fixed as silver and will endure the test of Saturn, but yet it is distinct from silver, which you, if a philosopher, shall easily perceive. However, it is as valuable to a metallurgist as the best silver. Dry up the green liquor in a vial glass by evaporating all the moisture, for it is the sulfur of Venus mixed with a sal ammoniac, by which note this, it is fixed so that it can endure all fire. Extract the sulfur with the most pure spirit of wine, which will dissolve it, leaving the sal ammoniac behind. Then distill away from it, thus dissolved your spirit of wine, and you are left with a very fragrant green oil of Venus, which is its sulfur essentiated by these operations, as sweet to taste as the best honey. Nature has not a more sovereign remedy for most, if not all, diseases. This is the true nepenthe of philosophers, causing certain rest and alleviating all pains, but always leaving the person either visibly improved in more violent and chronic diseases, or completely well in the less severe maladies. Thus, also from lapis hematitis and spelter may be derived noble medicines, as well as from the sulfur of antimony, and more especially from common mercury. If you cohobate the liquor so long until its body is brought over and proceed in all things as in the sulfur of Venus, you will have a medicine that will achieve whatever can be desired by either patient or doctor. Thus, having given you a short landscape, as it were, of this liquor, I shall here pass it by at present and conclude. Finis. Part 2nd. A Philosophical Epistle. Discovering the Unrevealed Mystery of the Three Fires of the Sophi. Thou indefatigable seeker of the mysteries of nature, hidden in silence by the ancients, in compassion for thee I have here composed some ideas, which in practice will serve as a touchstone to all true seekers of alchemy. And therefore, aiming chiefly at your good and benefit, I shall not use any flattering speech to persuade you into a good opinion about what is written here, as it is not the custom of philosophers to use them in a science so sublime. I am well aware that I have candidly written the very truth by which I have beneficially and, I hope, satisfactorily informed those who are worthy searchers after this mystical science, the very mother of all others. And as this is designed as an epitome of true practice, I shall, without any circumlocutions or allegorical speeches, demonstrate the truth in a modest, cabalistic style, hoping thereby to veil it. B. It from the unworthy yet at the same time to provide free entrance to the adopted sons of Hermes. It is necessary that it should be so delivered, being the foundation of that Kabbalistic wisdom which contains the secrets of nature and is the most principal part so highly esteemed by the Jews, Chaldeans, Persians, ancient Greeks, and many other Christian Kabbalists of other nations. As I said just now, it is the mother of all natural art and science, a fact agreed upon by Paracelsus, Sandivogius, Philalethes, and many others. We shall first make a theoretical and then a practical investigation concerning the beginning of this Kabbalistic wisdom. First, theoretically, it is affirmed that this secret science was delivered by divine inspiration to the ancient Jews, 
particularly to Moses along with the law, both natural and divine, as some of the Hebrew rabbis assert in general. However, others among them believe that it was revealed four times from God to mankind. Some say that Adam had a perfect knowledge of it in paradise. Others that it was revealed to him as a form of recompense after he was expelled from paradise. Also, it was revealed to Moses in the bush, to Solomon in a dream, and to Ezra by an angel. From this, the Jewish Kabbalah had its origin and was highly esteemed by them in succeeding ages. However, I must make one remark, which is that it seems clear to me that the art was often lost, or else why would there be a need for renewed discoveries? There is a very good reason for it. In those ages, as they affirm, the practical and natural part of this wisdom was never written in books, but passed down orally. It was delivered by way of tradition from one generation to another, and that only among those they deemed worthy. One principal obstruction to the successful exaltation of this art was the various captivities suffered by the Jews. But Ezra, the great restorer and last establisher of this art, being highly illuminated in possessing knowledge of the past and foresight of the future, feared that Israel would suffer more captivities and banishments. Heeding God's command and obeying the angel, Ezra wrote 204 books, among which were 72 about this art, to preserve it from the frailty of human memory. According to Domina de Neufment, in his Tread to Sell Phil, Ezra gathered all the elders, numbering 70, where it was decreed, by God's immediate appointment and command, that the books of divine mysteries were to be made public for all, but those about this art were to be delivered only to the wise of the people. These contained the vein of understanding, the fountain of natural wisdom, and the blood of knowledge. Picus Morangelanus, esteemed as the phoenix of his time for learning and knowledge, stated that these are the 70 Kabbalistic books wherein Ezra clearly mentioned the fountain of all understanding and knowledge. This includes the invaluable theology concerning the supreme deity, the fountain of wisdom, and the complete metaphysics of intelligences, the stream of knowledge, which is the firmest natural philosophy. These were held in such veneration among the Jews that no one under 40 years of age might touch them. Moreover, which is to be admired, in these Kabbalistic doctrines were contained some seeds of Christianity. It is the opinion of wise men that these books remained until the temple was burnt by the Roman army. Whether this is true or not is not my concern at the moment. My intention is only to highlight the origin and, over time, the decline and disappearance of this art from the general knowledge of mankind. As a result, many learned Christians today are far behind the wisdom of the Jews with some considering it as a fanciful story or idle fiction, as I will clearly demonstrate in my analytical chimica theologia poetica. Others, however, regard it with the utmost veneration. From this, many learned men believe that the art spread from the Jews to other Eastern countries. However, I cannot fully agree with this for some fundamental reasons. Hermes, who was a master of the science and king of Egypt when it was considered the Garden of God, lived according to the best accounts from ancient chronologers, before Moses' time, and consequently before the Jews became a nation. As he was the first to teach literature to mankind and had written many books about the science, it is highly probable that the knowledge may have originated from him. Paracelsus and others trace it back to Adam and the forefathers of the first world. They say that foreseeing the deluge, they erected two stone tablets containing the foundation of this wisdom one of which was found after the flood on Mount Ararat in Armenia. This led to the conclusion that the eastern countries obtained their knowledge from these sources. It is claimed that the uh, Chaldeans, from which country Abraham, the father of the Jews, came, and the Persians were, great admirers and diligent seekers of this art. However, where matters seem dubious, I shall not lend my support to another's opinion, knowing well that according to scripture testimony, God created all nations from one blood to dwell upon the earth, and through his fatherly care and divine providence, he distributed knowledge like rivers of water for the service of the whole creation. As the author Dominicus de Neisman says, the fountain of this mystery lies open to all, and all who have sought earnestly to obtain it have mastered it, without respect to name or nation. It is evident from the existing books that many significant insights can be gathered from the wise and learned men of all countries and nations. Therefore, I consider it too difficult a task to determine who were the first possessors, so I shall pass it by and comment on the high esteem in which the ancient possessors held this knowledge. Namely, 
that it was a jewel of too great value to be entrusted to those of mean education and was deemed suitable only for their kings, priests, and great ones. But blessed and eternally praised be the great everlasting God, who is no respecter of persons. All who truly fear him, regardless of nation or blood, are esteemed by him. As our blessed Lord says, as in the spiritual, so in the temporal, to the hungry babes, he reveals his secrets. This should suffice as general hints about the art's origin. I am not concerned with who were its first possessors, as long as it is now to be possessed. Therefore, I shall proceed to delineate some practical truths in a way agreeable to those living ideas of truth that this art carries with it. I have great reason to believe, through practical knowledge of a mineral chaos or certain matter, which is universal and copious enough for the art to have its origin and foundation from, that the art is true and easily obtained by natural. B3. It is very clear to me that this is the one true matter, which all the ancient philosophers, without exception, have unanimously testified to. They are so united that they do not differ in the slightest point in the matter, or in the modus operandi thereon, even though they span generations and are different both in language and nation. This uniformity is a clear proof of its verity, and therefore it is a great ignorance to question its possibility. However, it is not my task in this short epistle to use many arguments to convince the naysayer or unbeliever. My goal is to assist the diligent and indefatigable seeker after natural truths, and to let them know that the knowledge of this subject matter is of such importance that it is the very foundation upon which Hermes's mystical temple is built. The correct proceeding on this foundation is the main hinge on which the door of entrance swings. It is by knowing these first steps that we come to the fountainhead, discerning those rivulets that run through the most dark caverns of nature's hidden mysteries and gradually stream forth into those clear and crystalline waters that open unto us the nature of all created beings. Ah, then, what a great pity it is that such a useful and profitable science should be so slighted, contemned, and neglected due to the difficulty of its search, even by men who are qualified with outward qualifications. This science allows us to discern, as Sandivogius says, the growth and virtue of created beings. The many clashes that often happen about these topics, I think, stem merely from not knowing this foundation, as many are apt to form their own ideas of things, so that fancy has become the foundation of two. I see that many theories exist, but I would not esteem any theory further than it can be practically demonstrated. It is essential that the water be drawn from the fountainhead and not from the by-rivers of tradition, which have never been and never will be confirmed by experience. There are too many who, in the subject matter of this art, hold their own notions and conceptions in high regard, much like Naaman did with Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus. He thought they were better than the waters of Jordan. When the prophet Elisha instructed him to go down seven times into the river Jordan to wash and be cleansed of his leprosy, this seemed too low, too humble for him. It is said that he was angry and went away and said, So is our subject too mean and contemptible to the high notions of the process mongers, for I know by experience that should I reveal it as I have done to some, they would neither believe nor regard it. I thought the prophet would surely come out to me and stand, and call on the name of the Lord his God, and strike his hand over the place, and cure the leper. Not considering that great miracle of its being performed by simple water, nor knowing the type of the water of Jordan, which signifies the river of judgment, through which true cleaning comes, it being a type of a more excellent fullness. But however, he was prevailed upon by his servant, who said unto him, My father, if the prophet had hid thee to do some greater thing, would you not have done it? How much more then, when he says to you, Wash and be clean? Now Naaman, being persuaded, did accordingly and was cleansed. This I mention to show the great esteem many have for their own conceptions, as well as to indicate that the same spirit of ambition remains to this day, especially in those whose heads are filled with the before. Ideas of things, even though they may prove mere folly in practice, as Naaman's would have. What if I say that there are too many who are elevated to a far greater degree of self conceit than he was, and so are not to be persuaded by those of an inferior rank? Neither dare we use that. Familiar language with them, as his servant did to him, even though advised to their own interest. This seems to me a principal reason why the leprosy of error in this art remains so visible to this day. And although, as previously mentioned, we have a cloud of witnesses on record regarding the truth of this art, and nature's universal fountain and spermatic water that generates all things in fire, 
air, water, and earth, primarily through the activity of the two active elements, visible to the eyes of all men, yet to speak of the art of transmutation is a very ridiculous thing. And the very name of alchemy is considered a chimera, and its students, if they don't hit the nail on the head the first or second time, are marked with a black coal of infamy. Such little consideration is given to what difficulty and hardship many of the ancients endured before us, and through a vast field of errors, they obtained the truth. They say that all erred in the beginning, and so I leave it as a caution that the true laborer should not be disheartened, though he may err for Arandodissimus, by erring we learn. But hoping that these lines may fall into the hands of some who may not only understand what I write here, but also empathize with my painful and indefatigable labors. Knowing that the art is not obtained all at once, but by steps, and therefore will, with me, pity the ignorance of the rash and hasty process monger, and also smile at such as before mentioned, who they damn up to themselves this fountain, which is so open, free, and general that most people have it and know it, even that subject matter from which the wise men obtain their knowledge. And although it's this open and free, I'm very apt to think that it will remain as a sealed fountain while the man of sin remains and the work of regeneration and restoration is so little known. But passing by this and much more of the same nature that might be said, I shall come more directly to the matter at hand, which is to show that this subject contains all the elements and all the principles in a single and compound manner, or as it has its eastern magnet, or chalybe found in the belly of Aries, which is a true sulfurous fire, coagulating and ripening the compounds, so it has its western, found in the belly of Libra, where the scale of justice is, for it casts off all corruptions. Here must your tent be pitched and settled too, if you ever intend to see the flux and reflux of this fountain or sea, and I doubt not, but I shall sufficiently uncover in these writings, and show the sons of wisdom, that I am not wholly ignorant of the mysteries of the ancient philosophers, though as yet but a tyro, being not in full possession. And it is usual for such to speak more plainly in any science than a crafty master, therefore. You may perhaps find in these sheets what you might not be able to gather from all the voluminous writings of the ancients extant, designing it as a journal of my philosophical theory and practice. Having already plainly pointed out the matter, I shall now lay down some rules by which the nature and qualities of it may be better discerned. In order thereto, the first thing that I shall offer is as follows, stating it as an infallible maxim in philosophy. That if ever the if the artist expects to obtain a universal medicine, it must be from a subject that not only contains all the particular forms of mineral salts and sulfurs, as can easily be demonstrated by the hand of an artist, but also the metallic ones too. It must also contain the general form of light, heat, motion, and astral virtue, from which the perfect metals receive their beauty and durability. This comes from an oily and luminous vapor of salt, sulfur, and mercury by which the particular body of salt and sulfur is animated, enlivened, purified, and exalted. It is also truly opened, so as to cast out all its corrupted defilements, and to be brought to a wholly universal nature by the magnetic virtue of our Western Mercury. This is the true beginning and foundation of our art. It is impossible for anything to give what it itself does not possess, and therefore it cannot be attributed to any particular species whatsoever. But to the great fountain of nature, even that universal salt, sulfur, and mercury, from which all things derive, in secondary causes, their life and multiplicative virtue. To describe it more plainly, it consists of living fumes, both male and female. The male is a dry and sulfurous earth, naturally and artificially prepared both simply and in compounds. The female is a moist and living vapor, a spermatic and fecund water, and the whole is a mystical emblem of the ancient vapor, mist, pile, or chaos, from which the world by the stupendous art of the great artificer, even the Almighty God, was first formed. For in its womb is contained the first entity of all natural forms, yet unspecified. This has been from the foundation of the world and will continue to the end thereof, as the true and right beginning of this mystical science. The first necessary apparitions that are constituted and appear from the first chaos and separation are the elements, namely, a superior sperm-like water and an inferior saline one which are air and water, earths, red and white, and a mixed vitriolic salt and sharp vinegar. These contain earth and fire. Now, the inferior waters, being putrefied and separated from a coagulating, arsenical, poisonous salt, 
and united with its natural spouse, the salt of the earth. Then by distillation and sublimation purified from a poisonous fume and corrosive fixed salt, which constitutes a second apparition in order to a formation of the body natural, which is in union of the three earths with the sperm-like water. Then adding the first menstrual or fire, namely the vinegar and mercury sublimate, produce by means of our fire, by digestion, out of the united waters, the first body of earth and fire, in whose womb is contained the first receptacle of tincture. Remark it well, our fire is sulfurous, yet a living and volatile earth, purified from all watery aquacity and earthy traces, and by sublimation brought to that state that answers the artist's end, even to heat and warm the cold and feminine matrix of mercury, making it naturally to throw off its defilements. This is a dry water and yet a fire, and lukewarm ashes, a green lion, a house and habitation of tincture, the governor of our bath, that white, that lunar earth, which to this day from the foundation of the world hath remained undiscovered. This is that fat and dry water which was prepared by Medea, by whose advice Jason charmed the dragons of the Hesperian gardens. And as it is the governor of the bath and the conqueror of the dragons, so by it alone the oil of the lamp is governed chalibanically. And without this heat, the artist must fight a long time. The reason is shown by Sandivogius, who says that nature makes the metals are made of mercury alone by long decoction, but art adds a ripe sulfur which causes a significant deviation in the work. For although it is a body, it is volatile in the nature of a spirit, so that it more readily unites with the quick motion of mercury. This is a volatile sulfur from a volatile mercury, which carries on the work to its original predestination in order to perfection. Practice of it is to unite the dry and moist, that is, the sulfurous and mercurial, in a complicated yet simple compound nature, in a double dry and double moist nature. The first dryness is in the natural earth, the second in the earth and fire artificially, the first moisture in the united inferior waters, the second in the air. Now the most dry, the most moist are male and female, which are activated by an active spirit present in all of them, but is only manifested by the union and rotation of elements. This involves casting a mineral sulfur into a vegetable mercury, by which they completely and perfectly purify each other. So. The whole work is but a process of rarefying water into air and condensing air into earth and making spirits into bodies and bodies into spirits again. This is achieved by uniting the center with the circumference and by boiling fire and waters. One who does not know how to weigh the fire, that is, to understand its true weight in the composition of bodies, as well as to measure the wind or rather know the power that holds the wind or air in its grasp, will never know the right beginning and practice in our philosophy. In plain terms, it is in the balance of Libra, as the right scale holds the weight of fire, so does the left the weight of air, grasping and separating the pure air from the crude. This crude air must never go into the work, for nature discards it as a voluntary vomit, being the most wild and uncondensable fume in the whole world. That burnt sulfur contained in the combustible oil, which, if you were to distill or sublime and separate a residue like lamp black from it, still does not avail for our work for nature alone must perform it. The separation of the pure from the impure is not by hands, but must be done by the stone of fire. Thus, I have shown in the first work what must be separated and what must remain, which brings me to the second menstruum or elixir. The principal way to attain this is by the knowledge of the green lion, which is that unclean menstruum, in the true preparation of which the whole art consists. For in its bowels alone is that fire, which is the key to the whole mystery. According to Pontanus, it is equal, it is mineral, it is continual, and it does not evaporate unless it is too much stirred up. This stirring up is a violent breaking of the vessel, house, or habitation. But if you are so rash, it may, by the force of its stink, knock you down at once. Flemmel says, the force of its stink can kill everything living, but adds that the philosopher does not smell the stink unless he breaks his vessel. This breaking of the vessel is the same as Dantanus's stirring up of the fire too much, by which it evaporates and flies away. As the body contains the receptacle of the golden tincture, so does this that of the lunar one. Even though both the mercury and the gold grow up together, and the body is calcined and made black and unctuous, these two have no fundamental union during all the time of the flight of the eagles, which are seven or nine. For all this while, the green line is predominant, and the chief color that predominates is blackness. 
for in this color only is contained the king's royal diadem and the magician's sun, moon, and mercury. You must know that Latan must be whitened before it is taken out of its womb, for when ripe it will give thee not only a lunar, but also a solar oil. The philosophers say the whole work is but to extract the water from the earth and to return it to the earth again. However, there is something very mysterious to be understood in these words. If the water or spirit that is putrefied in the earth is not cooled by casting it into the water and air by which it is cleansed, it is incapacitated to return to the body. As the artificial sublimation carries off a hydropical water and filthy earth, so does this natural process purify the mercurial water matrix in which it is sown, making it likewise cast forth a filthy earth and hydropical water also. This is our Tephius's body that coagulates the water into dryness, like rennet does cheese out of milk. The body, cleansed by vinegar and salt, and our fiery dragon, the juice of the vegetable Saturnia, may then be reunited by the medium of our dry water or philosophical fire. Flamel's first agent or peacemaker, Basil Salamoniac, which in page 155 of his elucidation he greatly magnifies, instructs you not to despair of obtaining it, telling you that it comes from the mine of old Saturn. From this, you can easily discern that there must be mediums between the hot and the cold, the dry and the moist, and it is also the union between the volatile and the fixed. For the body, being formed in the water by a spiritual body and corporeal spirit, or out of vitriolic water and a sulfurous fume, they mix in the smallest parts in the sulfurous earths. But if they are not formed gradually, the body will lose its magnetic virtue and will never be able to return to a spirit again. For if the body is not endowed with the powerful attractive virtue, it can never be animated. And if the celestial spirit is not pure, the body will not retain it to profit. For they are nourishment to each other. The body fixes the spirit, and the spirit exalts the body with celestial virtue. Nay, that celestial airy life by which it was although in more simple manner, first formed. So, you may observe that the body is most healthy and durable when nourished and enlivened by the simplest food, so-called, as it proceeds from the first essence of its own being. Similarly, it is that spirit that remains in its own habitation until ripe, for it is that only which gives strength to our philosophical babe, so as to bring it to a heroic-like state of force and strength sufficient to dissolve the body. For the white and female dove will first ascend, and then it will go down and fetch up the male. For it is by regeneration and new additions of water, spirit, and fire that our third and permanent menstruum is brought forth, which is a white and incombustible oil, taken when ripe as a kernel out of the shell. Here you may conceive, I mean as to the outward, that mysterious doctrine of regeneration, for the first body after it is brought forth must be brought down to death by the water and spirit of the prima materia. And then it is raised a more glorious one, for doubtless since the fall, the whole creation groans under the bondage of corruption, as the scripture says. For duality being entered, it brings with it its impurities, and therefore may aptly be said, there is a body that is from the earth, earthly, so there is a spirit that is more celestial and pure, for it takes off the Adamic corruptions, I mean, the effects of the curse for man's transgression. Therefore. The body, like Naaman the Assyrian, must be cleansed of its leprosy by going seven times down into the Kabbalistic river of Jordan, or according to Artefius. The hard and dry bodies must be put into the water once for all. That is to say, there must be no fresh matter, yet there must be fresh water and spirit, yea, and sulfurous fire too. For he also adds, that in their vinegar of mountains, there is one of antimony, another of mercury sublimed which adds to the body both weight, color, and tincture, for it is the spiritual seed of this first male. That causes a fermented virtue in the water. Therefore, if it transmutes so much crude, what will it do when ripe? For this operation, the elixir is a reiterated dissolving of the body into water, and has a volatile and fixed part, which Flamel compares to two dragons, one with and the other without wings. The fixed dragon is sulfur, and the volatile dragon is argent vive, borne up in the wind, one half draws downward and exalts sulfur, the other half upward and exalts mercury. Now, by this circular motion, an incombustible and permanent sulfur is exalted. Hence, it's clear to conceive why the vessel must not be open till ripe, nor the fire go out. By a vessel you may understand that of earth, and by the fire of the spirit, which also has its nest, 
to wit, the blood. For in this nest are seven or nine eggs, which if the nest is broken, you never will hatch the chickens. For this mercurial water has the power not only to carry the corruption from the circumference, but also when truly exalted to separate the same from the center. It is indeed no wonder that this celestial spirit or spiritual mercurial vapor should so cleanse those places through which it passes, as to translate from a natural to a supernatural state. Seeing it is the celestial spirit that gives luster and durability to all things. This lunar sulfur does exalt not only the mercury simplex, but also duplicatus, for it is the chaste Diana born upon the island Delos, which will be midwife to her mother Latona to bring forth Apollo, for it is his own arrows by which the water of the deluge is in part dried up, and the serpent python killed. It is indeed the philosopher's fire equal to the sun, that putrefies the compound and disposes soul. Now by soul you must understand the fixed body, which as yet has no union with the spirit, and therefore will part with its fiery dragon, as water will separate from land. The virtue of which sulfur the spiritual mercury will attract and make it quintessential, and prepare the soul for the redemption of its body, which is performed by the twofold Zabeth, SC. The spiritus mundi and lunar sulfur, which is volatile, and spends its strength in conjunction with the sun, and therefore must she every month have her light renewed, and here the philosophers are easy to be understood, when they say, their water is more of kin to the sun than to the moon, because it stands as so near affinity to the body, and would, if the flood were separated, become one with an inseparable unity. By this you may know, according to Artefius, that the operation is truly philosophical, for although the body is calcined and made black and unctuous, see, yet must it retain its magnetic virtues, for whoever shall be so vain as to think to perfect the great elixir, and sees not his earth endued with this property, is certainly in an erroneous way, and must begin again. For as the blood has affinity to the mercurial water, so has that water to the body, for according to Basil, the fixed blood of the red lion has its original and consanguinity from the unfixed blood of the green lion, therefore are they near of kin, and will unite by bare digestion. By the addition of our sulfurous fire, vinegar or saline vitriolic water and mercury sublimate, for thus the sun and moon must be in conjunction to absolve perfect generation, which is done by successive animations, cohobations, and rotations. For this reason, the body is often liquefied in the water. For the tincture comes not out all at once, but by degrees, and still ripens farther and farther. For though the two first menstruums do exalt and generate the body, and in good part purify it, yet have they not power to make a radical dissolution, as doth our third perfect and permanent menstruum, which is a mercurial oil, which dissolves soul as ice in warm waters. For it is the mother of soul, from whence soul was generated, and therefore it dissolves it in the preservation of form, and germinative virtue, which no other thing in the world will do. Now I shall no longer deter thee from the knowledge of this third menstruum or fire, mark well what I say, it is drawn out of the second, as spirit from blood, or according to Trevisan as oil out of water, which is Azoth out of the elixir, and according to Artefius. It's their mercury drawn from the vitriolic caverns and red servant, the philosopher's water of may do, their invisible and divine water, which is not seen till the artist please, which must not be till it become a perfect fruit called virgin's milk, without which there is no profitable secret, either in alchemy or transmutation. In vain, therefore, do the many pretenders in alchemy boast of their dissolving waters or menstruums, as they call them, for they have little proficiency in this science, till gold and silver is made irreducible and so its light and tincture multiplied, so as to communicate it to others, which can never be affected, but by the true knowledge of this fountain from whence light. Life and tincture proceed as being that only Catholic and universal spirit that forms bodies and supplies them with the aforesaid properties when formed, and that you might the better know it, I tell you. It has not only this property in the mineral kingdom, but in the vegetable and animal also, which are not the properties of vulgar mercury. Whatever sophists think in their sophisticating processes and silly amalgamations, but the general mercury that nourishes all things. For although every class and every particular body has its own seed by which its like is produced, yet the all wise Creator has ordained that they all should be nourished by one spirit. It is upon this very account, namely its universality, that I make no doubt it is said Adam brought it out of paradise. For if in the generation of man the vital power hereof should not act its office, 
The seed could never be brought to its perfection, and as in generation, so does it likewise lend its aid for continual nourishment and preservation. For as San Devotis says, no mortal can live without it. This is that which gives greenness to laurel, a new life, I mean, the multiplicative one to every species, permanency to gold, and by its starry fire a luster to precious stones. And when concentrated, exalted and prepared, malleability to glass, concerning which you have a notable account of a famous artist. C2, who, in the reign of Tiberius Caesar, causelessly lost his favor, or rather for doing that which by others was counted impossible, namely the restoring of a portico at Rome, for which, nevertheless, he was banished from the city, etc. This artist, imploring his pardon, presented Tiberius with a glass, which, while he craved his pardon, the said Tiberius threw against the ground, and being bruised and crushed together, but not broken. The artist by a hammer brought it to its former shape, whereupon Caesar asked him whether any besides himself understood this secret. He replied, no, whereupon he commanded his head to be struck off, saying that if the art of malleable glass should be practiced, it would make gold and silver but cheap and inconsiderable things, namely Juan's history of man. The spirit, or rather the soul and fiery virtue of this universal matter, stands in harmony with the great world and consequently is the foundation of that which is called the philosopher's perpetual motion and the permanent sulfur of this will give a transcendent luster to copper and make it, as in scripture is mentioned, as pure as gold. There is a fiery power in it that will fix common mercury and a golden and fiery sulfur which the philosophers say is the water of the color of fire mentioned in the Maccabees which was hidden in a pit and being taken out burned on the altar and the same with that given by the angel for Ezra to drink. From hence I am well satisfied. All the natural magic, so highly esteemed by the Jewish Kabbalah and Christian Sophi, had its rise and foundation, and I will distinguish it thus. The divine part, which was for expounding the law, received by the hand of Moses, as also the prophets, did flow from the unspeakable fountain of God's inexhaustible fullness by the revelation of the divine spirit, and the natural doth flow from nature's Catholic spirit, which being rightly understood expounds all the mysteries, couched in tropes, metaphors, and dark enigmatic speeches, contained in the philosopher's writings, so that it may easily be conceived, why this art remains at this day, so hidden, and by so few obtained, for man's natural wit, learning, arts, and parts, are all too short, it must come by hard labor, guided by an illuminated understanding, for which reason some have said, dia sua bona vendant laboribus. The gods sell all things for labor. For this reason, reader, hath this universal spirit been so highly esteemed in all ages, though in its first formation it's spiritual, that it is almost invisible and untangible, yet it must be nourished in the arms of its nurse, till brought of such strength, as not only to cure sick and imperfect metals, but also to restore man's body to perfect sanity, and is a sure help to the needy, while in the veil of misery. But more of this in Mercury's caduceus rod. Therefore, O reader, slight not the antiquity of this mystery, nor this epistle. For what I have here written is a doctrine, as ancient as philosophy itself. For they all affirm with one mouth the office of the universal spirit in making the grand medicine, and that by a gradual progressive motion, although in this work it's retrogradation, or a reiterated reincrudation of the body, and a congelation of the spirits in which act the earthly feces, and watery aquacity is cast off, and so of a cold and moist nature is made hot and warm, even the permanent fire of bodies. From whence proceeds the crystalline alkahest of the wise men, and all these both active and passive arise from one matter, for the matter is one thing, containing an emblem of all things, mean and contemptible to outward appearance, especially to those who know not its inward virtues. And the ancients did not err, when they said it's found in a dunghill, and that it was cast away as a thing of little value, and therefore did they write of the smallness of its cost. C3. But now the case is altered. Experience makes men wiser. For in some parts of the world the general crude matter becomes a manufactory, although the true and simple matter is obtained with difficulty. This I shall pass by, and come to explain what may be understood by the vessel in which this great medicine is prepared. For to bring it to its perfection, there must be adapt and proper instruments, etc. It's true, I am not unsensible, 
that there is a vulgar notion of those who take the philosopher's words according to the literal sense, that it's a thing of small charge, and may from the beginning to the end be wrought in one vessel. But this is a mysterious knot, and one of the greatest riddles that is contained in their writings, as hath been confirmed to me by useful experience, and therefore am bold to affirm that it is so difficult to be understood if taken in the vulgar sense, as if it should be a vessel of earth or glass. They shall never see the perfection of the magistry. But in commiseration to the true desires of natural verity, I have already sufficiently shown to a son of wisdom what is to be understood by the vessel and fire. I shall yet further add that by the vessel is understood the philosopher's earth, which must be calcined, that its golden seed may be extracted, which being performed you have a ripe seed, which will soon reward the artist. Now this seed can't be extracted, but by an homogeneous menstruum, to wit, our third fire, which fire likewise must not go out of its vessel of blood, until it have strength to withstand the fire and the water, though it may far sooner be taken out of its vessel than the body, yet it must not be opened in less than three eagles, according to Philolithus, or five months' time, Flamel's time of blackness, for if you do, experience shows that you destroy the life and can do no more with that chaos. For by putrefaction only is generation and separation of impurities, and that you may not be ignorant where they are separated. I have showed that all must be weighed in the mercurial balance of Libra, for there is the sword and scale of justice. And its due weight here is of the greatest consequence in the whole work, for as mercury has its helm of sulfur to steer and govern the work, so is sulfur its receiver, so that I may boldly assert in the most strictest sense of philosophy, we have two vessels without the exact knowledge of which, the magistry will never be affected. Nay, Sanavogius says, that nature has but one, but for brevity's sake we use two, which Philolides in his comment on him, calls the one the star of Mars and Venus, and the other Mercury of the philosophers. Nay, I may add a third, namely our fiery furnace, or magnet found in the belly of Aries which by its lunar nature is the cause of the calcination of the body, and consequently of the flowing of radical moisture, but I fear I have already transgressed the silence of Pythagoras. And so have incurred upon me the curses of the philosophers, for so plainly opening the door of Hermes's mystical temple, etc. But as I use not other men's words, nor run in the stream of vulgar errors in protecting what is utterly false, so neither shall I write or deliver anything that is disagreeing to the law of verity in the natural and artificial process, so as to expose known and willful untruths to the world. But for the undeceiving of the true deciver, in bowels of true compassion, I do further boldly assert in the face of all mankind, that as to chemical vessels of glass or earth it requires many, much cost and considerable pains, whatever ignorance may conceive to the contrary. For the crude matter yields but small quantity of pure seed, so that considerable quantities are required for distillation. C4. And consequently, convenient vessels, others for calcination and sublimation, others for evaporating the vitriolic salts, others for making the vinegar and mercury sublimate, others for preparing our sulfur. As fire, the lukewarm ashes, and fiery furnace, which is the beginning of Pontanus's fire, and manifests that celestial spirit, which Pontanus says is taken elsewhere than from the matter. And as I have said, as the governor of our baths, for by it, the oil of the lamp is governed geometrically, for the vegetable Saturn doth embrace the pure part of the Saturnia mineral, and so throws off those black feces that hinder the otherwise resplendent whiteness, and so consequently by means of this sulfur our mercury is hermaphroditical. But as my design is chiefly to touch at the three fires, I shall now speak a few words concerning that fire, which must not go out, viz. The philosophical spirit or fire contained in the blood, which must remain there till well digested and ripe, for after the first distillation there will separate a blood red oil, which is a noble medicine, so that when they speak of the fire that must not go out, they mean not the culinary one, for that necessarily after every operation must go out, but the internal one, even that sharp spirit or fire, which causes putrefaction in the whole compound. Thus, having shown them the vessels and fires, though I have thwarted the opinion of those who assert that one vessel is sufficient, being well satisfied that such understand not the philosopher's writings, but according to the sound of words, for which reason their operations ever have and always shall remain erroneous. 
I shall now come to unfold another mystery concerning the seal of Hermes, which some think to be only the exact closing and sealing of a glass by a charcoal or a lamp fire, when as the philosopher's hermetical seal is, the sealing of the form in the bed of the matter, or the mother in the belly of the infant, which infant, as our Tephius hath it, is but lately brought forth. For as to the nipping and sealing of a glass to me is of little consequence, for great part of the operations is wrought in open vessels, that so the external or mineral fume may the better pass off, especially in the work of nature. Although in the work of art, we do exactly close our vessels, but not in such manner as is understood by sophisters. But as to this point, I have also said enough, and more than ever was said before, and therefore shall. Pass it by, seeing the sons of wisdom will understand it effentifically and practically in that I do not write for information of sophisters, such I mean, as by their metallic mixtures destroy nature, but cannot exalt her, whether they work in crude mercury, amalgamed with the stellified regulus of antimony, and again revived, or with vulgar soul and luna, or any of their corrosive dissolutions, which makes no radical solution, as also their process of vitriol, dew, snow, rainwater, human breath, essie, which I know by woeful experience to be the work of sophistry and all vain and fruitless, as not knowing our gold nor its birth, much less our mercury, by which it is exalted. For as the gold is noble, so doth the mother or mercury far more excel in nobility, excellency, and universality. But this I shall pass by and show thee that salt prepares sulfur, and salt and sulfur prepares mercury and mercury dissolves soul. But seeing this art is clothed with many difficulties, I shall now come to touch in general concerning them. As to the difficulties, there are so many that it would require to fill a volume to describe them all. First, as to the knowledge of the true matter, which is the very foundation of a true beginning. Secondly, the true manner of operating in that matter, for many have known the matter, yet never been able to affect the magistry. Others that have been more constant-minded have waded through a flood of difficulties, as instance, John Pontanus, who erred 200 times before he could obtain the true matter, and the right operation thereon, although he knew the matter in general. As also Flamel labored 21 years in his broileries, and three years or thereabouts, before he knew the first agents like Wise the author. Of the Klein Bar, to wit, Boban's alias Cartelesis, who says, he waded through many difficulties, Odd with great hardship obtained it, as his labors extant plentifully witness. Likewise, that famous Count Bernhard Treves, who is aid to have been debarred three years after the knowledge of requisites. Many more might be reckoned, but I shall pass them by, being their books extant do plentifully witness the fame, and let the vain pretenders and foppish conceited ones know, that the magistry is not so easily perfitted, as they imagine, nor for so small a charge as for, if you must by experience, come through this difficult and darksome wood, to wit, by trials, all which require convenient furnaces, glasses, coals, and hard labor for many years together. It must for certain exhaust considerable sums of money, as doubtless the ANSI and stood before us in their many trials, whatever they are pleased to write concerning the smallness of the charge. I shall instance my own experience now in these 16 years, since I have known something of this matter, during which time I have exhausted many hundreds of pounds more than one shall name, the work being very difficult to be searched out, in that it contains many parts, various men's rooms and fires, which if a man should know one or two, and not the whole, he is still to seek to perfect the design in the end, for he must not be imperfect in one operation, that is required in the magistry, if ever it is perfected. And in this cafe it requires the whole man, and where a family is to be maintained, how soon is a considerable sum of money exhausted. It is well said of the author of Sanguis Naturae, where he speaks concerning philosophers, who persuade themselves that the tincture may be made with very little pains in one vessel, one furnace, with one external fire, and so deceive themselves in many others. But let these high-nosed scoffers know that the philosopher's stone is a thing of higher moment than they imagine, for it is a difficult thing, and of deep search to be understood, and of great labor to be accomplished which they with me would acknowledge, if they apprehended the operations of nature. But to what purpose are many words, etc., the crude preparation of the matter, 
and the matter itself is by the philosophers couched in silence, yet the former is pointed forth under Herculean labor, which to perfect it, they say, life itself must not be spared. And also that tis in vain for Jason to go to Colchos without Hercules, and that by the help of Medea. Now Jason is the operator. Hercules, the strength and power of an active agent. Colchos, the earth of the philosophers, which is to be redeemed. Medea is deep meditation, investigation. Or in plain words, sound theory agreeable to practice, all which to understand is no small piece of art. And therefore, I shall thus candidly communicate my painful experience to thee, who desires to be a son of wisdom, nay, to such also which think, the magistery is so easily prepared to see whether he will find it so, and the more especially since I have communicated that openly and freely, which hath remained secret from the foundation of the world, as having in plain and linear words described the whole process, without any falsity or intermixtures, having ventured to do that, which none of the philosophers ever did dare to do for fear of the curses or otherwise in envy. As well, knowing the great and eternal being doth by his divine hand of providence preserve this secret for such only, as he hath ordained thereunto, and such only are led by the divine arm unto the altar of Hermes' temple. So that the most plainest writings and amplest truths will seem to such as are not chosen for it. The most difficult and abstruse or mysterious, as I am well satisfied from the conversation I have had with men of several degrees in my pilgrimage in this world where discourses have arisen concerning this art. As I hinted before, that I discovered that which never was discovered, which, Artefia says, is not lawful for anyone to name, much less to write, which Sandivodius doth hint at, where he says, he hath written all things plain, excepting the showing the way of extracting the sal armoniac, or mercury of the philosophers, out of their seawater, and the use of it, which he directs to God or a master, this being the very dalilat of the art. But I have shown the vessel of air, how the material spirit is fortified and prepared to join with the body. I have also shown the medium between the body and the soul, to wit, the lunar fire, and that it is a body spiritual, for that the mercury must be actuated with a sulfur of his own kind, that spirit being the fire that brings on the work to its first predestination, it being the universal and celestial spirit, which one author calls a spoon, where he says, the male and the female must be tinted, he says. They must have but one spoon to eat together, so that the male and female may the better agree. But Flamel calls it a peacemaker, or Apollo, the yellow sun, that is to say, by our fire equal to that of the sun. And the author of Sal, Lumen and Spiritus Mundi, also showeth that this spirit is the cause of perfection, as being the active glue of both natures, to wit, body and soul, and that metals are perfected by a threefold mercury, or sum total. The reason he shows, because nature produces not itself, but in every operation there must be some agent and some matter subject to the action. And with all he points forth, that that agent was Pontanus's fire, which all philosophers have concealed and kept under lock and key as the sole stream of their notion, without which nothing can be perfected. Thus having shown the extracting of sal armoniac, I shall now come to speak of its use, which is not only for exalting the body, but also to dissolve the same, and that by the way of generation. It is true, there is a twofold dissolution, violent and natural, which Sandivogius intimates, and likewise Ath Bezel Valentine, where he says, there is a short way to bring it into its prima materia, which is done thus. Take the known mineral spirit, in which our mercury, sulfur, and salt is shut up, containing that philosophical, mystical gold, and pour it upon white calcined tartar, as thou mayst read, P. 168 of his elucidation of the 12 keys, therefore shall omit it, only for the information. That tartar there mentioned is not common tartar made from the lees of wine, but a fixed and genuine tartar made from our saturnal matter, which is properly the tartar of vitriol. And Paracelsus intimates this forcible dissolution also, where he bids you dissolve the body by vitriol, nitre, and sal armoniac, which process I have in measure followed, and have seen a white and combustible oil. But being forcible, it carries not that excellency with it, as the natural dissolution doth, or, as Fuller says, says, that where the metals are reduced by the help of salts, is not an universal dissolution. And therefore, Bessel says, that if corrosives are used in the beginning, they must be again washed off, for sharp things hurt, 
and indeed they destroy the fixedness of the body. Although by a skillful hand of the artist, they may exalt the permanency of the spirit. But it is a hazardous way, and is called the breaking of the egg, and has an adherence to the preparation of the alkahest. Therefore, as Philad says, says, it is a hundred times more difficult than the elixir. Being done by force and violent fires, it is in danger of being lost. Ludovicus de Comitibus intimates the same, where he shows the difference between the preparation of the liquor alkahest and mercury of the philosophers, showing that the one is made by a fermentation of the body, and bringing it into a spirit by which its seminal virtue is destroyed. The other natural dissolution is the sowing of gold into its own matrix. What might flow to say? That the body or sulfur is detrimented by the use of salts. But I designing, as soon as convenient, to write a particular treatise of the liquor alkahest, shall omit any further discourse of it, and come to speak of the natural dissolution, which is done through a slow calcination of the body, therefore shall divide the whole into these three heads, or a threefold rotation. Now this work is performed by a threefold rotation, or turning the wheels. The first is the preparation of the mercury, which has seven animations or cohobations of the spiritual zabeth on the body which bedews it with life and celestial virtue, as also with purity and virtue, through a radical calcination, by which not only the body is exalted, but also the spirit and soul. For indeed, the whole work is but a cohobation of an active principle upon a mere passive one, until the passive is brought to an activity. These are the eagles the sophi write of, which must be seven or nine to devour the lion. For laton, or the salt of metals being formed and calcined, must be dissolved and whitened by azoth, which laton is found in the bottom, and azoth in the upper part. Therefore, as Sanduoja says, you must find out such a moisture that dissolves gold as natural, as ice and water, and he intimates that is agreeable with the body, saying, it is that out of which gold itself is generated. Thou being come thus far, the Herculean labor is performed. Therefore I shall assert as a fundamental aphorism that whosoever shall not find this mercurial fire when prepared in quantity, a force sufficient to perfect the whole work with as little labor and as little charge is to seek and must begin again. For the great charges in the artificial work, the natural is but small charge, the agent being sufficient to bring about its perfection, and this will be a good distinction to understand the philosopher's books. The artificial is to repair our fires and menstruum, and the natural is to know the use of our third, perfect and permanent menstruum in dissolving the body. The body being dissolved, and the corporeal feces totally separated, and two oils, a snow white and a blood red one, being distilled, begins our second rotation, which is by extracting a fixed salt out of the caput mortuum, which must be imbibed with the aforesaid white oil for the white elixir. Therefore, for a concluding aphorism, I further affirm that if this permanent body or salt does not attract the soul as the lodestone does iron and unite with it, Thou art yet to seek in the philosopher's principles, and must begin again, in that thou shalt never see the perfection of the white stone. Now here begins the third rotation, which is, before the white is cold, thou must divide it into two parts. The one part is for the white, and the other to carry on to the red, which is, by imbibing of it with the virgin's milk of the sun, which is yellow and golden, to the third motion, which is a red fusible elixir, flowing like wax, etc. Thus, reader, I have theoretically yet candidly given thee what was never written before, and that in true bowels of compassion, being in the middle of my age, free from envy, I hope as fully free. As our Tephius was in his wonderful old age, that I can sincerely say I should be well pleased, if all the worthy and honest-hearted did enjoy this mystery, and should be heartily glad to see an end to the cutthroat avarice, that so the poor may be relieved in such a way that God through all and above all may be glorified, etc. According to the saying of a wise man, Iud veritas exaltetur, et te deus glorificetur. Thus in cordial love I subscribe myself a true friend to all that desire to exalt natural truth, but more especially to those that above all desire the welfare of Zion. Plodophorus Mystagogus, a general epistle to the reader, more especially to those who are the true, inquires after hermetic philosophy. This caducian rod of Mercury, reader, is a subject also great usefulness to this generation of searchers after that infallible truth of nature's mysterious operations, that it needs no apology, 
or any of those flattering titles, or with worthy books have ushered into the world, my language being indeed obvious to all those capacities, which God hath qualified in the simplicity of nature to understand the same, though truth's language may seem contemptible to many of those worldly wise ones who swell and are puffed up, ready to burst with the empty notions of their vain philosophy regarding not anything but what is hammered upon their own anvil in the false flourishes of Athenian brasses, which we willfully omit. For to speak rhetorically is no part on my design, because true learning in the spagyric art consists not in that, but the demonstrative knowledge of that matter, which all the ancient philosophers have borne testimony to, with one WW animus voice, from the true speaking Hermie even to this present age. Therefore, O reader, what I shall entertain thee with in this ensuing discourse will be a product from the knowledge of that um, verbal subject matter from whence alone Mercury hath its birth, life, and sea, and bis off of ascending and descending is known. This philosophical work is an abiftrat of TT creation, an epitome of all forms, an end to his general looking glass, wherein more I flurries of contained than mean capacities be able to describe, but to add some parks to tia, light, or knowledge. I shall ground my ed course from the secondary chaos, analogize with the first, according to the custom of philosophers. In the beginning, when the darksome ABB imprisoned the yet undistinguished water, the divine all-working spirit moved and brow ed on the face of them, and from the inviably gulf brought forth this glorious fabric. The first thing that appeared after this innovation was light, the immediate product, the spirit of light and word fiat. Now this light, being the principal instrument of it creating spirit out of band manifested, boundless activity in separating the fever natives that lay bid in the chaos, which was the dividing of the waters from the waters. B. But the divine artificer stopped not here, but tears the surface of the earth of waters, and by his word of power swathes their vestiges and leaves up bands, that they might not move to deluge the earth, and so made way for the vegetative power, which he had planted in her, to display itself in a most lovely and ravishing variety. He embellished also the azure roof of the spacious theater of his glory with numberless inextinguishable lights, a little beneath which he ranged those seven lamps, which continually influence and beam down upon the earth the blessing of heaven, as being supplied from the overflowing fountain of his inexhaustible fullness, amongst which the sun and moon were called the two great lights, by way of feminence, as being not only the distinguishers of times and seasons, but also the great dispensers of the divine bounty and justice here below. When God had thus created the world, and all the hosts and furniture thereof, he imparted to them all the blessing of increase, commanding them to multiply in their kind, by means of a seed, to that end, enclosed in them. And at the close of all he made man, the abstract and abridgment of all his works of wonder, upon whom he stamped the glorious image or character of his own essentiality. To the end he might be every way worthy, fit, and capacitated to rule over and dispose of the outward. A three. Now one main lineament of this beautiful image being that wisdom, wherewith he was endowed, and whereby he was enabled to pierce through the external shell of things, to the internal working spirit. It was to be his continual employment to search into the abstruse essence of things, and by a skillful application and joining of symbolizing natures, to affect all. That might conduce to delight or necessity and become an opener and manifester of the wonders of God in nature. Tis true, the image of God in man consisteth in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, and a firm knowledge of that truth, which was defaced, yea, in a measure lost by the fall, but restored again to all believers by and through Jesus Christ, the archetypal image and Son of God, in and according to whom the lesser as well as the greater world was framed who to this day by his spirit doth not fail faithfully to follow the way in which this wisdom, the best and choicest of all treasures, and most desirable, may be obtained, by exciting from and earnest impulsations of life in the heart of the elect after this jewel of price, putting them upon seeking, asking, knocking incessantly, until they find, receive, and upon their perseverance to the end, it be opened unto them. For great is the magical attraction power of desire, but certainly nothing can be compared to the force of those longings, which the divine spirit blows up in us, as being influenced by omnipotence itself, to which nothing is impossible. This is that which the wife men of old took for their way, to obtain the knowledge of the secrets of nature, 
Solomon, the wisest of men, asked wisdom of God, and obtained it to that degree, as tis declared, none ever before him, none ever after him shall arise like unto him. Job, that great searcher to natural secrets, as appears by several passages of B.S. book, after B. had discouraged of the mysteries of God and nature, and particularly of those in the mineral kingdom, and inquiring after that wisdom, which is the sole revealer of them, gives us the short but pithy information to obtain the fame from the mouth of God himself. In these words, the fear of the Lord is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. This is the way of have endeavored to follow, in order to obtain this wisdom and true knowledge of nature, who being God's handmaid, will not conceal herself from those who are ordained of God to behold her beauty unveiled, if they seek by the means ordained, viz, am, illuminated understanding and diligent indefatigable labors, and see. And for my part, I have great reason to magnify that holy arm that hath in some measure conducted me to the Mount Helicon of art and brought me to fee at a distance. A four. The reward of art, therefore hope my soul will never forget to bless and praise that holy name who hath taken situation upon me, the smallest and lowest of all bis creatures, as I in humility have fought unto him, for I have found my hungry soul to be filled with divine and natural wisdom even those good things, off his kingdom, of which the rich, proud, full and haughty know not, and we have sufficient testimony on divine and natural records, that this God, the Father of all our mercies, bath bad a spectral regard to a remnant in all ages, giving them a prospect, and also a taste of that blessed portion of Joseph, being a true compendium of the choicest virtues of heaven, of the dew and of the deep, that lath beneath, of the choicest emanations of the suns, and the choicest products of the moons of the top of the mountains of the east, and of these choice fruit of the owl hills, and of the choicest parts of the earth, and the fullness thereof. O Lord G, stream out, if it flance good with thy divine majesty, these thy blessings upon the head of all those who seek thy name in the painful work of watchfulness. Holy silence and regeneration, and for the fake of truth and wisdom are free to be separated from the pleasures of this wicked world, and the brethren, defiring nothing more than that they may be worthy a uh, true resignation to thy disposal to follow thee and the lamb and all the tribulations we have to pass through in our pilgrimage to thy immortal city therefore if it be thy good pleasure zero feet lord god make us instruments in the hand to reveal thy wonders and to show the true mysteries of nature to such as are worthy and raise up yet more powerful ones commissioned and gifted from above to declare against the man of sin and to be exemplary in this holy way of righteousness to the end, that the tabernacle of David, which is fallen may, be raised again, and the new Jerusalem come down from heaven, like a bride adorned for her husband, and that thy temple may be built in greater glory than ever by those living stones, O Almighty God, that thou hast thereunto ordained to the glory and eternal boss of thy pure, holy, immortal name, men, I reader, I must draw to a conclusion of this preface, only let me caution thee, for fear left I should be misunderstood, in speaking or writ, ing too reverently of the mysteries of nature, which are but types of the glorious anatype and fullness, that I put as much distinction between them, as school learning can make between God and his created works. But as nature is God's handmaid, and centers in this divine will, she ought gravely and solidly to be treated of, so I shall no longer detain thee from from the porch called beautiful, nor from Hermes's mystical temple, where wisdom's oracles are, therefore shall conclude, subscribing myself a friend in all Christian love, to the travelers in the ways of truth, whether divine or natural. Cloidophorus Mystagogus, Mercury's caduceus rod, or the great and wonderful office of the universal Mercury, or God's vicerant displayed, etc. Chapter I containing a theophysical investigation of the philosophical chaos, from whence Mercury hath its birth. I am bound to confess, and that in much sincerity, that Sandy Vogius and Philetes are authors of so great worth and learning, that I cannot pretend to come up with them in the least degree, either in my style or matter treated of, only as they themselves confess and experience shows, that many practical truths are by them couched in silence, whether it might be in divine reverence for fear lest the art should be too much exposed, it's not my matter in hand to determine, but the matter of fact is essentially true, for Sandy Voges himself owns. 
that he had not leave to write concerning the way of extracting the sal ammoniac or mercury of philosophers out of their seawater and its use, but directs you either to God or a master for the obtaining of it, and Philodetha's faith, that they confound one operation with another, even the natural with the artificial, to keep the temple in ignorance concerning their true vinegar or crude white sulfur, which being unknown, all their labor is loft. Artefius Alpha confesses the same thing, where he saith, He hath showed you all things plainly, excepting one thing, which is not lawful for him to speak. Of, much less to write, and Dominus Denizement, Lord of Nizement, where he speaks of the philosopher's fire. He saith, That all philosophers have concealed it, and kept it under lock and key, as the sole stern of all their actions. But what need I to enlarge, seeing the lip of truth faith? that out of the mouth of two witnesses everything shall be confirmed, these authors being masters of undeniable credit. Therefore none need to doubt their affirmation. And farther, if any will make a nice scrutiny into this matter, they shall, and that the fubjet mat tur is not so much as once named by any of thems, which is the very hinge or foundation by which the door of entrance moves, for which reason, Asa late author faith, we ought to implore a blessing from Almighty God, to open our understandings and unlock un to us the recesses of this darksome abyss, where all the creatures of health and riches are locked up. For he accuses all the masters of alchemy at once of envy, who have ever written of this celebrated stone, saying, They have declared the matter and subject, which is the chief of this art, so obscurely, that Apollo himself would be tired in unriddling the enigmas they have exe cogitated concerning it, and this doubtful declaration of the matter is the reason why many who seek the science without the light of nature, are precipitated of very great errors, because they know not the true subject of this art, but busy themselves about other things altogether unfit for the work. These are motives sufficient, not only for this writing, but also to excuse all objections, which may be offered against it, feeling I design, God willing, measurably to supply these defects, by letting the artist know that our subject matter is no specific a determined thing, but an universal subject, even a chaos, which I have shown in my general epistles begotten by the union of elements, and is an emblem of the first chaos, whence the world was created, and therefore that thrice worthy and learned Willis, in his search of coughs, hath allegorically yet cabalistically treated of this chaos, the like half the author of Inchiri, Dion Fafai's Reftitute, and many others too tedious to recite. Blag now seeing Mercury hath its birth and manifestation from this chaos. J think it convenient to give some short descriptions of its qualities and properties, so the artist may better know it. First, tis an emblem of the ancient chaos, and consequently universal, as is plainly manifest by that lightsome spirit, incubating on the face of the waters to animate beings with heat. Life and motion. Secondly, there are two waters, superior and inferior, with their divisor. Thirdly, in the bowels of its earth is contained the form of all mineral salts and sulfurs, as I have plainly shewed in my general epistle, as may be plainly me by the band of an artist. Yet none of these specificated. Fourthly, the matter is fluid and open, and in itself neither perfect nor imperfect, therefore in a way to perfection. Fifthly, it is neither animal, vegetable, nor mineral, yet of a mineral birth wherein the salt and light of the most perfect metals are plenteously found. Sixthly, and principally, there is none of its elements permanent in the fire, but its earth. Seventhly, and lastly, tis a matter as ancient as the world, itself, therefore, as Hermes saith, tis that one thing, whence all things proceed, containing both the celestial and terrestrial virtues. Therefore, operation on it shows what the world was, what it is, what it shall be, from this one chaos proceeds all that is necessary for this philosophical work, without the addition of anything except what is of itself, only by a diminution of what is superfluous, and that by a, a natural process. As St. Avogius says, the ancients regarded nothing but nature and her possibilities, for nature was originally created pure and good. And although she travels under the burden of the curse for man's transgression, the same primitive spirit remains in her, and if rightly disposed, will labor with all her might to attain a more perfect end. Therefore, the artist above all things ought to be simple-hearted and not in the least regard the subtle and newly invented operations in chemistry, but that alone which nature is able to effect, for God, 
having created her and placed his divine spirit in her, she is, as Sandy Voges says, that alone by which God works all things. Therefore, if rightly disposed, she brings forth no abortives, what she is, and how she operates in the four elements, and in what vessels, is learnedly and candidly shown by Sandivogius in the latter part of his first treatise, but having promised to show Mercury's birth, I shall now come to perform that task, for the four elements cooperate together to produce a secondary chaos, producing the three principles, and of them two natures, male and female. The male is the earth, or sperm, or sulfur, by which nature works all her intentions, not compulsively, but voluntarily, for the central sun, receiving the spiritualities of the elements, does like a true servant mix the astral virtues, and send them forth to the circumference, where the female sperm, being actuated, animated, and strengthened. And through a fermentative union, casting off impurities, Mercury is born with his caducian rod. Since he has his birth from celestial and terrestrial virtues, his office is to ascend to the superior orbs to fetch celestial virtues, and again return to the center of the earth to communicate the same to his defiled brethren. By this act of ascension and descent, he not only nourishes himself, but also Saul and the other planets. As Philetha says in Fons Chimicae Philosophiae, it's our sea, our hidden fountain, out of which our gold is naturally created, when yet it presents itself to gold and conquers it. And in the hour of its nativity, gold is joined with it, and masked in it, and both increase together into a strong hero, which neither Caesar nor the popes can buy with money. Therefore, with all thy strength, get this water. For this is that mercury out of which the body of metals is procreated, and as Sandivogius says, even the mercury philosophers, therefore, they are not to be regarded as those who say that vulgar mercury or any of the imperfect metals are the foundation of our stone. These are all specified by nature and brought to a metallic hardness, whereas ours is open and fluid. Yet this mercury, although thus universal and the very matter from which all the ancient philosophers, none accepted, obtain the secret, must be mortified and die, and by due mediums be brought to renovation and a more immortal state. For by this way, only is he capacitated to redeem his defiled brethren and to exalt the imperfect bodies to the highest degree of perfection. This will be more largely treated in the following chapters as occasion will necessarily require. Therefore, hating fruitless repetitions and aiming only to supply what many of the philosophers have, I presume, willfully omitted, I shall write that in these sheets, which I dare be bold to assert, was never written by any of the philosophers, and I have delivered that in this chapter concerning the true chaos or matter of the celestial stone has hitherto remained as a secret to the generality of mankind even from the foundation of the world, so that none for the future need to scruple or doubt what the right beginning of our work is, nor of obtaining it, if they will take the wholesome advice of Bacon, which I shall repeat, and so conclude this chapter, which is to congeal the thing that nature began her first operations about, by a proportional mixture and union of pure living mercury, with the like quantity of sulfur in one mass. Whereupon Dominus the Nisman speaks holy words, wherein this good Englishman, or rather angel, clearly depicted that one in true matter, whereof the philosophers have written volumes under diverse figures and enigmatical fables, not because they would maliciously hide it, but keep the privilege of this knowledge for learned and pious men, who by deep study and laborious experience find and adorn it. Chapter 2nd, in which is shown some practical conclusions concerning the separation of the chaos. In the former chapter, I have shown you what the chaos is and how it came to be corrupted by the fall of man, the earth being cursed for his sake. Not only the earth, but as the Apostle Paul says, the whole creation groans under the burden of corruption. For this reason, the artist must assist nature, that she may be able to cast them off, if ever he intends to arrive at the haven of rest. I shall, therefore, in this chapter, come to show some spagyric separations, so that the artist may better understand his alchemy, which in the Arabian tongue signifies fires. The author of Enchiridion Physis Restitute, Handbook of Restored Physics, speaking of the birth of this universal seed, says, It is born from the loins of Jupiter by the help of the divine light, by the midwifery of Vulcan. So are our elements and principles born from this chaos by separation by fire, for except separation goes before generation, there can be no perfect birth brought forth. The first separation is of distinct elements 
the second of principles, and the third of the two natures, male and female. In the elements are many immersed corruptions, which must be separated for the producing of the principles, in which are great varieties of salts and sulfurs, which are not in the least adherent to our work, which Philalides candidly hints at, where he says, among all the great variety of salts and sulfurs, there are but two for our work, which two must be rightly known and adapted, if ever you hope to see Diana unveiled. Also, he cautions you to beware of corrosives, which are repugnant principles contained in the same chaos, and are some of those. B. Vile garments which glorious nature casts off, when she shows herself in her amours to her lovers, and that you may not be ignorant of what these separations be. I will give you a short catalog of them. The first is common mercury and sulfur. The second is urine. The third is sal ammoniac volatile and fixed. The fourth is nitre and vitriol. The fifth is a corrosive and destructive vinegar. The sixth is a homogeneous vinegar and mercury sublimate. The seventh is a spirit of wine. An eighth is a sulfur slaton. The ninth is blood. And the tenth is a hermaphrodical mercury. The eleventh is a universal. By which the whole chaos is actuated with life. The twelfth is a golden sulfur. From whence tincture and permanency proceeds. And the thirteenth is a sweet, central, and permanent salt. Which is the groundwork and foundation of the whole. I could enlarge to a greater variety, but shall omit them, seeing every artist in the separation of the chaos will be able to demonstrate the same. Although it's true the ancients have not so distinctly named them, nor it may be so well considered, whether they have or not, I dare not judge, seeing it is couched in silence, and they have said, it's a symbol of everything, and therefore have called it by all names. But its proper name is universal mercury, for it contains in its womb the first seed of all the seven metals, as well the imperfect as the more perfect, and therefore I regard not the opinion of even many of the philosophers themselves, who write about the number of elements, whether it be ternary or quaternary, seeing I am satisfied there are four qualities, hot, cold, dry, and moist, and that in a twofold composition. For the first heat is of the red sulfur to which may be added the white sulfur and the homogeneous vitriolic salt. The first moisture is in the inferior waters, which must be married to its natural spouse, the earth, by which it shall be enriched with fruitfulness, the second in the superior mercurial air. For after you have sublimed the mercurial earth from its feces and have formed the body and separated his blood, you must know that the sulfur is clothed with combustibilities and the mercury with a phlegmatic nature. Therefore, you must cast into her womb the seed of that universal sulfur or fire, which is the parent of all form and generation, by which her volatility and inconstancy will in great measure be taken off. But how this is to be performed will be the task of another chapter, so we shall pass it by here, and come to speak a little concerning the two corporal elements of earth and water. For when we speak of the earth, we mean not its gross and corporal part, but the central salt it contains, or as the philosophers say, in the center of the earth is a virgin earth, which is the true element and nature's work. And as to the water, it is filled with the dreadful effects of the curse, even a dismal poisonous coagulating, arsenical salt, which hinders vegetation and therefore must be separated. For the earth delights only in the pure. This mystery is candidly hinted by Sandivogius, for he says, the water is never to be had pure. Art purifies that by a twofold heat and then conjoins it. Nay, yet after this union, although by a true medium of sulfur, it contains abundance of superfluous and corporeal corruptions, which are enemies to generation, and therefore must be separated in preparing the vinegar, or crude white sulfur. For as Bezel Valentine, speaking of the great office and effect of the earth, says the earth does it not of itself, but the living spirit it contains. The true knowledge of this mystery brings you to a right foundation in art, and opens many others. For here in nature, only begins her art of formation and vivification, without which there can be no multiplication nor perfection. And that you may not be ignorant of the true and adequate knowledge of the separation, I tell you, that what art does not perform, nature will, being rightly disposed, and that by a living, active, innate, quintessential spirit, that forms the very. B2. Elements and preserves them, taking upon itself the shape of elements, yet it itself is no element but a living soul lying hid in them, and when by art extracted out, it turns to one again. Now if this living fire is absent, the elements would be dead, 
but seeing every active cause must have some passive one. We cannot, in the first part of our work, separate the one from the other, for according to Hermes, the earth is its nurse. Concerning this universal and living fire, much might be written, but seeing its office is so general that the philosophers say, the heavens and all things are filled with it, nay, whatever is lucid and glittering, as the sun, moon, and stars does secretly derive its original from it, and are to this day supplied by it, as you may read at large in Sanguis Naturae, where he also describes the living central fire, called the central sun and corporal water, or fire of bodies. To know this, he says, is the most secret mystery in all our philosophy. This fixed fire, as it has its original from the living fire, so it has a great sympathy with it, for it wants it as an aliment, which it continually attracts out of the water and air, and converts it to its own substance. And in this, as in a center, all the virtue lies concentrated, which being scattered flies into the circumference, as may be observed in man, in whom this fire fixed in the center of the heart has its seat as the yolk in the egg. But its operation is invisible and very secret, and yet very powerful, which also few know, for it operates by its heat in all things which lie in the earth, and excites the flux and reflux of the sea, as the pulse in man is excited by the fire which lies hid in the center of his heart. Hence also all the watery and airy vapors by the help of this fire are elevated from the earth and sea into the air, which compose the clouds, and by rarefaction of the wind, being impregnated by the vital spirit, fall down again to the earth in form of water. B3. Chapter 3rd, containing some theophysical investigations concerning the formation of the first philosophical body. Permit me to direct you a little, reader, by a digression from the matter, to show you the reasons for my writing so plainly. In search, I faithfully promise that if it ever please God to illuminate me to some extent to understand what the ancients have so mysteriously written, I would, for my own satisfaction as well as the benefit of others, draw it up in a more intelligible method. Now considering the substance of this promise, I could have no peace in my mind until I had stretched forth my hand in this treatise to those desirous of art, showing them what is most needful for them to search after. These labors also contribute not a little to the ease and satisfaction of my mind, seeing my operations have brought me into much infirmity and craziness of body, and life is uncertain at best, so that I hope my poor children may receive benefit from them as a legacy by way of requital for what I have exhausted of theirs. And likewise, in general, for the benefit of all those whom God may hereafter ordain to be possessors hereof, my pen has delivered the truth with as much candidness as it was lawful for me with a clear conscience to do, and one thing I may boast of, which is that I have shown the particular and lineal operations as they proceed, which was never done before. For my part, I have not chosen the common, envious, and ambiguous way of writing. I say it not out of any disesteem to the ancients. I esteem the writings of the philosophers with the highest veneration imaginable, next to holy writ, not out of an exercise, but out of sympathy and fellow feeling with the painful and laborious. I have often said to myself that I would never be able to subsist through these indefatigable labors and to pass through such darksome wood. Indeed, I admire when I look back how I have been upheld but I wholly attribute it to that divine arm who has hitherto sustained me in a sea of difficulties. It has been one of my greatest griefs that, for many years, I had perfect knowledge of the matter in general, yet have been to seek in joining symbolizing natures together. All this through the obscurity of the philosopher's words and their confounding their operations together. But what shall I say? I must conclude with Solomon. There is an appointed season for all things under the sun. For I now plainly discern that this great mystery here spoken of may measurably be gathered out of books when we come practically and feelingly to understand them. For this reason, I cannot choose but love and admire the philosophers. Admire them, when I consider with what admirable cunning and artifice they have wrapped up this secret from the unworthy. Love them, when I see how plainly they have delineated the same to the masters of art, who alone can receive the true and advantageous benefit of their writings. And upon this consideration, I do not now admire why there are so many books on this subject in the world, for should this method be taken, there would be as much need of writing to the end of time, as if nothing had ever been written before. I mean for the edification of a tyro, therefore, they have, well said, labor, pray, and read, for one book opens another, 
and true adepts confess that thus they have learned distinct operations from various authors. Read Philalethes in Philadelphia on this point. I may compare these renowned men to skillful masters in science, who can with great cunning defend themselves from each other's strokes, yet at the same time let each other understand their great skill and ability in weapons, so that one indifferently versed in the art dares not attack them. In the same way, the philosophers have done by their various expressions and cunning artifice, having written so as to be plainly understood by each other, yet at the same time veiled it from the vulgar pretenders. But to return to the matter in hand, all the wise men began their foundation from the roots or groundwork, viz. from a body. But seeing this body is the philosopher's earth, it cannot be accounted a light and frivolous thing to understand it, for it is not a simple earth, but an earth that has the first unity of the four elements in it. And by a dissolution the first corporal earth, and a coagulation through the purified salts and sulfurs of nature. For here, according to Artepius, the artist must put the hard and dry bodies into the water once for all, and then this earth being from thence formed, is the house and habitation of the philosopher's sperm. For the sperm is one thing, the seed another. The earth is the receptacle of the sperm, the water of the seed. Flamel, above all others, in his hieroglyphics, has given not only its composition, but also the degrees of heat required for its production, which we discussed earlier, showing it to be a natural work. Therefore, I shall not speak here of extraordinary generation, called in the schools equivocal, which is a birth produced only by putrefaction, without an original specificating seed, but of that properly called univocal, or by the seed of metals. Metals only are generated, or else that art, concerning which so many famous philosophers have written, would be impossible. But to assert this is not only contradictory to truth itself, but also giving the direct lie to their so voluminous works. Seeing on the one hand, the art hath not only its verity and possibility in nature, but also on the other hand, to be obtained by diligent search and labor. And Sandivogius has already addressed all objections concerning the production of this mineral sperm, where he says, the four elements beget it, through the will and pleasure of God, and the imagination of nature. Therefore, I would have none put a false construction upon these writings, imagining that I have a secret reserve concerning vulgar metals, for I deny them all, even lead, tin, iron, copper, common mercury, antimony, marcasites, niger, salt, vitriol, oils of vegetables, animals, or any other thing that has received determination in nature, even snow, dew, and rainwater most of which I have tried to my own loss and damage. Not finding the signs, I was forced to begin again, gold and silver only accepted, which serve us for fermentation in order to projection. What would you have clearer delivered to you than the truth without any equivocation or mental reservation, concerning which verity I have a cloud of witnesses on my side, even the conjunct testimony of all the true philosophers? Therefore, Away with all your false notions in philosophy, as also with all false books, from whence many such notions do arise, written by some upstart smoke sellers, false pretenders, inexperienced in nature's mysterious ways, away also with all false commentators on the philosopher's writings, especially such who make it their livelihood to rob the dead and destroy the living, not valuing for self ambition's sake how much money is exhausted in families, ruined by following such their frothy notions. These are indeed so far from unfolding or conceiving the mysterious ways of nature that they write things repugnant to her very laws. These, instead of adorning, destroy that living image so truly delineated by the ancient philosophers and dishonor their writings, causing them to be vain wretches. May I not properly apply to you the words of Sandivogius, where nature speaks to the alchemist in his treatise of Mercury. For your falseness you deserve the halter, equally as well as those who rob on the highway. For of the two, you are the greatest thieves, for I count it no less than sacrilege to rob the dead of the honors due to them, and without repentance expect an equal reward. I must confess that when I have read some of those commentators' works, I could not choose but blush for shame to see such confused processes as if they would by their heterogeneous mixtures create a seed, contrary to the express law of God and nature, in the genuine sense of true philosophers which is but to maturate and ripen that which God has already in nature created, which I count little less than willful blindness or perverse ignorance, which deserves to be stigmatized rather than pitied. For in this work, 
from one found proceed three distinct parts, not only the body mentioned, but also soul and spirit, which is the threefold mercury and sum total, which by degrees is hardened into a metallic form, and afterward by long decoction into pure metals. But seeing that each of these parts require a distinct chapter, I shall now proceed to speak concerning the philosophical blood, which is a medium of life between body and spirit, for these are the three springs that testify to the artist the truth of his proceeding. For what is called body, soul, and spirit is also called water, blood, and spirit. For all agree that the body is formed out of the water, by a body spiritual and a spirit corporal, mixing per minima in a sulfurous earth, as the artist will by the practice of this chapter, therefore shall conclude. Chapter 4. A Theophysical Investigation Concerning the Blood or Mineral Spirit, which is in the philosophical principles of Sol, Luna, and Mercury. The blood is of so great consequence to be understood, and its preparation, that without a perfect knowledge thereof, there can be no progress made in the philosophical work. And as in the formation of the body, the acetum is the first menstruum, so here elixir is the second, and azoth is the third and perfect one, which are the three fires, by which the work is carried on to its predestinated end, and are called the keys of the secret science, two of which, says Ripley, are superficial. And the third is essential to sun and moon. Now Falada says that the superficial are the water and the blood, for that the passive principles of the philosophical mercury, by this active essence, which is a fire and saw volatile, are digested and ripened into loon and soul at the philosopher's pleasure. Therefore, experience shows that Philolithus has testified the truth, where he says, There are in our mercury three mercurial substances, which may well be called menstruums, the one the more gross part, which though it be a water, yet it being the most palpable part, and visible, may be termed the body of the water. The last is a fiery form, which is the blood of Cadmus. This is a real invisible form, which is essentially and formally sol volatile. The second is the mean soul, which philosophers without equivocation call Saturn's child. The middle substance of these three is made into one wonderful mercury, which has not its like in the world. And in another place he says that their dissolving water flows from three springs. One is a common well, at which all draw, and of which water many uses that well hath in it a Saturnine drossiness which makes the waters unuseful. These frigid superfluities are purged by two other springs, through which the water of this well is artificially caused to run. These springs make but one well, whose waters appear dry, the humidity being sealed. The well itself is surrounded with an arsenical belt. The slimy bottom abounds with the first ends of mineral salt and sulfur, which is the body and blood, which actuate the water of the first well, whose primary quality is coldness, being thus actuated. It becomes so powerful a menstruum, and so pleasant to the metals, that for its peculiar virtue it is chosen to be the bath of the sun and moon. Of these three springs the blood must now be considered, for that is the middle nature between the body and the spirit, for according to scriptures, the blood is the life, that is to say, the life is in it, as in its proper vehicle, and there tis nourished and maintained. Now the philosophers have distinguished two bloods, i.e., the fixed blood of the red lion, and the unfixed blood of the green lion, which they often join for, as Basil Valentine says. They have their original from one consanguinity. Amongst all these three springs, there is nothing unclean, but that they call the green lion, or the instrument that naturally inclines the body to putrefy. And as Philalathus says, is the very grave of its it is called by some philosophers, aquafatida, and by some mortis. Immundities, which uncleanness is impossible to be separated by fire, by the hand of any artist whatever, but nature must here contribute her aid, by its being removed from its matrix of earth, and sown in its matrix of air, by which action and reaction they purify each other, so produce a bud, blossom, and flower, different from either root. Therefore he afterwards adds, that it is not in its own nature unclean, but made pure, as the art of the artificer can make it. He also shews how it is thus purified, viz., by the help of nature, Art joining consanguinity with consanguinity. The knowledge of this is the hidden key of the whole art. For faithful Alathes, learn to know this green lion, and its preparation, which is all in all in the arts, is the only knot. Untie it. And you are as good as a mafter, for whatever then remains is but to know the outward regimen of fire, 
for to help on nature's internal work as therefore I desire my reader, very cautiously to observe this point, not only in the right formation of the body, and to beware of all corrosives, but also in the right separation of the blood, and to beware of all violence. For we fee the husbandman sows his grain or seed, but tis the sprout only that produces the herb, which at first is scarce discernible, and therefore if taken out from its grain or root, it will die in a moment. For which reason the aforesaid author saith, The whole is found, yet the fermentative spirit tea is fierce a third part of the whole, the reft is of no value, and that the dregs of the body come off with the dregs of the prepared mercury, and that the spiritual part or virtue of the body doth purge and purify the matrix of the water in which cis found, in a generative way bermean male and female of the fame kind, betwixt which there is a fermentative virtue, which will affect that which no other thing in the world is able to do. By it water becomes plants, minerales, and animals. Nor is the work ever out of kind. Artifixes intimates. The very same operation, where he phase, the body coagulates the water into dryness, also the body. All one as runner doth cheese. Therefore, do they say, the earth is the receptacle of sperm, the water is seed, feek the knowledge of this only, and rejoice in it, as in a defervedly invaluable tree fear, for it is the way which nature hath and doth tread in all ages of the world. Although it may seem riddles and perfect contradictions to some, how the seed can be said to be sown in the earth. Water and airs, but thy experience only must reconcile as the art of an artist can make it. He also shows how it is thus purified, is by the help of nature, art joining consanguinity with consanguinity. The knowledge of this is the hidden key of the whole art, for Philodethus says. Learn to know this green lion and its preparation, which is all in all in the art. It is the only knot. Untie it. And you are as good as a master, for whatever then remains is but to know the outward regimen of fire, or to help on nature's internal work. Therefore I desire my reader to very cautiously observe this point, not only in the right formation of the body, and to beware of all corrosives, but also in the right separation of the blood, and to beware of all violence. For we see the husband sows his grain or seed, but it is the sprout only that produces the herb, which at first is scarcely discernible, and therefore if taken out from its grain or root, it will die in a moment. For which reason the aforesaid author says, The whole is sown, yet the fermentative spirit is scarce a third part of the whole. The rest is of no value, and that the dregs of the body come off with the dregs of the prepared mercury and that the spiritual part or virtue of the body does purge and purify the matrix of the water in which it is sown, in a generative. Way between male and female of the same kind, between which there is a fermentative virtue, which will affect that which no other thing in the world is able to do. By it, water becomes plants. Minerals and animals, nor is the work ever out of kind, Artefius intimates the very same operation, where he says, the body coagulates the water into dryness out of the body, all one is runner doth cheese. Therefore they say, the earth is the receptacle of sperm, the water of seed. Seek the knowledge of this only, and rejoice in it, as in a deservedly invaluable treasure, for it is the way, which nature hath and doth tread in all ages of the world, although it may seem riddles and perfect contradictions, how the seed can be said to be sown in the earth, water and air. But thy experience only must reconcile this difficulty, for thy will not, nor dare not speak plainer. I shall only add that life, as it is an invisible thing, contained in the blood, as in its vessel, is as an infant's, very tender and weak, and easy to be extinguished, but if carefully nourished. It successively grows stronger and stronger, from babes to young men, and from thence to strong and perfect years. Therefore, in the philosophical work, it is a successive animation by eagles, which the Sophi have assigned from three to ten. Three is the least you may dare to open your vessel at, for it must first be able to withstand the fire and water. Therefore, Philalethes says, the vessel must not be opened, nor the fire go out from the 10th of October to the 10th of March. But I say, it's far better if it remains till the 10th of July. What is to be understood by breaking the vessel or letting the fire go out? I have plainly shown in my general epistle, therefore need not to recite it here. This operation is that which Espinogus intimates where he says that the winged virgin, excellently well washed and impregnated with the spiritual seed of the first male, whose cheeks are stained with the color of a pomegranate, must be joined to the second male, 
by whose corporeal seed she is made fully to conceive. This same truth is also hinted by Flamel in his summary. Mercury must be taken out of his nest and transplanted nearer the sun, where he will grow more in one day than in a thousand elsewhere. The practice is plainly intimated by Artefius. Thus, our Mercury is drawn from its vitriolic caverns, and a little farther tells you, tis drawn from a red servant. But this being the work of the succeeding chapters, I shall omit it here and supply what is defective for the completing this chapter, which is to let the reader know that it's not the outward vessel or outward fire that Philothes means, which I will plainly show by confronting against him an author as learned as himself, viz. That famous Willis in his Search of Causes, page 73, where he speaks of the mineral matrix and the modus of ripening the seed. He says we find that though some part of the matter exhale and fly through the openness of the matrix, yet that which remains may be brought afterwards to its full specific perfection. If the matrix be closed again, and this is a good and observable ground to investigate the true seed of all metals, the manner of ripening them, their generation, regeneration, and exacerbations also to confirm the doctrine of homogeneity of that which is most perfect in the metalline predicaments. Also of the symbolizing of the corporal metalline elements before spoken of. Being understood, this is a key opening the door of many mystical vessels in Hermes' temple. And so we see that it is impossible for anything to attain natural perfection more than it hath without natural motion, such as nature useth in generation and augmentation, therefore in all times and in all matters. The cautions here delivered must be carefully observed, that the seed may be brought to such motion, and be enabled to receive the benefit of such natural exaltation. Now this motion and exaltation is not to be effected, without you understand the office of nature in all the seasons of the year, from the west to the north, and thence to the east, and lastly to the south, or from the autumn to the winter, and thence to the spring, and lastly to the summer. For in autumn the seed is sown in the earth, in the winter it doth digest and putrefy, and in the spring it buds forth stalks, herbs, and flowers, and in the summer it's ripe and gathered. Therefore let the circulation be gentle, not only in the formation of the body, but also in the union of the two dragons, male and female. The male is sulfur, or the fixed dragon, the vessel of earth and receptacle of sperm. The female is argent vibe, born up in the wind, the vessel of air animated with the first male sulfur and therefore the receptacle of seed. There must be time and place therefore given, both for the formation and dissolution of this body, or as it congeals drop by drop. So does it dissolve drop by drop again, in which action and work of the elixir, there will appear blackness conjoined with moisture, unctuous and fusible and melting, and more than water. For in this elixir, the latonal body of earth is hidden, which will again congeal itself, and that last calcine itself into dust. Thus in the twofold vessel does this wheel about from earth to heaven, from heaven to earth again, by which is manifestly seen Mercury's growth and office of his caducian rot. But this being more clear in practice, I shall proceed to that in the following chapter. Chapter 5th containing some practical rules to be observed in the body's formation and exaltation, having already presented many previously undisclosed mysteries in the former chapters, beneficial for the sincere inquirer including concepts that have been hidden in this art since the world's foundation, and articulated thoughts that many philosophers have not dared to share even with their own children for fear of exposure, I shall continue with the same honesty in practice. Thus, I will state this as an irrefutable aphorism. Everything that is generated or conceived is born from its own specific seed and within its proper matrix. In one sense, the matrix can be considered corporeal as it is the element of earth. However, the seed, in nature's initial intent, is wholly spiritual, being a subtle, oily, spermatic vapor, which can never be multiplied without the attraction of proper nourishment, which is a living body endowed with prolific and multiplicative power, in alignment with the seed's intention. In such homogeneous principles, the body is not only softened and strengthened, thus serving as the true womb and matrix for producing the most perfect minerals, but the spirit is also exalted, enabling it to propagate and multiply in its own kind. Sandivogius has clearly distinguished the difference between the body and seed in his 12 treatises, 
making it unnecessary to repeat here. Moreover, the seed must be placed in its proper matrix, both by nature and by art, for only through this that the C. Seed is nourished through death and regeneration to a form more noble, according to the undoubted truth and doctrine of our blessed Savior, concerning a grain of wheat, John 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. Hence, we can easily infer that nothing can be animated and born again unless it first undergoes mortification, putrefaction, and corruption, through which dissolution and a more secret and noble change are brought about. This process extracts the central virtue and sets it at liberty, enabling it to become either spirit or body as the artist pleases. Neither the matrix nor the seed can be exalted without being strengthened and assisted by a salt of its own nature, dissolved in a convenient liquor. That is, its own pure vitriolic salt united with the inferior waters and lunar sulfur, and then by art, sublimed and purified. This is the watery lees, which unites with the watery seminal, from which vegetation and germination come. It readily unites with and strengthens the seed, with the assistance of a gentle bath, penetrating, analyzing, and rarefying the substance thereof, so that the included spirit may, out of its subject matter, Form a convenient habitation and body for itself and also the blood. For Basil Valentine, that learned philosopher, plainly shows you that the fixed blood of the red lion has its original from the unfixed blood of the green lion, therefore they are closely related. It may be noted that there is no visible or permanent body before it is formed by art and nature. Without this body and true soil, the seed can never perform its function in natural propagation and seminal multiplication. Here Basil is to be understood, where he says that metals and minerals must be dissolved and reduced again to their first matter by minerals. This must not be out of kind, for so one may expect a monster. For the subtle seed will not mix with anything out of its own latitude, that is to be understood, with profit to the artist, for as Basil says in his eighth key, speaking of putrefaction, no metallic seed can operate or augment itself, unless this metallic seed by itself only without any strange addition or mixture, be brought to putrefaction. That is only by the salt and sulfur in kind. For salt prepares the sulfur, and salt and sulfur qualify mercury and form the body and bring it also to vegetation, so that this saline liquor medium is that by which the salt does by its dissolving and searching nature enter into and open the most intricate and innermost recesses of the seed, and that only as the humor or liquor is by a due degree of heat rarefied and provoked thereunto, then also is the salt in it attenuated and rendered fit to pass into, and open the most compacted body of the seed, there stirring up and inciting to vegetation a spirit of salt, which is the like and same with itself, which before lay hidden and active. A spirit that is at liberty will easily and quickly free another spirit of the same nature, that is bound up and restrained. This is done first by reason of that activity and permeability, which the free spirit is endued with. Secondly, by reason of the harmony, likeness, and love between them. This correlation is the cause that the exterior free spirit makes way into and joins with that spirit of salt included in the seed. And so does with more ease work upon and excited for, as the proverb has it, like will easily go like, and their unity is most intimate. Now every spirit, when loose and floating in liquid bodies or liquors, is at liberty in this state, and by the mediation of heat does like a lodestone, attract the spirit that is under restraint, opening and dissolving the body, which holds it in, and the restrained spirit itself, like a sensible prisoner, labors for liberty, conspiring and striving to be in action and full communion. C2. With the other, the free spirit by this sudden and subtle accession, still exciting and strengthening him, by this means so provokes him to action, as fire does in kindle fire, therefore the body holding it must necessarily suffer a change in liquefaction and so come to be putrefied by its own included spirit, whose operation before was obstructed and kept under, the included spirit having acquired liberty, and a power to be in action from the other, strives to get out and enlarge itself, and to that end breaks and destroys its first body, and produces another new one. So the spirit of the salt of the earth, when it is dissolved in the immixed humor of that element, 
for every salt melts and is dissolved in its proper liquor, is then at liberty for every salt when once dissolved in, its own liquor becomes active. Hence it is that a corn of wheat in whose body, as if under lock and key, the spirit of the vegetable salt is bound up and fettered. As soon as it is cast into the ground, is by the free spirit of the salt of the earth penetrated and opened, that the salt which lies dissolved or loose in that liquor or immixed humor may excite the vegetable spirit in the corn of wheat to action and vegetation, which spirit being thus set at liberty, does presently by the putrefaction of the grain of corn produce in the wheat's proper matrix the substance of the root, which is a new body, by whose mediation and defecation the earth must afterwards, the spirit attracting it, communicate nutriment to the blade and rest of this vegetable as it grows up and increases. Now you must observe that this salt, which conduces to the solution and opening of the body, is sometimes weak, sometimes strong. If it be weak, you must strengthen it with the salt. That is of the same nature and property with the seed, and the liquor which has the weak salt in it must be impregnated with it. That the solution may be more effectual and more convenient for nature in her operation. Let us therefore consider the generation of wheat. There is in rainwater a volatile salt, by which solution is made in the earth. But when that salt, by reason of the earth's over-dryness, is not sufficient to cause a perfect and fruitful solution of the seed corn, then does the husbandman strengthen and manure his ground with muck and dung, in which there is a salt of the same nature with the seed, for muck is made of straw, and straw grows out of the seed, so that when the rain descends and mixes itself with the compost or mold, there proceeds from the muck and ground a nitrous sulfurous salt, which the immixed humor of the earth imbibes or takes in and being strengthened by it, opens the most compacted and firmest seed, whence comes a fruitful and joyful harvest. Therefore, thou that desirest to be a disciple of nature, and see the secrets thereof, open thy eyes at what Clydophorus delivers. Now seeing that the seminal virtue lurks in most intimate recesses of the seed, and consists in a most subtle proportion of the sulfurous salt, it is most clear, that it cannot be exalted and multiplied but in a humor that is most eminently subtle and pure, but because the seed sown does not at the first, or presently. Take in that subtle humor out of those places which supply it with nutriment. Therefore nature does before all things take care, first to provide and form the vessels, in which that humor taken afterwards out of the elements is digested and rarefied, and most accurately purged, that out of the whole body, when formed and perfected, she may contribute her utmost for producing that pure seminal essence, which is the conservation and multiplication of that species, which yields it or brings it forth, for which very reason provident nature does, by the intervening of putrefaction out of the sea of the herb, form first the root, which we must also do, which root being formed, you will understand what Latin is, and C3. Afterwards, she does shoot forth the blade, dividing it in the growth into several sections or joints, that the humor taken out of soil, in which the seed is sown, may at first in the root, and afterwards in the body of the herb, when grown up and flourished, be the more and more digested. Like as the blood in man's body by the pulse and action of circulation, for that nature drives the seminal virtue through all the vessels and joints from the very root to the uppermost top branches, wherein a matrix is formed on purpose for the reception of this seminal matter and most perfect seed, fit for the generation of the same species the like does the artist. Observe, when the seed is thus formed, it does come to maturity by assistance of the sun's heat, being ripe is gathered, but it happens often. And this you are concerned to know, that though nature forms always these vessels and vesicula of the seminal progression, yet those bodies, which are thus furnished, do not always yield seed. And this comes to pass, because in those bodies, the pores, through which the spermatic virtue should be promoted and driven into the superficies and upper part are before the seed is stirred or can be produced, sopped up by external cold, or else by the predominant virtue of the innate fixed salts, nay, sometimes by volatile coagulating ones, which so bind up and obstruct the seed's motion, that it either cannot come to any effectual maturity and perfection, or else is wholly suppressed or shut up. For example, the orange and lemon trees do manifestly grow in this climate, but the region is too cold, and that in a double sense to yield their fruit, as they do in Italy, where the sun by its warmth excites, and where the soil also is more naturally warm and agreeable to bring them to their perfection. 
the like may be understood in the metallic kingdom. For although here is the seed of metals in abundance, as lead, tin, iron, etc., yet the climate is not hot enough to bring it to perfection or to emission of seed. This you may conceive by gold and silver when it comes to our hands, for it can make no emission of the included seed, because their pores are by the vigor and excellency of the innate fixed salts and sulfur so bound and shut up, that they are wholly restrained from effusion of seed, for the seminal virtue in them is not at liberty to act and come forth. For which reason the philosophers, who knew this, were willing to assist nature, and did with most happy success reduce gold and the other metals into their first matter, as has been plainly shown before, that by this course they might open the pores, which by the supereminent vigor and strength of the innate fixed salt were shut and locked up, and so bring the metal to that passing condition, in which they might, with a marvelous increase to their great benefit, yield seed and propagate, as our philosophic gold silver, and mercury do, which will afterwards exalt the vulgar soul and loon to that state, as to excel their own virtues a thousand degrees, and this no other way than the orange trees are in many parts cherished by an artificial and external heat, which makes them not only put forth, but also bring their fruit to maturity. The like do we in our work, he that has an understanding heart. Let him conceive what Clydophorus says for his information. The humor or liquor which serves for putrefaction must be proportionable to that body, which is to be putrefied, both for quantity and receptivity. The humor is then proportionated for quantity. When so much of the humor is taken in by the body, as is sufficient for its it is proportioned for its receptivity or manner of reception. When the humor is not suddenly and at once, but gently and by degrees, or by little and little taken in, and drunk up by the body and seed, for sudden imbibition of the humor cannot so conveniently vivify the seed but causes by its sudden and unequal penetration. C4. That some part of the body or seed is insufficiently opened or dissolved. Hence it happens that darnel does sometimes come up instead of corn. Therefore the philosophers advise the sons of this science to irrigate or moisten our earth by long delay and frequent wearisome attraction. The heat which promotes this putrefaction must be so mild and temperate that the liquor in which the resolved salt lies may remain still in and about the matter, and not be laved or evaporated from it. And that for these two principal reasons, first, because the body putrefied must receive life in this liquor. Secondly, because such a gentle heat dissolves the salt in the liquor without violence, and disperses it into the matter after a natural manner, that the body may more commodiously putrefy. But if the liquor were agitated by an excessive burning heat, the matter in it would be destroyed or spoiled so that it could never be animated, nor receive. Such a putrefaction, as is convenient for it so that, in this case, there would be no true birth produced. Listen if you intend to obtain the true medicine. The body putrefying must not be removed out of that matrix, in which the putrefaction was begun, until that which is intended be fully perfected. Therefore do the philosophers say, one vessel, one matter, and one successive disposition to the white and to the red. But here is something in this very materious, but candid Sandivogius allows too, which point we shall clear up hereafter. But the reasons why the first vessel is not to be broken are these. If you sow a grain of corn in the earth, you must let it remain until the harvest comes, and the more pure the matrix is, the thing generated is by so much the more perfect and sound, because a pure matrix yields pure fruit, which is durable, but an impure matrix, impure, imperfect, and frail, whence comes shortness of life. Therefore, you must assist nature by purifying the two inferior elements of earth and water, which being purified, will prepare the sulfurous earth to admit of some fiery virtue from the central sperm into the water, by which the seed will be purified by the natural union, if thou proceed thus. Then art thou in a good way to obtain thy desired perfection, for all impurities of the matrix are to be removed, first by art, and then by nature, for she observes the separation of impurities, i.e., the subtle from the gross, but for the removing of any weakness nature requires help, which must be done by a judicious and discerning disciple, for these impurities being once excluded. Generation proceeds more freely, for earthly encumbrances are to be removed by manual operation, as evulsion or ejection. The spiritual by nature, we have a demonstration of this in the art of tillage or husbandry, where the infirm salt of the earth is by the sulfurous. Fat salt of the dung assisted and strengthened, 
but the stones and thistles, which separate from the matrix and hinder its fertility by their weighty encumbrance, are by handwork cast out, feel dressed, that it may become fruitful, for which end all weeds are also plucked up. The same method must the disciple of nature observe in preparing the secret magistry, for his earth or field is first made open and fit by calcination, and then enriched with his mercurial power, and fortified with a salt and sulfur in kind, which again prepares the seed to be cast into its own matrix, by which it is vivified and multiplied in order to bring forth more noble fruit. For that matrix is only convenient, which is adapted to generation, and permits an easy entrance to the seed. That is to say, to receive it with ease, that it is not hindered by its hardness to the entrance of the seed. For if the matrix is grown callous or hard or impenetrable, the seed never freely enters. Therefore, it is our art to keep it open and render it. Porous, and that by frequent agitations, that it may be fitted for the conception of the seed. For as in the foresighted husbandman, he plows, mattocks, arrows, to bring his earth to a softness, that so it may easily take in his seed, and bring it to perfection, these things thou must observe. If thou desirest to come to the secret, praying to God for a right use, and wait with patience, as the husbandman does, and then without doubt, God will favor thy righteous attempts, and give that into thy possession, which will satisfy all the longings of thy heart. But out of that body which is either corrupted or destroyed by strange or extraneous natures, or whose spermatic vessels are by some violence maimed or cut off, no seed can be had, for it will be very vain and an unprofitable attempt for any to hope for issue, or a healthful seed by a man whose body and radical balsam is depraved or dried up by excess of aromatic wines or hot waters, or by some contagious and curable disease. Eunuchs, because their genitals are cut off, can propagate their own species, therefore, I say, it is a fruitless search to look for that in a dry tree and lopped off branches, which never can be found. But in that green and living power of Mercury's triune office. Furthermore, the body which is preserved or sustained by one simple kind of nutriment is far more perfect and durable, yielding more sound and prolific seed than that which is nourished with different kinds of nutriment. As to what concerns our work, for you have often heard, the nearer anything is to unity so much the more durable it is. For in unity there is no division or discord, which is the cause of corruption, and where no corruption is, there is a permanent integrity and conservation thereof. That which is nearest to unity must needs keep better, and endure longer than that which is remote from it, because there is in one less discord, and more in the other, so there can be nothing. That can give this durability to the seed, so as to yield perfect and permanent fruit, but this universal spirit, the first actor in all generation, which comes from unity, passing through the elements into discord, through discord returns to unity again, which that you may the better understand, we shall particularly handle Mercury's triune office, as we shall proceed in the following treatise. Observe that under this head of agriculture the whole work, with all its particular modes for nourishment and exaltation, may be delivered. For as I have shown in my Historia Novitas Britanniae, New History of the Treasure of Britain. This is a most excellent way of writing. The work, being for the greatest part purely natural, does symbolize and agree with what she yearly performs in the great world, God's works being uniform. Therefore, I shall give you a short review. For as the husbandman does burn up brambles, thorns, and briars, nay, in some parts of England, they dig up the pit of the earth and burn it to manure the other part. For salts are by experience found to be of a wonderful, attractive nature and powerful in fortifying seed, and as stones are taken out, the clods broken and often harrowed to make it fine. So does art in our work make our earth as fine, even as flower, and as nature fortifies the earth by the universal spirit in the rains, dews, and airy life. So in art by the unctuous vapor of mercury, and as in nature the husbandman manures his ground with muck and straw, which is of the same nature with the seed. So does art by the salt and sulfur of the earth and inferior waters which is one in kind, and as the seed, when ripe, is gathered in the ear, growing at the very summities of the stalk, the like in art. For mercury being ripe is taken from her superior habitation. Chapter 6. A Theosophical Investigation Concerning the Elixir, that being the house and habitation of mercury, 
etc. Elixir is our second menstruum or fire, as acetum vinegar is the first. And therefore, it constitutes a second part in the work. It's two things of one nature. For the seed is dissolved by sperm alone. In this dissolution, it appears in the form of a ponderous mineral water, a chaos. And therefore, the philosophers say elixir is water. And for this reason, the elixir reigns all the time of the reiterated dissolutions. That is, from the conjunction of the two sperms to the perfect calcination of the body. The whole time of the flight of the eagles. And here Mercury has its habitation and dwelling place, he being born out of the chaos, when the waters were separated from the waters, and is by nature distilled into the center of the earth. For as Sandy Vogia says, the four elements in the first operation of nature do, by the help of the arceus of nature, distill into the center of the earth a ponderous or heavy vapor of water, which is a seat of metals, and is called mercury, by reason of its flexibility and its conjunction with everything not for its essence, and for its internal heat it is likened to sulfur, and after congelation becomes a radical moisture. And although the body of metals be procreated of mercury, which is to be understood of the mercury philosophers, yet they are not to be hearkened to, that think the vulgar mercury is the seed of metals, and so take the body instead of the seed. Now though he be distilled into the center of the earth, yet does he ascend again to heaven upon the wings of the spirit, and so partakes of both natures, and shows his triune office, which his hieroglyphic doth point forth, for his body is hermaphroditical, but Mercury's caduceus rod is male and female. By the female, he ascends to the courts of heaven, and by the male, he descends to the center of the earth. Through this same power, he draws souls out of hell, induces sleep in all eyes, as Virgil writes of him. By hell, it is meant the philosopher's center, and by heaven, their superior waters. As God's vicegerent and nature's eldest son, he acts most powerfully in the mineral kingdom. For instance, Helmont states that the earth is only a matrix for generation, not transformed but remaining the same in weight, exemplified by a tree growing from small to large, asserting that vegetables grow and increase only by water. While this doctrine carries some truth in common production in this mineral work, the matter is otherwise. The earth here increases not only in weight, but also in virtue. As Sandivogius explains in his treatise of the three principles of all things, showing the action of body, soul, and spirit, the spirit augments the quantity of the body, but the fire augments its virtue. However, as there is more of the spirit in weight than of the fire, the spirit is raised, oppresses the fire, and draws it to itself, and thus each of them increases in virtue. The earth? being in the middle, increases in weight and also in virtue. From a simple earth, it is transformed into a noble and fusible salt, which Artefius calls sal albro, the best and noblest of all salts. The seminal lephus of the earth unites with the seminal vitality of the water, resulting in vegetation, multiplication, and exaltation. The universal spirit contains the multiplicative power of all things, as often hinted and candidly explained through a body spiritual and spirit corporal. These two kinds of salts generate all things in the macro and microcosm, as the Mauritanian philosopher accurately states. My opinion is that it is an excellent and elaborated piece if you interpret the word man as microcosm, which indeed is the foundation of our seeds. Whether the fault lies in the translator or a willful veil of the author, I shall here omit. These two salts are explicitly mentioned by Sandivogius, who advises mixing the two waters, meaning the celestial and terrestrial. Although the golden seed resides in the earth and the lunar is in the air, being the radical moisture of metals, philosophers state that minerals have their roots in the air and their heads and tops in the earth. These truths, profound and mysterious, are often beyond common understanding, and many demand signs and wonders for conviction, just as they demanded from Christ. Christ responded that no sign would be given except the sign of Jonah, who was three days and three nights in the whale's belly likening it to the Son of Man's time in the heart of the earth before his resurrection. Similarly, in the restoration of nature, this is as significant a sign as any, and those who do not believe in this shall be given no other sign in this book. As mercury flows from the ocean of nature's Catholic spirit, it must contain a universal and unspecific nature, 
with such degrees of purity that it can descend into the Earth's center to kill and putrefy the first spermy matter. It then ascends on the water, revitalizing in deep sense of nature's mysterious operations, finally transforming into a more immortal and celestial body. This process confirms a correct foundation and reveals nature's mysterious operations and her irrevocable laws, written on fine leaves of silver and capital letters of gold. The preface of these laws states that nature alone, in secondary causes, is the only true universal fountain and ocean from which all true natural wisdom is obtained. Those who doubt signs suffer deservedly for their unbelief, still tasting the first fruits of disobedience and unbelief, valuing notional philosophy over the substantial glory of true light and beauty of nature. Mercury, the most universal of nature's children, ties and unites the rays of the sun and moon, bringing the queen those garments Philolide speaks of in his chemical fountain. So charming and beautiful, they seem unbelievable without sight. This book, based on a hypothesis as ancient as the world itself, directs to nature's universal book to understand her spiritual operations and wisdom. The knowledge of two fountains, natural and divine, reveals the mysteries of Mercury's triune office, emblematic of the heavenly Jerusalem, Mercury, as God's vicegerent, holds in one hand his snaky rod, and in the other, a triune key unlocking the mysteries of acetum, elixir, and azoth, essential for the mixture of our seed. Understanding Mercury's particular office and nature's general role is crucial, as well as knowing her initial mixture in the element's bowels. The elixir's principles are confused, a chaos. The central waters lack a radical union with the celestial, divided by a crude air or firmament, Learning to unveil Mercury's pure spirit from its suppressive shadows is necessary for exalting it from natural to millinery perfection, redeeming the imperfect planetary forms. The practice of this is clearly shown by Philolithus, who states that our art is to combine two principles, one rich in salt and the other abundant in the oil of nature. These principles are neither entirely perfect nor completely imperfect, and thus can be altered or exalted through our art, unlike that which is totally perfect. The process involves using common mercury to extract not the weight, but the celestial virtue from the compound. This virtue, when fermented, generates in the common mercury an offspring more noble than itself, which is our true hermaphrodite, capable of self-congealing and dissolving bodies. In the work of the elixir, experience shows that it divides itself into two principal parts, laton at the bottom and azoth at the top. Laton is whitened by azoth. Therefore, I consider it necessary to discuss these in a separate chapter, and thus I conclude this section, D, chapter 7, a theophysical investigation concerning the nature and production of Laton. Laton emerges from the elixir as a body formed from water, containing the remaining corporeal impurities. Philosophers regard Laton as gold, specifically philosophical gold, which must be redeemed by Ezoth. The seed of gold lies within gold itself, but is tightly compacted under strong metallic layers, which only the hermaphroditical mercury, referred to in the previous chapter, has the power to open. Poets have also provided a clear distinction regarding the nature and production of Latan. I have discussed her mythical birth in my work, Analysis, Chimica Theologica Poetica, and here I only mention that she is described as an island floating in the sea, initially hidden underwater, and later becoming fixed and immovable. Her name, derived from Latayo, meaning to hide, suggests she is concealed within the elixir and becomes visible through fire separation. It is said that Latan gave birth to twins, Diana and Apollo, with Diana assisting in Apollo's birth. These stories symbolize deep truths, indicating that Leighton's core contains the solar or golden seed. Thus, to witness Apollo in his golden robes, it is necessary to dissolve this earth as Latan is symbolized in the myth where Juno, Jupiter's twin sister and wife, is depicted showering down in gold with a triple thunderbolt at her feet. The entire task is to perfectly calcine Latan so that it can accept this golden enhancement. As noble as this gold is, its mother, the Mercury of the philosophers, is even more noble. For although soul, among all natural forms, has no equal in luster and beauty, the supernatural mother of soul is far more beautiful. There is simply no comparison. The nature of this mercurial, 
sulfurous light is such that it penetrates into the ocean of nature's universal one, revealing the profound secrets of this science, demonstrating the triune office of Mercury and showcasing his unparalleled virtues centered in paradisiacal purity. Mercury can be likened to Janus with a dual face. On one side, he gazes towards elementary corruptions and generations within the realm of the elements, embodying the life and death of everything natural. On the other, he looks towards eternity, symbolizing the fire of the general conflagration when the elements themselves will melt from fervent heat, leading to the creation of a new philosophical heaven and earth. The central heart of Mercury is imbued with a dual essence, one immutable, the other multiplicative, all driven by the virtue of lights. The movement of these lights represents the highest fire in the world, unopposed by any contrary force. This lit to nor gold, redeemed by mercurial fire, is melted, opened, and calcined in a manner unachievable by common fire, thereby undergoing a higher and more noble purification, hinting at immortality. Even common gold demonstrates much of this truth, revealing its dominion over pure elements, more in quality than quantity, thus representing a perfect birth of nature through united specification. It withstands all fiery trials, yet in its highest perfection, it is but a mere signature of the sun, differing from the fullness as much as a shadow differs from the substance. D2. The fullness of virtue resides in that general mineral where Mercury performs his triune office, from which not only soul and lune are formed, but also the noble and chaste virgin Diana is adorned with circles of light. All these originate from the elixir, as will be shown later. In this process, the incorruptible elements gain dominance over the corruptible, producing a most perfect birth. This birth, when artificially exalted to a light, allows for the discernment of many mysterious seals stamped in light by the eternal God, as alluded to in the first signatures of things. Note that the universal signet encompasses all virtues of the inferior ones. These virtues arise from the primitive root of universality, having passed through Salmasus's fountain, effeminating themselves in the first radical moisture. Exalted to its beautiful form, it is more of a genus than a species, the most universal in the action of vivification. This profound wisdom gained from inspecting the universal signet allowed inquisitive individuals to describe the nature of individual species directly from the original headspring, without relying on books. As Sandavoja says, one who is at the center can write many books because things there are clear and understandable. In the center, the revolutions, durations, and mutations of all spheres are plainly visible, along with their eternal change from every corruption. When you see nature unveiled and the body of Laton radically dissolve, you will find nothing clearer than what I have written here. I have shown the union of earth and water, forming one globe, how the earth is in the water, and the fire in the air, which is the life and activity of the whole. Laton must be regenerated by Azov to see him in his beautiful garments. Mercury, often dying and regenerating himself, is that first active power that excites the sperm to motion and informs the body for exaltation. He is the sole laborer, plowing the earth, beating the water with his breast, and striking the azure skies with his rods. In his triune power, he triumphs over all elements, imparting living virtues to the more imperfect and decaying species, and enhancing the homogeneous with more living and durable qualities. This is known to the divine Hermes, the father of philosophers, who in his emerald tablet speaks of the sun as the father, the moon as the mother, and the wind or air carrying it in its belly. All true philosophers have testified to this truth, artistically figuring out the same. Therefore, I suppose you may never expect to have this art more plainly open than what I have done in this book, until the fullness of time when all these mysteries shall be manifest. If you do not understand me, do not expect to obtain it from other authors, as their writings contain. Mysterious knots a beginner cannot untie without reaching that still silence Hermes speaks of. This silence opens the intellectual springs, showing the budding of Mercury's caduceus, like Aaron's rod. In these natural mysteries, matters unpremeditated flow for your benefit in this writing. D3. The text discusses the philosophical and spiritual aspects of the transformation of Latan, philosophical gold, and the role of Mercury in this process relating it to broader themes of regeneration and the pursuit of knowledge. 
the author acknowledges the need to present this knowledge appropriately, respecting the divine precept that profound truths are not to be shared indiscriminately. They emphasize that this wisdom is a divine gift and that its full understanding is reserved for the appointed time. Laton, representing philosophical gold, is seen as a body derived from the elixir, containing impurities that need to be redeemed. The process of refining Laton is likened to spiritual restoration in humans, with parallels drawn to biblical themes like the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Life. Mercury's role is central to this process, described as having a dual nature, operating both within the natural world and in a higher spiritual realm. This duality is expressed through Mercury's ability to transcend elemental boundaries and facilitate transformations. The author suggests that true wisdom about Mercury's triune power reveals an understanding similar to the Garden of Eden, a paradisiacal state of knowledge. They challenge conventional ideas about the physical location of paradise, proposing instead that it is a celestial virtue within nature, centered in the universal sperm, and linked to eternal life and durability. The text concludes by emphasizing that understanding these mysteries requires a spiritual awakening, transcending earthly limitations and recognizing the deeper spiritual truths of existence. The author implies that only through the spiritual journey can one access the profound insights and transformative powers of alchemy and philosophy, D4, the tree of life which stands in the midst of the paradise of God, whose leaves are for the healing of the nations freely, without money or price. I have a magazine of such like secrets as these to write, and more especially concerning the seeds of elements and that pure type which is to be raised out of these corporal elements by the grand tyrant of the earth, as well as the fire of conflagration, for as there is a particular. So is there a general purification by water and spirit, and then by fire. But what shall I say? Should I even spend and be spent to invite? I am satisfied it would not avail while the man of sin thus remains. For wisdom hath been tendered to all and the porch of her temple stands always open by night and by day, and her minister is inviting thee to enter, O man, wherever thou art, for her call is to all the inhabitants of the earth. But Solomon testifies that although she thus speaks, yet few are they that regard her call, and although I say by her, as it was said by the spouse in the canticles, although she is black, yet is she comely. And King Solomon compares her to all the glories that this world affords, the better to make her received. Yet was she despised, the more is the pity, and remains the same to this day. Now seeing this art carries so many mysteries with it, we ought therefore in all humility to labor to prepare ourselves, so as to know the hour when the Lord's call shall be. And with the five wise virgins to have oil in our lamps, that when the bridegroom calls we may be admitted. It is good at all times to be zealously affected, according to the measure of knowledge received, and then it is upon good ground to be hoped though we may not be so rightly informed, as we should, that it will be accepted. This was the case of Saul, who for his zeal was converted to Paul, though at the same time he had the writ of persecution about him. Yet he was made an apostle of Jesus Christ. For that God, who knows the hearts of all, told him, he had made him a chosen vessel, and could in that very minute have showed him all that was necessary for his conversion, if it had stood good with his divine pleasure, but he was ordered or sent to means, i.e., to go into the city to Ananias, and there to be told what he should do. From hence I have learned thus much, that it is very profitable for information to follow the ordained means, which is diligent study and continual labors. For I am very apt to think that the Almighty hath given opportunity to many, but they have willfully neglected it. And as no mortal man knows the counsel and decrees of the Almighty, so none dare open the floodgates of these mysteries more fully than he finds himself commissioned, and hath peace in his conscience for so doing. But I have a secret faith that the day is even at the door that shall reveal and bring to light hidden things, even those of the greatest concern for man's temporal and eternal welfare. But designing, if God permit, to write more fully of these mysteries, I shall omit them here or any further discourse of Latan, and so conclude. Chapter the Eighth a theophysical investigation concerning the rise and production of Azoth. Azoth hath its rise and birth from the elixir, as well as Latan. For, as I said before, as the one inhabits the lower part, so that the other the upper. 
This truth is confirmed by Count Trevisan, who says that Azoth is drawn out of the elixir as oil out of water and is hot and moist. And Philoleth is in his exposition on Ripley, likewise thus. The elixir is divided into a more subtle part, which is called Azoth, and the grosser part is called Laton, which is by Azoth washed and whitened. In Rebus, the matters are confused. In elixir, they are divided. And in Azoth, they are conjoined with an inseparable union. This is that men whom they so much do magnify, saying that Azoth or fire is sufficient for thee in the middle or end, though not at the beginning. And Basil Valentine in his manuals, PAG 487, shows a reason for it, saying that this spirit renews both men and beasts, like the eagle consumeth whatsoever is bad, and produce a great age to long life. This spirit of Mercury is the chief key of all my other keys of which I've written in the beginning thereof, will I call, come ye blessed of the Lord. Be you anointed with oil, and refresh with water, embalm your bodies, that they may not putrefy, get a bad scent, and stink. For the heavenly water is the beginning, and the oil a medium, which doth not burn. Because tis made out of a spiritual sulfur, and the balsam of salt is corporeal, which is united with the water by means of the oil. And again, page 281. First know that no common argent vibe is fit for our use, but our argent is made of the best metals by the spagyric art, pure, subtil, clear, splendent as a fountain, transparent as crystal, without any impurity of this make a water, or incombustible oil. For mercury was at the first water, as all philosophers agree to this, my saying and doctrine. The manner of its preparation is candidly delivered by flamel who above all others hath untied the knot, and deservedly carries away the garland. For he saith, when you come to Latan, the matter must be divided into two parts, the one to wash and cleanse, the other to be cleansed and nourished. For Latan must enter the nymph's bath to be cleansed of his leprosy, and that infant when born, must be endued by the living God with the vegetative soul. Yet, however, these words are mysterious enough, till practice demonstrates them. This truth he himself agrees to, saying, Tis a secret, most admirably secret, which, for one of understanding, hath made fools of all those who have, sought without finding it, and hath made every man wise, that beholds it with the eye of his body or of his spirit. For in the knowledge of Azoth the whole secret consists, and as tis customary in the books of philosophers to make repetitions, I here again tell thee that our three keys are sedum, elixir and Azoth, and Azoth is, as it were, the fruit of the other two. Now a sedum is the sour juice of minerals, simple and compound, simple in respect to its essence, and compound in respect to the saline and sulfurous earth it contains. This goes before in preparing the elixir. And out of the elixir comes azoth, so called for its purity and incorruptibility. And because this is the most secret and mysterious to be understood, I shall be the more large in my descriptions, for this fire is a simple compound. Simple in respect to its heavenly and spiritual essence, compound in respect to the manner of its mixture and operation through the elements, so as to inform matter with light, then have you active and passive. Superior and inferior, the true hermaphroditical mercury, to which all the philosophers have borne this testimony, there is in mercury whatever the wise men seek. This is the true aqua hermetis and magical aeneid, or everlasting spring, that flows to the paradisical world of the Sophi where Mercury is rightly understood in his trying office, and to have an annal, vegetable and mineral life, and yet of kin to the most perfect metals. For tis by this alone the body is redeemed, and to be short, this is that floating soul, which hovers upon top of the mountains, and primitively did build her nest, as Basil Valentine says, in the coldness of the snow, where her chickens die for cold by the coldness of the snow, but the eggs being laid, and incubated by the old fiery dragon. Or first male sulfur, the cold mattress of Mercury is animated with heat and life, and spiritual seed, which prepares it as a sweating bath for the king. Here you see there appears somewhat of diversity between Latan and Azoth, the one being hot and dry, the other cold and moist, the one male, the other female, the one the body, the other the soul, so that by consequence a medium must be found out, partaking of both natures by which they are reconciled. This medium between the hot and the cold is moisture, and that between body and soul is spirit, the quintessence of which is that pure vital fire, 
that contains all the elements, yet itself is no element. For as it hath descended into the center of the earth, and partaken of purgation, so hath it again ascended into the air, and holds the wind in its fist, in all two. Bring about its immortality, and in this production it changes itself into various forms, one while tis female, another while male, and between both these states, hermaphroditical. Nay, it types forth many divine and supernatural mysteries. And as the author of the Clevis Bar saith, that great office of Christ reconciling God with man, which perhaps hereafter I may more largely touch at, but at present shall only say thus much concerning it, and that without blushing, that twas by the knowledge of this medium, they knew there should be a more heavenly one, which should descend and be born of a virgin, suffer death and martyrdom, and open the gates of hell and death, and then again ascend into the bosom of his father, and sit at his right hand, advocate on man's behalf, and so prophesied of his nativity, some hundred of years before it was. Read Hermes, the Clavis Bar, and Sal Lumen, and Spiritus Mundi, especially chapter 2. For thy further satisfaction, that being accurately handled there, I will now come to speak of its magnetic power and attractive office, and therefore you must not understand him, as if there should be an union of any other matters for this would contradict the unanimous authority of philosophers, who say in one thing alone is truth and in plurality vanity, so that it must be conceived only in respect of place and diversity of natures, ripeness and unripeness, purity and celestial virtue, and impurity and corporal corruption, what shall I say? I heartily wish that this my candidness may not deserve the same judgments to come upon me, as upon those that discover the secrets of the Elysian fields, but, O reader, tis for thy benefit, and therefore let thy prayers be for my preservation as for thy own. Let us not provoke the just God by a sinful abuse of his secrets. This indeed hath been the only Gordian knot, which hath puzzled me in my hard and painful labors for many years, and will forever puzzle all the fond doters on alchemy in their various and heterogeneous mixtures, and forever shall puzzle all such as are not ordained to this wisdom, notwithstanding our plain description of the matter, and modus thereon, and although I am not in full possession of this great medicine, yet can behold as in a glass the various operations and measurably describe the glory thereof. Being well satisfied that the knowledge thereof is to be obtained by all that will be industrious, and if they can but once come to understand and know the dimensions of our seed in the chaos, and how to separate the same and to form the female mercury, for thou must remember that the woman was taken as a rib from the man, so must our female be taken from the body. And being united in the moist nature, the female seed is produced without addition of anything in the world, but only as to distinction of nature, place, and manner of preparation. For thou must, by the way, observe that crude mercury and crude sulfur must from the very beginning be separated, one by art, the other by nature's, the one carrying an horrible coagulating salt with it, the other a wild sulfur or fume that burns the flowers of the seed, so that I advise all to beware of crude airs for when the seed is stirred up by the external heat, twill cause horrible fumes in thy glass. And so break it, I have observed, that where these wrathful principles remain, if they break not the vessel, they will blast the seed, as they too often do in the great world. For were it not for the benign spirit of nature, that labors with all its might to rarefy and disperse them, they would destroy man and beast. Therefore may I properly call them the principles of wrath, which I shall pass by and come to those of love, which are Laton and Azoth, for Laton is the body of the world and Azoth the soul or mind, and the soul must be reaped above the body and the mind, as a celestial seed, superior to root or stalk. These things being observed in practice, the artist may be satisfied that he builds upon the foundation and rock of truth, for that in the great world the office of the superior and active elements is to animate inferior beings with light, heat, life, and living motion, so as to cause vegetation through the great ocean of nature. For it is plainly shown to us by the irrevocable law of creation that every seed was first spiritual and had its original stamp, form, and texture in the light by the divine finger of God, in respect to every individual species, which causeth them to this day only to produce their like, as experience daily confirms. This is one of the greatest mysteries in philosophy to be rightly understood. Nay, it launches into many divine mysteries. For here is to be seen the efficacy of the impression given by the divine former, as
as before hinted, as well to celestial as terrestrial beings. Therefore we cannot, nor indeed ought to speak or write of it, but with astonishing humiliation and holy praises to that one triune God, who created this nature as a transcript or copy of the original. But seeing that from the very first formation of the body, this work of purification is carried on, I shall quote some authorities from the philosophers to show how it is affected. Beginning first with Sandivogius, who tells you that sulfur is detained in prison, and salt is the key to the infernal prison, where sulfur lies bound. So as Philadelphia says, salt prepares sulfur, salt and sulfur prepare mercury, and mercury must weigh them in the just balance of Libra. You may remember that Libra is an airy sign, yet is it pictured with a sword of justice in one hand, and the scales of true weights in the other. The philosophers, having mentioned the office of this Saturnal salt in opening the door of the prison, where sulfur lies bound, come let us now see by what action it is performed, which I tell you will be no other than that of animating and cherishing the seed, until the pure sprouts, buds and flowers come forth. And after that the weighty grain, for do not the philosophers unanimously tell you that heaven and earth must be united in the bed of friendship, so that they may honorably reign all their lives. And wherefore else should Sandivogia say, that the earth is like a sponge. Was it not that it should drink in the spermy aquacity of mercury and further? The earth is the receptacle of all, that is, for their purpose, because the mercurial spirit is counted for earth till exalted. First Philetha says, in the first days of the stone, there appears four elements, of which three are in the mercury sublimed, and one in soul, which is counted all for earth, till it be dissolved, and then it ferments the mercury and makes the three qualities of it, which it hath drawn from three substances to unite into one mercury. Sandivogius doth also allow a twofold mercury, where he says, the first matter of metal's eye is twofold. The first, a humidity mixed with hot air in form of a fat water, adhering to things pure or defiled, and is governed by mercury in the philosopher's sea, by the influence O, at the sun, moon, and stars, the second, the dry heat of the earth, called sulfur or earth of sulfur, which is the prime matter, life and virtue of the salt and fire of nature and of metals. The place, center and point as not the whole, but part of the seed, and an unresolvable spark of its own dissolvable body. From whence ariseth a flame and prolific power, as Philetes hath it. Thus we see that one author unriddles another, I say. They do even by their various expressions often unriddle themselves. And as to the point in hand, Artefius doth wonderfully explain it, where he speaks of the virtue of the mineral spirit, saying, The spirit is the mineral virtue of the two bodies. And then he adds, And of the water, which carries the soul or white tincture upon the bodies and out of the bodies, as the tincture of dyers is carried by water on the cloth. But that the practice I must seek yet another interpreter, and here I will bring in the clavis bar, for indeed if I understand him, he hath supplied with his candidness as to the practical part. What others seem to be silent in, where he says, the male mercury and female, or the spiritual blood of the red lion must be united with the unfixed blood of the green lion, and both must stand together in a cellar for a time without fire, and then will be seen with admiration what the first matter of metals is, viz, gur, or rather an oily unctuous seed to be spread like butter. And if I remember him aright, he also gives you the pondus, which is four of the male to nine of the female, Basil Valentine also hints at this operation where he says, The soft, precious water, wherewith the bridegroom's babe must be made, must be wisely and with great care prepared of two fencers, understand of two contrary natures, viz. Hot and dry, cold and moist, that one may drive out the other, and animate it so as to produce a wonderful medium. Sandy Voges intimates as much when he says, You must separate the spirit from the water, and let it return to the earth and putrefy like a grain of wheat, the face's being. Cast away, you must bring it from the deep again into water, which will generate a branch of an unlike shape to either parent. And Altho, as Befo, rehinted, he doth seem to speak of the unlawfulness of showing the way of extracting the sal ammoniac or mercury of the philosopher's OU. Sea water, yet hath he here candidly given some general hints of it. Therefore well may his writings be esteemed a rose, plucked out from among the thorns. Another anonymous author says, The soul hovers in the air and waits to redeem the body, and to unite with it, so as to bring it to immortality, alluding to the soul of man, 
but methinks I hear my reader to inquire what this hovering is to whom I will answer. It may be well understood by that, which is divinely delivered by Moses in Genesis, where he says, The Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters, commanding light to come forth, and like a swift winged herald, proclaims its embassy, separating the distinct natures, which lay unfruitfully hidden in the pavilions of confusion, which was the separating of the waters from the waters. So the like in the philosopher's chaos, for as I have already said, the spirit proceeds from unity, and passing through the discord of elements comes to unity again, which is Azoth, our whitening water, and is made permanent only by the aforesaid medium, which is the white wise, Pontanus's fire, Artephius's middle substance, clear like pure silver, which ought to receive the tincture of the sun and moon, is sharp vinegar, in which there is one of antimony, another of mercury sublimed, tis a coagulated mercury, but not fixed, a spiritual body, flexible in nature of a body, yet volatile in nature of a spirit. It is the tire of the sun and moon together, for Latan being formed, it must be whitened by Azoth, for the body doth not tine, except to be tined. Because of its thick and corporal nature, therefore philosophers say, that gold colors not until its hidden spirit be drawn from it, which Sandivogius intimates in these words. There is given to us one metal, which calls magnet soul and loon in another place hath power to consume the rest which he calls chalabs, but the radical moisture of mercury withstands it, and is bettered by its presence, and hence he cautions you to meddle with nothing else but their salt, which is mercury, and their gold and silver covered over with the sphere of Saturn. And Artephius, speaking of this mercurial fire, says, "'Tis the hidden secret of the wise alchemist, the philosopher's spirit, or fire, separated from the water and blood, for tis that mercury already mentioned which is drawn from its red servant and vitriolic caverns, wherewith is adorned. It is the dissolving water, the menstruum and the sphere of the moon, that knows how to calcine soul, about which volumes might be written, for the mercury is not congealed through a watery cold, but through a fiery warmth, from whence afterwards comes the glassy sea of the wise men, and the first candles of Medea's lighting, by the light whereof you may understand the mysteries of nature, and see how Mars and Venus have cast their golden star into the Sea of Delos, from whence the Mercury is so strengthened, as that it will be able to devour the companions of Cadmus, so that you may discern by this how the lowest is brought highest, to be strengthened by the airy life of bodies. And then the highest will exalt the lowest, for this water is of such transcendent brightness, as that twill blanch Venus into loon, and all brought about by the twisting and twining of Mercury's caduceus. Basil Valentine describes it thus, "'Tis a volatile fire in form of a mineral water, which congeals his volatile mother and dissolves his fixed father, until they become one in Mercury's triune kingdom, for Mercury is helped by nature and art in a way far beyond process, and so comes readily to mollify the body, and prepare it for fusion and liquefaction. Nay, tis the fountain and balsam of mare. E2. The fire against nature, because it makes of gold a mere spirit, and dissolves it as naturally as ice in warm water, for that gold had its original from it, and rejoiceth in it, as it's like, nay, tis the only agent in the world for our art, for it reduceth the body, and causeth it to putrefy in the preservation of form, for gold and silver only are amended in this water, for nature rejoiceth in nature, and sooner adheres to it than to a contrary. Tis our moist fire, our hidden invisible fire, and the most sharp vinegar, of which an ancient philosopher says, I besought the Lord, and he showed me a certain clear water, which I knew to be the pure vinegar, altering, piercing, and digesting the body. But withal you must know, by the way, that tis of an oily nature, and therefore hath power to exalt tincture, thus having now run through the natures of our menstruum some and all, in which may be seen the nativity, life, death, renovation, and exaltation of mercury to an immutable state, and that in a twofold nature, Therefore, what appertains to his offices in completing the grand medicine, I shall here omit, which, if I see convenient, may hereafter pass the press, this being all that was promised in the title page of this book, so that I shall draw towards a conclusion, but before I wholly finish, I shall, rather than offend the process mongers, give one short process containing the whole work. The first work is to unite the four elements by the water, taken out of the beams of the sun and moon, and then to separate the arsenical sulfur and earthy feces, that the metalline sulfur may appear. 
With this and the common moisture of metals, you come to the philosopher's water or philosophical fountain, wherein is contained the fire of the three first principles, which make afterwards the magician's soul, loon, and mercury, that is, salt, sulfur, and mercury, which being once prepared, we come to the sophical work and wheel of the Sophie, the first to begin with amalgamation, which is calcination for the true philosophers. Calcination is putrefaction and the increase of radical moisture called by the Sophi the first work, but indeed tis the second, because they have hid the preparation and gross conjunction, and the next beginning the principles are sealed up in a glass, and as it softens is called dissolution for the heart is made soft, and the ripe is made crude and raw, and becomes an undigested chaos, no form, and an amalgama, no stone, but in substance. The separation of the elements sets forward, and the virgin principles, even the magicians, soul, loon, and mercury aforementioned, the thin being separated from the thick, there proceeds conjunction, or the union and conjoining of all the dissevered qualities. Here one color follows another, for as in the first conjunction it is made from an earthly to a watery, so to an airy nature. So in the second conjunction, it is converted from an airy to a watery, and from a watery to an earthly nature, but now it is endued with such virtues as that by another rotation, it will be made into a fire-abiding tincture which, according as tis exalted and fermented, will transmute the imperfect metals into soul or loon, etc. E3. Chapter 9, containing a theosophical investigation concerning the probability of what the philosophers have asserted concerning the art's excellency. This chapter is written by way of answer to any dubious query that may arise in thy mind concerning the possibility of this art and of the mysteries it points forth. But many of the ancients have already learnedly and excellently performed this task having proved that in the preparation of this medicine, all the types of the antitype are beheld, and since Basil Valentine, where he compares the triune office of Mercury to type forth the mysteries of the Holy Trinity, as in Pag 347, 348, and again to all the mysteries of the prophetical and evangelical dispensations, as thou mayest read at large in Pag 121, 122, 123, and C, and again, the waterstone of the wise men runs through all these mysteries and scripture phrases, the like do many philosophers, but this way of proceeding, viz. To allegorize the holy scriptures is not so pleasant to me, as to call out some backing testimonies from its authority, seeing many things in scripture seem to me very pat to the matter in hand. Although I must confess that Moses gives a very large map of the work of creation, yet there is no particular mention made of minerals but the two first chapters of Genesis are so material as to this point that it seems very plain to me that Moses did from a practical knowledge of the mineral seed deliver that in those chapters, which many of the philosophers have not done in all their voluminous writings extant, and that I may induce my reader to a greater satisfaction in this point. I cannot suppose they were omitted for any other reason, but that general one aforementioned, for that they are afterwards named for the riches of some of those countries, divided by the rivers, flowing out of Eden. The name of the first is Pison, that is it which compasses the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good, there is Bedelium and the onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon, and the third river is Hedekal, and the fourth river is Euphrates, from which eastern waters all artists consent, that minerals had their original. And what reason can any mortal man give to the contrary, that minerals have no seed multiplicable? seeing they yearly grow and yield increase, as well as vegetables or animals. Sandivogius, having in his sixth treatise decided this point, I shall omit enlarging on it and say with the psalmist, Let the bright beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and guide thou the work of our hands upon us, and the work of our hands guide thou it, Saul. 90 and 19, For who hath despised the day of little things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the stone of tin in the hand of Zerubbabel with those sevens they are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. Zech 4, 10. For tis said by Sirach also, chap, ver, 22. There are hidden greater things than these, seeing we have seen but few of his works and according to the Proverbs of the wise men. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Again, he that abides in the fear of the Lord and cleaves to his word, and waits upon his duty. Neither blacks nor whites shall move him. 
he shall easily make gold out of copper and tin, and shall by God's help do many more things. If Jehovah favor him, he may then make gold of clay or dirt. E4. And further, the refined copper spoken of by Esdras, as pure as gold, the Maccabean fire, which burned on the altar, and the water of the color of fire, given by the angel for Esdras to drink. But these being already cited in my general epistle, I omit speaking farther of them in this book, considering I labor not for myself, but for all them that seek learning, SEO. 22b. 17. I shall show the reader that the seed of metals being not particularly described, and so darkly delivered hath been the cause in all ages of so much sweat and labor, wherein man eats his natural bread. This hath been a fate which the most learned of men have in all ages been subject to. Tis somewhere said, out of much earth is turned a little gold, but if we can find out the material element, it will be no hard matter to know the next seed. Matter or substance, all things that are of the earth shall turn to earth again, and they that are of the waters shall turn into the sea. Essel. 40. 11. In Job tis briefly touched, yet more plainly than elsewhere, in one continued place, the dead things are formed under the waters, or near unto them. Job. 26. 5. This shows truly the material elements of the purest minerals. And again, the silver hath its vein, and the gold its place where they take it. Iron is taken out of the dust, and brass is molten out of the stones God puts an end to darkness, and he searcheth the perfection of all things. He sets a bound to darkness, and of the shadow of deaths the flood breaketh out against the inhabitants, and the waters forgotten of the foot, being higher than man, are gone away. The stones thereof are a place of sapphires, and the dust of it is gold. There is a path which no fowl hath known, neither hath the kite's eye seen. The lion's whelps have not walked in it. Neither the lions pass thereby. He putteth his hands upon the rocks, and his eye seeth every precious thing. He bindeth the floods, that they do not overflow, and the things that are hid, he bringeth to light. But where is wisdom found, and where is understanding? Ans he. Not profaning the divine application and sense of this place, consider, as a chemical natural philosopher, in these verses, what is meant by dead things, waters, vein, place, darkness, shadow of death, flood. Inhabitant, bread, fire turned up, dust, unknown path, kite's eye, lion's whelp, lions, rocks, mountains, and then you may boast that you know the beginning, spermatical substance and true generation of metals. I would have every industrious artist well to consider the fourth. Chapter of Zephaniah, especially that of the two golden pipes emptying the golden oil, I could indeed cite other scriptures pertinent to the matter. But these being sufficient to any man that hath the eye of his understanding opened, not only to show him that metals were originally created, but also the way of their generation and production, brevity being designed, I shall omit farther quotations from scriptures, and conclude this paragraph with this firm belief, that that scripture will be fulfilled, where it is said, hidden things shall be made manifest, even such things as have been hid from the foundation of the world, and I understand, that this alludes to that time that the man of sin shall in great measure be finished, and the church come out of the wilderness in the white garments of purity and righteousness. Hence I can believe no other, but that the gold-making art, so-called, will become common to the men of the new world, when wisdom shall be esteemed for wisdom's sake. Therefore, O thou desirer of art, for thy encouragement, I advise thee with patience to wade through some errors at the beginning of thy labors with content, as all true philosophers have done, and indeed it, cannot be otherwise expected until the fullness of time shall come, that the golden calf shall be ground to powder, and money shall be esteemed like dross, and the prop of Antichrist dashed in pieces. Oh, that we might be all prepared for that long expected, yet now approaching universal day of redemption, that our eyes may see the new Jerusalem, that is clothed in white, come down from heaven, which shall abound with gold in the streets, and the gates made with the richest stones, and that we may pass through that holy river of regeneration unto the tree of life whose fruit is for the healing of the nations, given without money and without price. Oh, that we could see the adeptus return from all the corners of the earth, and the righteous inhabitants thereof without fears or snares of their lives. Oh, that this great glorious monarchy of the north was established, that all who thirst might come freely to it, that the swords might be turned into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks, and that the name of the Lord, which is as a strong tower, 
may be our defense, which are the walls and bulwarks of righteousness. Oh, that we could but once have our assurance that Elias, the forerunner of these mighty things, was come, as I hope he is, and that he had beat his alarum and sounded the trumpet for the preparation of the kingly way of the Lord. I would to God that we might daily prepare ourselves so as to receive this great heavenly bridegroom with a bowed down spirit and a sanctified heart, that so we may not be found like the five foolish virgins without oil in our lamps, and so lose the admittance into his holy presence. Oh, that all the truly ingenious may obtain their desire by beginning in that wisdom, which shall never fade, and that the earnest desires of science might know the true interpretation of all, that hath been mystically delivered by the philosophers from the creation to this very day, that we may be a people of one language and one heart, as they will be in the day of the gospel trumpet sound, when they shall come to eat of the bread and drink of the water of life freely, without money or without price, where the mysteries of nature will be unveiled, even those hid from the foundation of the world, and things passing into their general restoration where they shall rest in their eternal quietness, the type of which every true philosopher beholds, and how the elements are unbanded, principles produced, bodies calcined and purified, in order to produce those rich and living metals, even that gold, which sat. John in the Revelation says, The streets of the new Jerusalem shall be laid with, all which is brought about by the knowledge of Mercury and his regenerating nature, for tis he that must deliver into your hand that triune key that unlocks all the mysteries of nature. Yea, and her book of records too, wherein her magnificent acts are seen, and the mysteries she contains unlocked and opened, and will be to be viewed by all, to whom the promises belong. Even those who are come through the many tribulations, and have a triumphant song of joy in their mouths, even the song of Moses and of the Lamb, that is, the song of judgment and of mercy, which the Zionites sing upon the holy Mount Zion to that great glorious being in fullness of all beings, and to the Lamb that sits on the throne forever and ever. Amen. But seeing it is not our lot to fall in this glorious day, although we see the day star of it, and thereby are sensibly awakened, so as to awaken others, that they may give diligent heed to wisdom's voice, and so come to understand what hath been left on record by the ancient pilgrims concerning divine and natural mysteries, which that they may is the sincere desire of him who is a brother and fellow traveler, etc., I shall now only add the testimonies of some worthy authors concerning this arcanum, and so conclude. The first is that of Paracelsus in the signature of natural things, O. 358. This is a true sign of the tincture of the philosophers, that by its transmuting force all imperfect metals are changed, viz. the white into silver, and the red into the best gold, if but the smallest part of it be cast into a crucible upon melted metals, etc. Item. For the invincible Ahram of metals conquers all things, and changes them into a nature like unto itself, etc. And this gold and silver is nobler and better than that brought out of the metallic mines, and out of it may be prepared better medicinal arcanas. Item, therefore every alchemist that has the Ahram of the sun can transmute all red. Metals into gold, etc. Item, our tincture of gold has astral stars within it. It is a most fixed substance and immutable in the multiplication. It is a powder having the reddest color, almost like saffron, yet the whole corporal substance is liquid like rosin, transparent like crystal, frangible like glass. It is of a ruby color, and of the greatest weight, etc. Read more of this in Paracelsus's Heaven of Philosophers. Item, Paracelsus, in his seventh book of transmutation of natural things, says, The transmutation of metals is a great natural mystery, not against nature's course, nor against God's order, as many falsely judge. For the imperfect metals are not transmuted into gold, nor into silver, without the philosopher's stone. Item. Paracelsus, in his manual of the medicinal stone of the philosophers, says, Our stone is a heavenly medicine, and more than perfect, because it cleanses all filth from metals. Secondly, Henry Kunarath, in his Amphitheater of the Eternal Wisdom, I have traveled much and visited those, esteemed to know somewhat by experience and not in vain, etc., amongst whom I take God to witness. I got of one the universal green lion, and the blood of the lion, which is gold, not vulgar, but of the philosophers I have seen it, touched it, tasted it, and smelt it. Oh, how wonderful is God in his works! I say they gave me the prepared medicine. 
which I most fruitfully used towards the poorest of my neighbors in desperate cases. And they did sincerely reveal to me the true manner of preparing their medicine, etc. Item, this is the wonderful method, which God only has given me immediately, immediately, yet subordinate through fire, art and matters help, as well living as silent, corporal and spiritual, watching and sleeping. Item, full, I write not fables. With thy own hands shalt thou handle, and with thy eyes see the Azoth, etc., the universal mercury of the philosophers, which alone with its internal and external fire is sufficient for thee to get our stone, nevertheless with a sympathetic harmony, being magic physically united with the Olympic fire by an inevitable necessity, etc. Item, thou shalt see the stone of philosophers, our king, go forth of the bedchamber of his glassy sepulchre and his glorified body, like a lord of lords, from his throne, into this theater of the world, that is to say, regenerated and more than perfect, a shining carbuncle, a most temperate splendor, whose most subtle and depurated parts are inseparable, united into one with a concordial mixture, exceeding equal, transparent as crystal, compact and most ponderous, easily fusible in fire like rosin or wax, before the flight of quicksilver, yet flowing without smoke, entering into solid bodies, and penetrating them, as oil does paper, dissolvable in every liquor and commissible with it, friable like glass, in a powder like saffron, but in the whole mass shining red like a ruby, which redness is a sign of a perfect fixation, and fixed perfection, permanently coloring or tinging, fixed in all temperations or trials, yea, in the examination of the burning sulfur itself, and the devouring waters, and in the most vehement persecution of the fire always, incombustible and permanent as a salamander. Item, the philosopher's stone, being fermented in its parts in the great world, transforms itself into whatsoever is profitable to man by the fire. Hence, a son Ophart may perceive why the philosophers have given their Azoth the name of mercury, which adheres to bodies, etc. And further in the same place, it is fermented with metals, viz. The stone being in its highest whiteness is fermented with pure silver to the white, but the sanguine stone with pure gold to the red. And this is the work of three days, etc. Thirdly, Helmont, in the book of Eternal Life, full, 590. I have often seen the stone and handled it and have projected the fourth part of one grain, wrapped in paper, upon eight ounces of quicksilver, boiling in a crucible. And the quicksilver, with a small noise, presently stood still from its flux and was congealed yellow like wax. And after a flux by blast, we found eight ounces, wanting 11 grains of the purest gold. Therefore, one grain of this powder would transmute 19,000. 186 parts of quicksilver into the best gold, so that this powder is found to be of similar parts with terrestrials, and does transmute infinite plenty of impure metals into the best gold, uniting with it, and so defends it from rust, cancer, rottenness, and death, and makes it in a manner immortal against all tortures of fire and art, and transforms it into a virgin purity of gold, requiring only a fervent heat. Item in his tree of life, full, 630. I am constrained to believe there is a gold and silver making stone or powder. For that I have divers times made projection with one grain thereof upon some thousand grains of boiling quicksilver to a tickling admiration of a great multitude. And farther, as is rehearsed in the first chapter, he who gave me this powder had so much at least as would transmute 200,000 pounds worth of gold. Item, he gave me about half a grain, and thence were transmuted nine ounces and three quarters of quicksilver into pure gold, and he who gave it me was but of one evening's acquaintance. Fourthly, Flamel says that the first time he made projection, twas on mercury, where if he turned half a pound, or thereabouts into pure silver, better than that of the mine. Afterward he made projection of the redstone upon the like quantity of mercury, which he transmuted truly into almost as much pure gold, more soft and more pliable. Fifthly, Raymond Lully, confined in the Tower of London by King Edward III, was manifestly known to have this elixir, and with the same he redeemed himself by paying a considerable quantity of gold, which gold was after coined with this inscription, Jesus autem transivit medium alorum, which is thus in English, but Jesus passing through the midst of them, went his way, by which motto the Lullian gold may be known. Sixthly, Ripley in the preface of his Twelve Gates told King Edward in so many words that at Louvain he had made the white stone. Seventhly, 
that of Dr. D to Queen Elizabeth, who caused that an iron pan might be cut out from the hoop, very observable, the which he transmuted into gold, exactly fitting it as before. Eighthly, those so many demonstrations in Germany, besides those golden ducats which were coined by the command of the emperor with nine four, on them to signify that the gold was made by art. Ninthly, the testimony of Oswald Crolius in his preface to Basilica Chimica concerning Michael Sandivogius, that noble Polander, which he calls Heliosanthaurus Borealis, the northern beetle, in whose hands he saw with great admiration and amazement the wonderful virtues and operation of the philosopher's tincture, commonly called the philosopher's stone. Tenthly, that of Dr. Helvetius, who received a small grain of powder of Elias the artist, Elias Ashmole, at The Hague in Holland, which transmuted six drams of lead into pure gold, bearing all the essays of Delph, which my eyes have seen and my own hands have handled. Eleventhly, the testimony of Fualadas, who says that one man, that is an adeptist, might transmute into perfect gold and silver all the imperfect metals that are in the whole world. Secondly, he may by this art make precious stones and gems, such as cannot be paralleled in nature for goodness and greatness. And lastly, it is a universal medicine for prolonging life and curing all diseases. Twelfthly, a French doctor who is a physician to the people of the French church, formerly living between Bishop Gate and Leadenhall Street, his name I know not, is positively satisfied from actual demonstration, who saw copper farthings converted into pure gold. Item, the thrice worthy ZB Esquire, who actually saw transmutation and wore a ring of the same gold, which was a promoting cause to the Parliament for taking off the act against the amelioration of metals, which was originally made upon the occasion of two, too many being satisfied from that demonstration of Raymond Lully, before mentioned, that the art of transmutation was real, but upon practical search being found difficult to be obtained, the estates of the heirs and heiresses, wasting so fast, as I have been informed by an excellent politician, it was thought highly expedient to make a severe act against it, both which acts to me as a convincing argument of our wise senator's satisfaction with art's possibility as any other whatsoever, without we should suppose that the wisdom of the nation would make acts for or against the wind, which I have not the least thought of, much less reason to judge them guilty of such absurdity. But what need I spend my time to sum up testimonies concerning its possibilities, seeing I have myself good reason to believe the same, having seen four seals of the philosopher's writings and hope that many more will be equally satisfied, that so the philosophers may be more reverenced than hitherto they have been. The scribe oath, found amongst the papers of a known adept after his death, which is administered upon the adopting of a brother into the Kabbalistic society, as the great God of heaven and earth, from whom we all proceed, in whom we live, and to whom we must return at our appointed time hath adopted and chosen out from among mankind a certain number of Christians for that eminent work of creating perfect things from imperfection, unto whom it is made manifest by the spirit of creation the universal first or fifth creating quintessence, by which it is by many held to this day. The world was reduced from its rude and undigested chaos to a beautiful and pregnant matrix fit for the receiving of seminal virtue for producing all circular appearances as daily doth appear by our most glorious production or manufacture, and for as much as it has been from all times thought fit to keep secret and undivulged from the common knowledge of mankind, the easy and facile way of our great work, both for the glory of God and common good and conveniency of government, and for as much as there are no obligations found like those which are freely entered, into by a true sense of his great necessity, therefore I, R.S., do freely, for the reasons before mentioned, promise and swear by the great Jehovah, and by all things visible and invisible, and by the fifth produced essence to me known, as I have evidently made appear to thee and the rest of my brethren, I will not reveal, acknowledge or declare till death me either unto cause or move, or any way direct or indirect, absolutely informing any person to the attaining of this secret and divine knowledge, unless I, the said R.S., do evidently know that the said person hath found out things supernatural, which is daily experienced, wonderful and manifest affects me thereunto moving, or that the said party be so qualified by nature, that three or four of the said brethren in the society finding him fit for the said work, and give me their consent and permission, so as to do it. I also do promise that if God should, out of special mercy, 
revealed to me greater knowledge of the supernatural and hidden mysteries than to some common adepts, not to discover thereof to them by way of discourse, without I am directed by my brethren so to do, or that I am assured he doth enjoy the same ever-glorious stage and bright knowledge. I also promise by virtue of the aforesaid oath, not to have to do with kings or great men, and never to commune with any out of a covetous mind or design, but remain satisfied with that knowledge God hath showed out of his wonderful province to me. Likewise, I promise to make it my endeavor to find out one to enjoy this knowledge after my decease, unto whom I will, while I live, impart what I safely may, and at my death reveal the whole secret also I promise in the presence of God, that I will never join with any upon a covetous pretense of advancing the secret unless it be with an adeptist, known and approved of by my, my other brethren, neither deliver any true knowledge of our true universal magnet and chalabs, and principally the mercury and gold, whether it be in an enigma or otherwise, as is designed or best thought fit for the preservation of this science, and if it should so happen that I should be racked and tortured to discover the same, and there is no hopes of avoiding the danger, by giving or delivering some other compound way, which hath been beforehand consulted of, and agreed upon by the brethren, and if that will not do, then I promise to swallow my common pill without which I promise never to be, but constantly to have it about me in the form of beads, or what shape shall be thought most fit, to which promise and covenant I bind my body and soul and my life, in the testimony of which I save my hand with my own blood, and my seal with the true universal mixture, desiring all to hold that man excused which observing my willful failing in anything above mentioned, privately cuts me off from among men, and I desire of God, and of all my brethren to witness him, and to esteem him with the highest veneration imaginable, knowing that his zeal for the glory of the Lord of hosts hath been thereunto moved. Thus calling God, heaven, earth, and all that is therein to bear testimony this my free and voluntary condescension, amen, 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 and praise be to the O God, holy, 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 forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.